Spoonful of Murder, A Killer Coffee Mystery, Book 10. Written by Tanya Kappas. Narrated by Christina Sagnameni. Chapter 1. Even after three years, it never got any easier to hear my alarm go off at four o'clock in the morning. A chill seeped through the small hole at my feet, where Pepper, my schnauzer, stuck his nose out from underneath the covers. Can't you go in late? My bedmate, Patrick, rolled over and tugged me into his arms. He snuggled his nose in my neck. It's cold and snowy. When Patrick broke the silence of the night, Pepper and Sassy jumped off the bed. That's the best time to be open. I gave him a quick kiss before I rolled to the edge of the bed where I slipped my feet into my cozy slippers. I'll stoke the fire. Patrick was already snoring before I could slip my thick robe on over my pajamas and leave our bedroom in our small cabin. Okay, okay. At the door, the tippy-tap of Sassy and Pepper's toenails clicked on the old hardwood floors. I flipped on the light in the family room to greet the black standard poodle and gray schnauzer, Patrick's children and mine. They bolted out the door and bounced off the porch into the deep snow. I shook my head and went to get a towel out of the laundry room so I could brush off their paws when they came back in. They were taking their sweet time, giving me the opportunity to stoke the embers and put some more logs in the wood-burning stove. The cabin was small, and the wood burner was the perfect solution to keep the chill out and heat the house quickly. We rarely had to use the gas heat. I'm coming. The dog scratched at the door. Are y'all hungry? Both of them were so well trained, they knew to stop on the towel I'd laid in front of the door so I could brush the snow off their furry feet and keep it from balling up. The inside of the cabin was one big room with a combination kitchen and dining room. The bathroom and laundry room were located in the back on the far right. A set of stairs led up to one big room we considered our bedroom. Good night, Sass. I called for her before she darted back up the stairs to go back to bed with her dad. Just me and you. Pepper stayed at my heels as we headed into the kitchen area, where I grabbed a quick scoop of Pepper's kibble to hold him over while I got ready for work. He would get his real breakfast there. It was our routine, except for Sundays. Like Pepper, the Bean Hive Coffee House was my baby, and it was open six days a week. On Sunday, after church, I spent most of the afternoon at the Bean Hive, making treats like muffins, casseroles, quiche, cookies, and really anything that I wanted to serve with the coffee. Plus, I'd been working really hard on creating my own coffee with my new roastery equipment. Creating some new Christmas blends had been a lot of fun, and I was excited to serve those this morning. The snow was going to bring in a lot of customers. Some people might think the opposite, but residents of Honey Springs, Kentucky, love to get together and gossip, um, <laughs> talk, over coffee. Let's be clear. When someone consumed something as delicious as coffee, it warmed the body, invigorated the mind, and made one feel good. The Bean Hive created a fun atmosphere for locals to come together and enjoy a cup of coffee while catching up on the day's news, and even the tourists had found their spot there, too. They came in after a day of shopping at the boardwalk's local small businesses next to the coffee house to take a load off their feet and enjoy a delicious cup of coffee with a sweet treat. They also took advantage of looking at my cork board, where the month's local activities were posted. The board was filled with fun things for the Christmas season. I was looking forward to two events, the Christmas Paw Raid, featuring a parade downtown for fur babies, and the Holiday Progressive Dinner, which was a fundraiser for Pet Palace, our local SPCA. The Progressive Dinner was new this year, and I was excited about it. Anything I could do for the local animals, I was all over it. Slow down, I called to Pepper. He was scarfing down the kibble like it was his last meal. I'll be back. 
I talked to my four-legged companion like he understood me. Most times, I felt like he did. If I stopped to listen, I could hear Patrick's light snoring. I smiled and flipped on the light in the laundry room, where I kept my uniform for work. It would inevitably get coffee sloshed on it, or food where I'd haphazardly swipe my hands down me, missing the apron I also wore. But it was nice to have a few long-sleeved shirts with the Beanhive logo on them, so I didn't have to think too hard about what to wear. You ready? Pepper was curled up on his bed in front of the pot belly, but perked right up when he heard me get my keys off the hook that hung next to the door. I took one good look around the cabin before I left, checking that everything was in order and nothing could set the cabin on fire like the wood-burning stove. A fire had happened here once. Luckily, I wasn't home, but with my world, Patrick and Sassy, inside, double-checking had become part of my morning routine since they did sleep in a little longer. Let's get your sweater on. Pepper loved his little winter wear. The drive to the boardwalk wasn't too far from here, but the car would be cold, and I just couldn't bear seeing him shiver. Based on the way he stood there waiting patiently, wagging his tail, he, too, was excited to be warm and toasty. There you go. The smile was stuck on my face at the sheer sight of my sweet fur baby. He'd been such a joy and companion. The moon hung high in the sky, shining the perfect spotlight to our car. It had snowed about two feet over the past couple of days, which I loved. The snow fell at a nice steady pace that allowed just enough snow to cover the grass, trees, and tops of buildings while letting the snow plows keep the streets from getting covered and icy. This was exactly what Honey Springs needed, a white Christmas. How about some festive tunes? I asked Pepper, who was already nestled in the passenger seat with his doggy seatbelt clipped. He sat there like a human child, staring out the window. I flipped the radio onto our local station, which played 24-7 Christmas music this time of year. Just hearing Bing sing Rudolph had my fingers drumming and toes tapping, creating a joy that was truly so intense that I knew it was going to be a really great day. Even though I'd taken the curvy road from the cabin along the banks of Lake Honey Springs, I got through hearing only Rudolph and the Hippopotamus song, the one in which the kid asked for a hippo for Christmas before we pulled into the parking lot for the boardwalk. Lake Honey Springs was really what brought tourists to Honey Springs. People loved to boat, fish, and rent cabins along the area, which made for great business on the boardwalk. That was where the Bean Hive Coffee House was located. My dream job of owning a coffee shop came to life after I'd gotten a divorce from my college sweetheart, who turned out to be a sweetheart to many, and returned to where I'd known comfort and solace as a child. Right into the arms of my aunt, Maxine Bloom, known around here as Maxie. Honey Springs was also where I'd gotten to visit with Patrick Kane, now my husband, when we were kids. Let's just say that we had feelings for each other from the first day I laid eyes on the scrawny kid. Fast forward to now. We were happily married. I rented the Beanhive Coffee House space from Aunt Maxie, and my ex, Kirk, was out of our life until recently. Let's just say he was a new citizen of Honey Springs, and discussing him would require me to indulge in a lot of coffee. I'd yet to have my normal servings. Okay, what do you say we get our day started? I unclipped my seatbelt and then Pepper's, grabbed my bag from the back seat, and opened the door. Pepper delighted so much in the snow. I stood on the bottom step of the stairs that led up to the boardwalk and watched him shove his nose into the snow and come up with a snowball mustache. Come on, I called out to him and headed up the steps. The carriage lights along the boardwalk had twinkling lights roped around the base. The dowel rods had a light-up wreath hanging down. Even the railing of the boardwalk 
was covered in garland and red bows every few feet. The beautification committee had really gone out of their way to make the boardwalk a new tourist destination for holiday travelers. The annual Christmas Paw Raid had become super popular. In this fun little Christmas event, locals dressed up their animals and we marched around the downtown park. Since we started it, Christmas in Honey Springs had grown bigger and bigger. The townspeople had added a tree lighting ceremony, Santa, and vendor booths, just to name a few. This year, a progressive dinner was added to the list, only it was a little different than the typical progressive dinner held at people's homes. Not only was this progressive dinner meant to raise money, but it was a cool way for local businesses to showcase their shops. During the winter months, the lack of tourism made lean times for small businesses like mine and the other shops on the boardwalk. Of course, I was hosting the after-dinner coffee and desserts in my shop's honor. Aunt Maxie had been the one to really get the dinner together. The first stop would be for cocktails down at the Watershed Restaurant, located on the lake. The appetizers were taking place at All About the Details, the shop next door to mine. The dinner portion would be hosted at Wild and Whimsy Antiques, though the food was coming from the in and out diner. After that, it would be my turn to provide everyone with the best coffee in Kentucky, or at least in Honey Springs. Today, my agenda was to make as many of the desserts as possible, so we only had to pull them out of the refrigerator, flip on the industrial coffee pots, and enjoy the winding down of the evening's festivities. It didn't take long for Pepper to catch up to me and dart right on past. He knew exactly where to go and wait for me. You're so good! I got the coffee shop keys out of my bag and unlocked the door. I ran my hand up along the inside wall and felt for the light switch. The inside came to life. A few cafe tables dotted the cafe's interior, as did two long window tables that had stools butted up to them on each side of the front door. The front of the cafe was a perfect spot to sit, enjoy the beautiful Lake Honey Springs, and sip on your favorite beverage. Today would be especially gorgeous, thanks to the view of all the fresh snow lying on top of the frozen lake. This was my favorite spot in the coffee house, but today I was sure my spot would be glued behind the counter, making all the warm drinks for customers. On my way back to the kitchen to get the oven started, I knew Pepper would be ready for something to eat. Since he wasn't allowed to go into the food prep area because of health department regulations, I got a scoop of his kibble and tossed it into his bowl. He could get his belly full, lie down in his doggy bed, and take a nap while I got the coffee house ready for the day. There were so many things to do. Flipping on all the industrial coffee makers was the priority. I walked behind the L-shaped counter and flipped the coffee makers on one by one before I finally walked through the swinging kitchen doors. I loved the kitchen so much. The big workstation in the middle was perfect. I could mix, stir, add, cut, or do whatever I needed to do to get all the food made. The kitchen had a huge walk-in freezer and a big refrigerator, several shelving units that held all the dry ingredients, and a big pantry I used to store many of the bags of coffee beans I'd ordered from all over the world. Now that I had my own roastery attached to the kitchen, I made a point of adding roasting fresh beans to my Sunday ritual. Yoo-hoo! I heard my one and only employee call from the coffee house just as I turned on the ovens. Soon the door swung open, and there stood Bunny Bowowski. Her little brown coat had great big buttons up the front, and her pillbox hat matched it perfectly. Her brown pocketbook hung from the crease of her arm and swung back and forth. You're here early. I was delighted to see her. Bunny was a regular at the coffee house when I first opened. 
Since she'd long been retired, she decided to help me out, which was how she became an employee. Floyd said he'd bring me, since he's heading out of town to visit some family this morning. She pulled the bobby pins from her short gray hair and took off the hat. With her mouth, she pulled the pins apart and slipped them on to the lacy part of her hat. You didn't want to go? I asked. Heavens no! She peeled off her coat and folded it over her arm. If I did that, Floyd would think I want more than companionship. At my age, there's no way I want to take care of a man for... Her head wobbled from side to side as she came up with a number. Ten years? You're going to be alive longer than ten years. I laughed and slipped the muffin tin in the oven. I'd never figure you to be in your seventies. Ever. I attribute that to lots of coffee that keeps me active. She wiggled her brows. I'll go get the rest of the duties done. I bet we're busy today. Everyone is looking forward to the progressive dinner tonight. She left me alone in the kitchen. With Bunny being early, it would be a good time for me to get the coffee and treats down to the cocoon inn. Every day, Kami Montgomery, owner of the inn, served bean hive coffee house coffee and a breakfast type item in the inn's hospitality room. Sometimes, if I was running a little behind on getting them to her, she'd send up her husband, Walker Peevler. Not today. I hurried over to the workstation and grabbed three industrial coffee pots with the cantilever push arm from the shelf underneath. How do you think Maxine is going to take the news that all about the details won't be able to host the appetizers? Bunny's question caught me off guard. What? I asked and stopped to see her face. Why isn't Babette doing the appetizers? Babette Cliff was the owner of All About the Details. Her store was really an events venue with spectacular views of Lake Honey Springs and the little island across it. Fell on the ice, Bunny tisked. I told her just the other day how she needed to invest in some good snow boots to walk from the parking lot because she was going to fall in those hills. Bunny tapped her temple. I should be reading people's fortunes. The very next day, she slipped on some black ice and down she went. Bunny clapped her hands together, then slid them apart like one hand was the pavement and the other was Babette slipping on it. Broke an ankle. Bunny shook her head and headed behind the bar where a few of the industrial pots had beeped. I grabbed a couple of the carafes, set them aside, and replaced them with the ones for the hospitality room at the hotel. I think she's going to have a meltdown. Bunny gave a sly smile like she was going to love seeing Aunt Maxie in a little pickle. She walked over, got one carafe from the counter at a time, and took them over to the coffee bar. Who? I asked, not sure if she was talking about Babette. Maxine Bloom? Bunny's smile told me she would personally love to see Aunt Maxie squirm, since they weren't the best of friends. She made her way to the end of the counter to the coffee bar. On each side of the counter was a drink stand. One was a coffee bar with six industrial thermoses, containing different blends of my specialty coffees, as well as one filled with a decaffeinated blend. Even though I never clearly understood the concept of decaffeinated coffee. When I first opened, Aunt Maxie made sure I understood some people drank only the unleaded stuff. The coffee bar had everything you needed to take a coffee with you, even an honor system that let you pay and go. Honestly, I never truly took time to see if the honor system worked. In my head and heart, I liked to believe everyone was kind and honest. I guess I could do the appetizers, then come back for coffee. It was a mere suggestion. The last thing I wanted to do was come up with the appetizers today and make sure the coffee beans I'd roasted for the special occasion were perfect. Out of the corner of my eye, 
I saw Bunny tidying up everything as she went along. During her shift, she took pride in making sure everything looked nice and presentable. This is just like your home. You need to keep it tidy and clean, she'd told me one time. I've never forgotten those words either. While Bunny did the straightening and I waited for the coffee to brew for the hotel, I decided to change out the menus. Instead of investing in a fancy menu or even menu boards that attach to the wall, I'd bought four large chalkboards that hung down from the ceiling over the L-shaped glass countertop. The first chalkboard menu hung over the pie counter and listed the pies and cookies and their prices. The second menu hung over the torts and quiches. The third menu, over where the L-shaped counter bent, listed the breakfast casseroles and drinks. Above the other counter, the chalkboard listed lunch options, including soups, as well as catering information. I better get rid of these soups if I'm going to make some mini soup bowls for appetizers. It'll be a good night for them. I swiped the eraser across the chalkboard, taking the harvest soup off the menu. Bunny had moved on to the tea bar to get it ready for the breakfast crowd. On the opposite end of the counter from the coffee bar stood the tea bar, which offered a nice selection of gourmet, loose leaf, and cold teas. I'd even gotten a few antique teapots from the Wild and Whimsy Antique Shop, which happened to be the first shop on the boardwalk. If a customer came in and wanted a pot of hot tea, I could fix it for them, or they could fix their own to their taste. I heard a knock on the window. From the outline of the silhouette, I knew exactly who was trying to wave me over. Loretta Beebe. What on earth is she doing here at this hour? Bunny glanced back. I don't know. I walked over to the door and decided to just flip the sign to open. If people were milling about, I reckoned I'd better serve them. I sure hope Bertie is okay. Get in here, I said to Loretta in a gleeful voice, but I knew something was going on to warrant a visit at this time of morning. You're gonna get frostbite. Oh, are you kidding? I heard Bunny mutter to herself, only it wasn't so quiet. She's too mean to get frostbitten. Is Bertie okay? I asked about Loretta's granddaughter who had been working for me since she moved in with Loretta. Oh, yes. Loretta kept tilting her head out the door. Are you waiting for someone? I asked and looked out. Yes, my new helper dropped me off at the steps and is parking the car. I don't think she's ever been here. Love her heart. And I told her you were located in the middle of the boardwalk. She'll find us. I assured her and shut the door, since it was so cold out. What's going on? I heard, and I'm here. She tugged on each fingertip of her glove, gracefully slipping her hands out of each one. I'm here to let you know that I'll be taking over, Loretta said in her slow southern drawl, not making it sound as bad as my gut told me it was. Taking over what? Bunny's interest got piqued. The appetizer part of the progressive dinner. She sounded as nonchalant as though the decision was hers to make. Now before you two start in on me, she slapped her gloves in one hand. I know I wouldn't make no fundraiser about any animals. It's just me, but I like to give money back to our community. The animals are part of our community. I walked over to the coffee bar and plucked one of the stacked paper cups to fill for Loretta. When you were the barista of a coffee house and had regular customers, you could make their orders in your sleep. Loretta liked her coffee with two light creamers, one vanilla creamer, and two packs of sugar. I'm not here to argue with you, Roxanne. Loretta batted her fake lashes a few times before she took the cup from me. Instead of saying, thank you for fixing me this amazing cup of coffee, she continued, what's done is done. The fundraiser is set and I've come to just turn the other cheek this year. 
she let me know in her own subtle way that she would make sure to intervene for next year. All under the bridge. What we have to deal with is the here and now. And right now, I'm stepping up to the plate to offer my services. The fundraiser was Aunt Maxie's. And if Aunt Maxie was here, there'd be no way in H.E. double hockey sticks that she'd let Loretta participate. Before you poo-poo the idea, the bangles of her wrists jingled and jangled when she held up her finger to stop me from talking. I'm going to give you my idea. Now, she moved past me to walk deeper into the coffee house. I've decided to host it at the Cocoon Hotel. I've already gotten confirmation with Katie Montgomery to use the appetizers. The only difference is that I'll be providing the appetizers instead of Babette. I'm going to need to take some Tums tonight, Bunny murmured on her way past me, back to the coffee bar. There she cleaned up the leftover sprinkles of sugar that had found their way out of their packet when I opened them up to stir in Loretta's coffee. The bell over the door dinged. A frazzled, snow-covered young woman walked in. Good, Loretta called out to her. You found it. Lana, Roxy, Roxy, Lana. Loretta waved a finger in introduction between us. Let me get you a coffee, Lana, I said to her when I noticed her shivering jawline. When I reached for another cup, Bunny smacked my hands away. I'll fix it, she snapped, knowing full well that I'd make another mess she'd feel like she had to clean up. Poor Bunny spent most of her shift cleaning up after people. I just let her do what made her happy. Lana, take off that coat and go stand in front of the fireplace. I'm sure Roxy's about to start one. Loretta had a way of giving orders indirectly. I'll be right back. Loretta excused herself to the bathroom. Lana, what do you like in your coffee, dear? Bunny asked Lana. How did Loretta take hers? She asked. Don't you mind Loretta? Bunny said, her voice deepening on the end syllable of Loretta's name. Loretta Beebe was somewhat hard to deal with in the community. She was a little forward and, well, bossy. She never bothered me any, but she did bother a lot of people. If it weren't for Loretta's volunteering, things would probably take a lot longer to get done around Honey Springs. She was not only the president of the Southern Women's Club, but also a big member of the local church, which puts you right on top of the society list, even though she did exaggerate about her year-round suntan. Loretta claimed she was part Cherokee, and, well, that could have been true, since the Cherokee people were indigenous to Honey Springs, but it didn't coincide with her using Lisa Stahl's tanning bed a few times a week to keep her skin's pigment. And if you asked Loretta about it, she'd get all torn up. So we just brushed the subject under the rug, like most secrets around here. Funny thing I'd found out since I moved to Honey Springs, those really dark secrets were like dust bunnies. They found their way into the light when they lurked too long in the shadows. Black is good. Lana offered a sweet smile. Let me get that fire started. I had Lana move away from the front of the fireplace so I could throw in a starter log. Pepper is excited. I laughed when he ran over and got into his dog bed. He's cute, she smiled. How long have you worked for Loretta? I started some chit-chat while the flame took. Bunny walked behind the counter and tried to secretly write a text message on her phone. She wasn't fooling me any. I'd bet she was texting Maybelle Donovan, her partner in crime. A few weeks. She keeps me on my toes. Lana rubbed her hands together. I'm here to cook and clean up a bit. She's so busy with all her volunteer work, and now she's offered to make the cheese balls. She abruptly stopped talking when the handle of the bathroom door jiggled as if Loretta couldn't get it open. I bet she has. Bunny's flat voice and ticked-up brow made Lana smile even bigger. 
What are y'all doing out so early? Bunny handed Lana a cup of coffee. She put a call in to the owners down at the Wild and Whimsy about a piece missing from the Christmas china she'd brought from them. They told her they found it in another box and were holding it for her. Lana sipped on the coffee and took a seat on the hearth, giving me just enough space to lay a few of the seasoned pieces of firewood on the starter log. Where's my cup? Loretta had joined us again, this time without her coat. She tapped her maroon fingernail on her big-faced watch. I'm expected at Wild and Whimsy when they open, so we need to make this a quick chat. We are chatting? I asked and glanced up at Bunny, who was pointing to where Loretta had set down her cup previously. Bunny snarled and rolled her eyes. I know that your aunt is going to be all sort of, well, let's just be honest, shall we? Loretta eased down on the edge of one of the couches, crossing her legs at the ankles like a good southern woman would sit. Nothing but around here, I said, giving the fire a little stoke with the poker. You and I both know Maxine has her opinions of me. And that's all fine and dandy, but she's going to have to put those out of her way for the good of the community. We need someone to take over the appetizers, and I've stepped up to the plate. Did Maxine ask you to do anything for the progressive dinner? Bunny asked a question we all knew the answers to. Loretta's shoulders peeled down from her ears, her head tilted, and her face went flat when she looked at Bunny. Maybe she wants you to enjoy it, Bunny suggested. All of us in the room, including Lana, knew the truth. Again, we were sweeping it under the rug, so to speak. Here was the strange part. Bunny seemed to be taking up for Aunt Maxie, which told me she didn't want Loretta to do the appetizers either. I snickered. Anyways, I just wanted you to know that I've once again saved the event. Loretta was also good at taking credit where it wasn't hers to take. Her quirks were very entertaining to me, not so much to Aunt Maxie. I guess I'm not sure where our visit this early comes in, I asked. Honestly, Roxy, Loretta uncrossed her ankles and sighed, carefully putting the mug on the coffee table in front of her. I'm going to need you to back me up, because I'm sure when Maxine hears that I've had to save her once again, she'll be a little perturbed. And you think I can calm her down if she is? Then you don't know her too well. I snickered, knowing Aunt Maxie would fume once she got word. And trust me, she was going to get word before the sun popped up in about an hour and a half. The faint sound of a ding caused Pepper to lift his head. The ovens are preheated. I've got to get some items cooked before we really open. It was my way of excusing myself. We have to go anyways. Beverly is going to meet us down there so I can get that platter for one of my famous cheese balls. Loretta stood up. Lana... Thanks for the coffee and the warm fire. I'll be back. Lana helped Loretta with her coat. I hope you do. I felt sorry for Lana. She was at Loretta's mercy. Bunny and I walked them over to the door. From what I hear, Loretta can't keep a helper. How long do you think that girl will last? Bunny asked. Maybe Lana will last. She's got a little gumption. I do know one thing. I watched out the door as Loretta and Lana hurried down the boardwalk. Aunt Maxie sure is going to be mad. Mm-hmm, she sure is, and I thought it was going to be a good day. Bunny sighed, breathing into her coffee mug before she took a sip. Unfortunately, Bunny was right. I could feel the chill in my bones. Chapter 2 no sooner did I get the mini quiches in the oven than the coffee pots went off for the cocoon inn. I'm going to run the coffee down to the inn. 
I slid the display case's sliding glass doors open and put the tray of quiche in it. They weren't the prettiest of displays today, but I was in a hurry. Loretta Beebe's visit had put me behind. Luckily, Bunny was able to do most things, just at a slower pace. I reckoned we weren't in a race, but I did like to be ready for the first customer of the day. It was just a professional thing I was sure I'd carried over from my days of being a lawyer. Patrick had helped over the years to bring some spontaneity to my life. I've got everything all ready. Bunny walked behind the counter, straightening everything as she went. I'll be back soon. I grabbed my coat from the coat rack, but kept my apron on, tugged my knit cap over my head, and pulled my gloves from the pocket. Call if you need me. I patted my phone, which was in my coat pocket, then took the handles of the two industrial coffee pots. Don't forget these. Bunny picked up the bag of bagels and cream cheese I'd prepared for the hotel guests. I put down one of the carafes and let Bunny slip the bag handle on my wrist before I made sure I had everything and headed out the door. A nice brisk walk might wake me up a little more. It was already six o'clock and the sun wouldn't make its appearance until at least 7.30. From what I understood, it was going to be a sunny winter day. Roxanne Bloom Kane, is that you? My face squished up, and an inward groan escaped when I recognized the voice breaking the early morning's quiet from the opposite end of the way I was walking. I turned around to find Aunt Maxie bolting down the boardwalk, snowshoes and ski poles in hand. She was running as fast as she could. Her cross body bag was shaped like a Christmas tree with multicolored sequins sewn on, and it swung back and forth at her hip. What is this I hear about you letting Loretta host the appetizers? She huffed and took big steps. The snow flew up behind her as she got closer and closer. I didn't let her do anything. Oh, my goodness. Loretta's main motive to come by this morning was for her to tell me and prevent me from disagreeing so she could conveniently tell people that I let her. She came in this morning just a few minutes ago and told me. News travels fast. I reckon Bunny Bowowski couldn't wait for me to hear. She got on that text prayer chain quicker than a rabbit. Maybelle Donovan texted Jean Hill who texted Ursula Scott, who texted your mama. Thank God Penny decided to call me. I can't hardly hear my text go off, but I can hear my phone ringing. I just found out myself, and it's fine. It'll all be fine. Do y'all honestly think Aunt Maxie heard me? Well, no. She already had it in her head that she wanted me to know how this was going to go down. I could picture how she must have looked when she got the call from my mom. I tried not to laugh out loud at the images of her face contorting from shock and running through various emotions until she got to anger. She was in that phase now and would probably remain there until she saw it would all work out. Have you tried her dips? Aunt Maxie was on my heels as we walked along the boardwalk, making our way through the snow. I was trying to listen to her while juggling the two coffee containers and bag and not falling on the boardwalk and ending up like Babette. What about that chipped beef ball? She huffed, stuck one of the poles up underneath her armpit and took out her cell phone. She was thumbing through it. Here, take a look at this. She shoved the phone up in my face. I stopped and looked at the photo. That's one of her creations. She shook her head. I'm not having it at my first progressive dinner. That's why I didn't ask her. People will wonder if the dogs made the appetizers. They are so pitiful. Tis the season, I chirped and started walking again. Tis the season to ruin the season? Is that what you're saying? She wasn't going to let this go. You mean to tell me after everything you went through... All them hoops with the health department to get Pet Palace in the coffee house that you're going to let one low-redda baby ruin it for you? 
No one will donate if they taste her stuff because no one will survive. Actually, I was a little glad we were discussing it outside rather than inside, where someone might hear us. Why don't you take it up with her? I nodded forward. She and Lana are at the Wild and Whimsy, picking up something from Beverly Tea Garden. We were almost past the Buzz In and Out Diner, which wasn't too far from the end of the boardwalk, where I was headed. Wild and Whimsy Antiques was the last shop. Why on earth would Loretta be up at this time? Aunt Maxie asked, continuing to pronounce Loretta's name the way Loretta pronounced her own name. In Loretta's slow southern drawl, it sounded more like she was saying Loretta. It irked her so much when Aunt Maxie said her name that way. I had a feeling it was the only way Aunt Maxie would pronounce it until the progressive dinner was over. Let me guess. Aunt Maxie put her pole in front of me to stop me. I turned to look at her. Though Halloween had long passed, if I didn't know her, I would have thought she was dressed in a costume. Her reddish-orange hair stuck out from underneath one of those winter hats with the flaps over the ears. She wore what she liked to call her Dolly Parton coat, with many colors, like the movie based on the Queen of Country Music. And the snowshoes were a much-exaggerated addition to the outfit. A pair of simple snow boots would have done the trick, even though Aunt Maxie had walked to the boardwalk from downtown, where she lived. Being physical was a way of life in Honey Springs. If we didn't walk everywhere, we biked. Unless it was snowy, I rode my little bike with the basket to the beanhive on most days. Honey Springs was small enough that it was more convenient to bike places than to worry about parking a car. She's been rambling on about that darn barn auction. Aunt Maxie's eyes glowed. She has been itching to get in there all these years to see what's been held up in there. When I was at the Southern Women's Club last month, Jean Hill mentioned she'd heard from Evan Rich all the contents had been bought by the tea gardens. Is that right? I asked, letting it go in one ear and out the other. I happened to look into the Buzz In and Out Diner as we walked by. Aunt Maxie was so busy telling me about the gossip she'd heard that she didn't notice Loretta sitting in a booth at the window with Lana. I just can't believe anything in the old barn would be so valuable. I acted as if I were interested now that I didn't want Aunt Maxie to see Loretta. Walking in the freezing cold and snow had zapped any energy I might have had, leaving none to stop a catfight between the two women. You'd be surprised what people would hide back in the day. Aunt Maxie plunged the poles down into the snow, thumping her way across the boardwalk. Looks like Loretta didn't get what she wanted. Ha! Aunt Maxie squealed in delight when we passed the antique shop and it was sealed up tight. No lights whatsoever. No wonder Loretta was at the diner. She must have been waiting. It would be one thing if Loretta could cook but to screw up a cheese ball takes talent. I hated to admit it, but the words coming out of Aunt Maxie's mouth were true. And she's going to ruin the dinner. It's gonna be fine. My shift had focused to just calming Aunt Maxie down. The walk between the boardwalk and the Cocoon Hotel was literally a grassy field about the size of a football field. The historic white mansion built in 1841, had been in Kami's family for years. Kami hired Kane Construction to help rebuild the old structure into an amazing hotel that was situated right on Lake Honey Springs and kept the cozy character. The two-story white brick with the double porches across both stories was something to behold, especially during the Christmas season. Kami had light-up garland wrapped around the huge columns in the front and draped along all the wrought-iron two-story balconies. What are you smiling about? There's nothing good to smile about, Aunt Maxie huffed. Oh, I was just remembering my honeymoon night was right up there. I pointed at the balcony of the room Kami had offered Patrick and me on our wedding night 
during the Halloween festival a couple of years ago. We'd planned the entire thing because Aunt Maxie and my mom were being pills about who got to do what after Patrick and I got engaged. Patrick and I pulled one over on them and the entire community when we dressed as a bride and groom for Halloween. We were really dressed for our wedding, which took place in the hotel's hospitality room. My stars, Roxanne, did you hear me about Loretta's dips? Aunt Maxie had moved on from the cheese balls to the dips. I did hear you, but what do you want me to do? I asked and stopped shy of the front door. I want you to tell me why you decided to invite her to participate in the Christmas progressive dinner. And of all things, the hors d'oeuvres, she cried out. It's not nice to exclude people, especially during the holidays. I had nothing for her, but hoped throwing something about holidays and niceness in there might light a spark of kindness in her heart. It was my idea, Aunt Maxie grumbled. If I wanted her to be involved, I'd have asked. It's fine if she wants to come with the rest of the community. It was a great idea, too. I wanted to make sure she knew I recognized her efforts in getting such a fun event scheduled. And sometimes we have to do things with people we aren't the fondest of. It's going to be after cocktails at the watershed. I grinned. Maybe people will be too looped up to notice how bad Loretta's dips are. Oh, Aunt Maxie's face froze, her mouth slightly open, her brows lifted way up on her forehead. You might just have something, she gnawed on her lower lip. I think I'll go talk to Fiona and see if she can do some heavy pours that night. I'll catch up later. Oh, dear me, just what we needed. A bunch of folks with too much alcohol in their systems walking around Honey Springs. Apparently, today wouldn't be as great as I thought it was going to be. Chapter 3 Kami Montgomery was busy with a customer when I dropped the items off in the hospitality room. I didn't get a chance to ask her about Loretta, but none of it really mattered. Loretta seemed dead set on hosting it, and Aunt Maxie had appeared to be good with trying to get Fiona Rassone, the bartender at the watershed, to use a heavy hand. No doubt Aunt Maxie would entice the young lady with cash. As much as I didn't like the idea, it was kind of funny to think that Aunt Maxie would honestly condone such a thing, to get people to drink so they didn't have to taste Loretta's awful appetizers. Then again, I'd make amazing treats and coffee to help sober them up for their way home tonight. Bunny had a handful of customers when I'd gotten back, and she seemed to be doing fine on her own. Pepper was still asleep in his bed next to the fireplace. I slipped out of my coat and hung it on the rack next to the counter, just as the bell over the coffee house door dinged. Pepper jumped up. The jingle jangle of bracelets immediately clued me in on who was bending down in front of the shop. Sure enough, I saw the middle-aged, silver-bobbed, and highly classy Louise Carlton stand up, holding the cutest puppy you'd ever seen. Oh, my stars, I gushed, extending my arms out in front of me, weaving in and out of the tables to get my hands on the fur baby. This one will go fast. I made a pouty face, knowing there'd not be much time to spend with this week's featured animal from the pet palace, Honey Springs' idea of a local SPCA. Louise was the head of the program, and when I moved to Honey Springs, Pet Palace was where I thought I would go and volunteer. I did that, but Pepper also found me, and, well, I ended up taking him home, and now we were constant companions. Can you believe someone found this little one down by the lake? I'm so glad they were able to get her right before the snow today. Louise stroked the puppy's back while I snuggled the little one close to my neck. Oh, she's shivering. I frowned and tried to ignore Pepper, but he was standing on his hind legs with his front paws on my legs, nose tilted up to get a sniff. She's been scared since we got her. 
Louise got really close to the puppy and smiled, making smoochy sounds. You're right, puppies go fast, especially during Christmas. But she wasn't thriving in the shelter, so I thought I'd better let her come here and get some training from a perfect Pet Palace alumnus. Louise's pockets were always full of treats, so when she dragged one out to give to Pepper, I wasn't surprised. I think he will show her the ropes really fast. I decided to put the puppy down to see what she did. She peed. I grabbed some napkins off the nearest table and wiped it up. Great, Bunny groaned. Just what we need in case the health inspector comes in. Or maybe I can anonymously call the health inspector to tell them to check in on Loretta's kitchen. If we don't do something, she's going to kill someone. Bunny took off toward the janitorial closet. Louise paused to examine Bunny before her brows gave a quick furrow and lifted. Aunt Maxie has everyone in an uproar. Babette broke her ankle, so she can't participate in the progressive dinner tonight. Apparently, she called Loretta Beebe to take her place. I rolled my eyes. Oh! Louise's mouth formed a huge O. Oh. Have you tasted, she grimaced, her food, in particular, her dips and cheese balls? I've heard. No, I've not tasted them, but if Babette saw fit to, then I can only assume it's for the best. I watched the puppy start to follow Pepper around. Pepper was so good with the animals that were showcased each week. He'd been a Pet Palace superstar student and was a natural at loving all animals, even the cats Louise dropped off. Well, maybe she's gotten better. I know the ladies from church have started to give her the task of bringing paper plates and napkins. Louise laughed. Don't be upset with Maxine. She's worked really hard, and I'm sure when she calms down, she'll realize it's best. I know you're right but I'm the one who has to listen to her in the meantime. Hello, Louise, Bunny joined us with a mop. Cute puppy, but I don't do pee. She's potty trained, probably got a little too excited. How's Floyd? Louise wasn't fooling me none. She wanted off the subject of the puppy and was smart enough to know to ask about Floyd. He's fair. He's gone to see some family over Christmas, so I reckon I'll be spending it here for dinner. I was happy to hear Bunny say she would come to my annual Christmas Day lunch at the Beanhive. Over the past few years, I'd hosted a big get-together for family and for friends who had become my family. Bunny Bowowski was definitely one of them. Even Louise came one year. The invitation was open to anyone. That's wonderful that you're coming. My heart warmed right along with the inside of the coffee shop as the fire continued to pop and crackle. You might have more people than you think if this snowfall keeps up. Louise referred to how the snow kept falling at a steady pace. The more the merrier. I couldn't help but picture all the people inside of the bean hive. Patrick and I transformed the dining room of the coffee house to a large table with all the Christmas cheer the space could handle. Which reminds me to move that table out of the way. I pointed at the corner table up near the right corner. Patrick should be stopping by with the Christmas tree. I had him go to Hill's Dairy Farm to get one from Jean. Oh, Jean, how is she? Louise asked. I think she's doing better. Each month as a widower, she seems to be getting stronger. It was my standard reply. But I'd know better once I headed out that way to get the creamer, fresh eggs, and other things I needed to keep my promise to use only products from Honey Springs as much as I could. The local supplies cost a little more, but the quality was something money couldn't buy. Jean Hill had the best of everything, even flowers. That puppy will enjoy the fire with pepper. Bunny had walked over, bent down, and fluffed up Pepper's doggy bed. That got his attention away from the puppy. Pepper trotted over to his bed, and the puppy followed him. Would you look at that? 
A huge smile crossed Bunny's face. That puppy has taken to Pepper. And I'm sure the little rascal won't be here long. I couldn't resist the cute puppy, not to mention her breath, which had a smell that was unmistakable and unforgettable. I wasn't paying attention to where I was going and bumped into one of the tables, knocking off one of the cow ceramic creamer pots. I reckon I'm just going to keep this out all day. Bunny huffed and stood over me with the mop, waiting for me to pick up the glass. Dang, that was one of my favorites. If you hurry down to the wild and whimsy, I heard Beverly picked up some good finds at the barn auction. I bet they had some. Louise had my interest piqued. Aunt Maxie had mentioned the barn, and now so did Louise. Maybe I'll run down there. I glanced up at the clock. It was a little before 8 a.m. Although the Wild and Whimsy opened at 10, they were keeping Christmas hours, which meant they would open at 8 for a few weeks. Go on, I've got the puppy in the cream. Bunny sloshed the mop right and then left. Thank you, Bunny. What would I do without you? Even though she played tough sometimes, she knew I adored and appreciated her. You'd get along just fine, she joked, moving her attention to a customer who'd walked up to the bakery counter. This time I took my apron off and exchanged it for my coat, hat, and gloves before I ventured back out into the snow. The sun was barely peeking out from behind a low-hanging gray cloud. The wind skidded across Lake Honey Springs. The lapping waves crashed against the pier, slapping against the piles, and echoing from underneath. With my gloved hand, I fisted the collar of my coat a little tighter to ward off the chill before it settled into my bones. Two blooms in one day, Beverly Tea Garden said, after I'd taken off all the layers and she recognized it was me. Maxie was in earlier. Beverly lifted her chin, giving me a look indicating that something was up. Let me guess. I pulled off my hat and brushed my hands through my black hair, shaking the ends to get the snowflakes off of the bottom. My hair was naturally curly, and any bit of water would just add frizz. She was in here looking for Loretta Beebe. You guessed it. Beverly and Dan had such a cute shop. A grunting sound, followed by a creaking noise, came from the roof. She walked over and looked out the door. I sure hope that awning stays attached to the roof. I told Dan during the summer I noticed it was coming away from the building, but things piled up. The awning's coming off? I asked, and looked outside and then up to see the red awning flapping in time with the wind. Oh, yeah, I see it on the end. Beverly let out a long sigh, shaking her head. Patrick is going to stop by the coffee house this morning. I'll have him stop by and see if he can do anything. It was a mere suggestion, and one of those things Patrick didn't like me to do. He was so handy, and since he owned Kane Construction, I offered up his services without asking him. He had told me a time or two not to fill his schedule with friends, but I was in the small shop frame of mind. We all had to stick together to survive, and if he could screw in a bolt or hammer in a nail or two... It was for the good of Honey Springs. Did Aunt Maxie find Loretta? I asked, and moseyed into the antique shop, looking around for anything that struck my fancy while Beverly and I made chit-chat. No, but Lana was in here, going through the boxes of items Dan and I had gotten from that old barn off of Crescent Peak Road. She picked up some little box and dusted it off before she found a place for it on the other shelf filled with little boxes. That was the thing about antiques. They always looked like they needed to be dusted. They were just old, and I definitely didn't want them for my house. Speaking of that old barn, did you get any cow creamers? I broke one this morning. I couldn't stop myself from walking over to one of the many Christmas trees, all of which had glittery ornaments on them. Let me look in the boxes in the back. There's so many. She hurried to the back of the shop. The balls on the tree weren't bright, but had more muted tones. The sequins, along with some little Swarovski crystals, 
made them shine and sparkle from the tree lights. I love these, I said when I heard her shuffling. I think I'd like to purchase all of them for the tree at the bean hive. Sure, I can use this box. I didn't see Beverly, but I heard her voice and the noise of her removing the items she referred to out of the box. I don't see any creamers in here. That doesn't mean there aren't any. She walked back up to meet me at the tree with an empty box in her hand. Let me go get some bubble wrap for them. She set the box down at my feet. Nah, Patrick should be here any minute, so I don't want to take the time to wrap only to have to unwrap them. I started to pluck the ornaments off the tree one at a time and carefully placed them in the box with Beverly's help. Loretta didn't get an earful, but Lana sure did from Maxie. Beverly began to tell me how Aunt Maxie begged Lana to make the appetizers. Lana insisted Loretta wanted to do it because she'd offered. What did Loretta want from you anyways? I asked, just to bide time while we took down the ornaments. After she heard I'd gotten the bid on the old barn, she was on the phone calling me. Beverly snorted. Dan and I knew why she was calling before I even picked up the phone. She's been dying to get her hands on it, but it was the property of the banks. And, well, let's just say that the bank knew we would pay the price and not try to negotiate. I could hear Loretta now, trying to get Evan to come down on the price. Believe you me, when she threw out a number for the china she wanted... I almost left this world. Honestly, she doesn't want anyone to make any money. I know she's been eyeballing that china for years. Beverly had my interest piqued. Years? I asked. From what I understood, the house on the property had been demolished a long, long time ago. It was by the family. I was a kid when they moved the items to the barn. At that time, the barn was in really good shape. She patted around her body. Just like me, she joked. Over time, this old gal has gone downhill. You look great, just like one of the girls. I was talking about Savannah and Melanie, the tea gardener's daughters, who are about ten years younger than me. Both were in college. What is so special about the china? I don't think it's the actual worth as much as the memory. You see, the family who lived there was pretty well off. They would throw these huge Christmas parties. If your family got invited, it was a big deal. She had a look on her face as if she were remembering something. Did you get to go? I asked. Yes, she gushed. I'll never forget it. My parents had spent all the money they'd saved for the winter months to get us new clothes. It was the first time I'd ever had matching anything. Her memory made her face glow. The interior of the house was decorated from floor to ceiling with Christmas. There wasn't one single area that didn't have something. All the doorknobs even had some sort of decoration hanging from them. That sounds like a fairy tale. I loved hearing old stories like these. It was, especially for a kid. Santa came on a huge red sleigh drawn by real reindeer. When I gave her an odd look, she nodded. Don't ask me how, but it was amazing, and I'll never forget it. I got a doll the size of me, she laughed. I think I still have that doll in my attic. See, it's the memories the house gave you. Loretta remembers the tablescape. It was gorgeous. So when I bought the barn, I let her buy the china. The china was full except for one piece, the serving platter. That's the one she really wants. What on earth happened to the family? I had to know. They got older and became reclusive. She frowned and held one of the ornaments in her hand. Too bad, too. The house was really different, and none of their children lived here. They just let it sit and rot. They didn't want to buy back the property? It was such a shame. Evan said the deed was signed over to Honey Springs. 
Technically, the city owns it, and I can't help but wonder if they're about to do something with the land. You know, one of those strip malls or something? Beverly told me something I sure didn't like to hear. She slipped the last ornament into the box. Anyways, long gone are the good old days. She picked up the box. That's a shame. I tugged my hat out of my coat pocket and pulled it over my head. Maybe you'll find a creamer in one of them when you search for the platter. Maybe, but Loretta wants the platter now for this appetizer deal. Beverly handed me the box. Maxine told me she'd pay me not to give it to Loretta. She even begged Lana to quit working for Loretta and come work for her. They almost got into an argument about it. What did Lana say? I felt bad for her being stuck in the middle of what Aunt Maxie put her in. Lana at first thought Maxine was joking, but Maxine got a little huffy. Finally, Lana told her flat out no, and it was literally a stern no. Beverly waved at the group of customers coming in. I can't wait to see the tree tonight. Those will look great in the coffee shop. How much? I asked. Nothing if you can get Patrick down here to fix my awning, she called from over her shoulder as she walked away to see if the customers needed any help. Chapter 4 Patrick and Sassy were at the beanhive when I got back. They were playing with the puppy. Let me help you with that. Patrick jumped up from the hearth and hurried over to take the box. He gave me a kiss. What's inside? The most beautiful box of glittery ornaments. I opened the top to show him. I know I normally don't do all the glitter for the coffee house, but these really spoke to me, and they were free. Free? They look expensive. He set the box down on the small cafe table he'd moved without me. The Christmas tree he'd brought was wrapped up in the green netting and sitting in the tree stand, ready to be clipped open. If you want to call your labor expensive. I slipped that in without a care in the world, hoping he'd just go with it. He did not. What do I have to fix now? His shoulders fell. Oh, these are lovely. Bunny had found her way over to us and placed her hands in the box. I think I've seen these before. They were in that barn the tea gardens had bought from the bank. I didn't think too much about it until Bunny's gasping gave her excitement away. The Seifert's old place? She dug down into the box, took out each ornament one at a time, and held them up to the light. I'd heard about their Christmas trees and parties, but was never invited. I know Maxine was invited. She let the world know. Really? I found it fascinating Aunt Maxie hadn't ever mentioned it. I've never heard a word from her. She went. I think she even had lunch with Mrs. Seifert once. Bunny was blowing my mind. There'd been talk of the old barn, and I was sure Aunt Maxie was there, especially when Loretta Beebe talked about it. But maybe all the gossip was just running together. Trust me, I heard everything in the coffee house by just walking past tables while serving coffee. Getting the hearsay all mixed up was all too possible, which was why I never repeated any of it. Still, listening in was a lot of fun at the time. They are as gorgeous as I imagined. How much did this cost you? She asked and held the silver one with the clear crystals up to the light. I'm thinking she negotiated some labor. Patrick put his hand on my back and gave it a slight rub. How did you guess? I smiled, knowing he was fine with my little deal with Beverly, even though he didn't have a clue what I'd agreed for him to do. Anything that makes you happy is worth it to me. He bent down and gave me a kiss. Pfft, pfft. Bunny put the ornament on the tree. I've about had enough of that. This is a coffee house, not the Cocoon Hotel. She waddled off to the coffee bar and began to straighten it while Patrick and I resumed decorating the tree. What was the cost? he asked. The awning outside of the wild and whimsy is coming loose from the building. 
Do you think you can put a screw in it or something? I asked as if it were just that easy. Or something, he muttered. Right before our attention was taken away from the tree, and Aunt Maxie swept into the coffee house like the wind that followed her. Good afternoon, Maxine. Oh, Patrick, this afternoon has been much better than this morning. Her gaze slid to me subtly, letting me know I'd ruined the morning and she'd fixed it. I'm curious. I put the last ornament on the tree. Oh, my stars! Aunt Maxie drew in an excited breath. This looks just like a tree I've seen before. She reached her gloved hand out and extended it to the Christmas tree, her fingertips barely grazing a few of the ornaments as she swept her fingers back into her chest. If you're referring to the Seifert's Christmas tree, you have seen it before. From what I understand, you went to their house a few times. I observed her movements. That old bunny Bowowski has a big mouth, Aunt Maxie snarled. Patrick, it was good seeing you. I need to get something in the refrigerator so I can take it tonight. She patted the big oversized hobo bag strapped across her body. Patrick, will I be seeing you tonight? Yes, ma'am. He and Aunt Maxie embraced. I can't wait. It's going to be fun. I've heard all the talking around town this morning. You have? Her eyes fluttered open with a sparkle. Mm Mm-hmm, sure have. Patrick was telling her a big lie. He knew exactly what to say to butter her up. The whole town is excited. I knew it was a fantastic idea. She gave me the side eye with thin lips before they turned up on the corners and looked at Patrick. I have a few up here. She tapped her temple before she excused herself. Did you see how she skipped right over my comment about the Seifert place? I found it odd she didn't engage with me when normally she'd be all over it with some sort of tail. She looked busy, and she's got a lot on her plate to make sure this progressive dinner goes well. It's the first one, and she likes things just so. Patrick gave me all sorts of excuses for her while I watched her slip through the kitchen swinging doors without so much as looking Bunny's way. A sure sign Aunt Maxie was up to something. It didn't matter what time of day it was. If Bunny was around, Aunt Maxie always said something snarky to her just to get Bunny's goat. Bunny noticed it, too. We caught each other's eye and gave a little shrug. I think it's gorgeous and just for a little labor, I said sarcastically and wrapped my arms around Patrick's waist. I looked up and smiled. The lines around his big brown eyes softened and his chiseled jaw relaxed as he offered me a tender smile in return. Anything for you, Roxanne. He snuggled me tight, and we both stood there taking in the exquisite beauty of the ornaments. Next year, these just might go on our tree at home. Just as soon as I mentioned home, Pepper, Sassy, and the little puppy had found the tree and sniffed all over it. No, no. Patrick unwrapped his arms from around me. Where's Pepper's leash? His leash is hanging up on the coat rack, and I think the puppies is still in the bag Louise left. I said, so grateful he was going to take all three on a walk, in the snow, so I could keep working. I moved around the coffee house, making sure the customers who were at the tables and on the couches were all taken care of. I asked if they needed any refills or anything else I could get them. Patrick wrangled the three fur babies out the door. Toodles, Aunt Maxie called on her way out. I stopped at the window bar to pick up a cup and saucer from a previous customer. There, I watched Aunt Maxie stop to talk to Patrick just outside the door, where she had dropped her skiing equipment and entered the coffee house. She sure is up to something, Bunny said behind me, staring out too. I think I'll go look and see what she put in the refrigerator. I sighed, and watched my aunt pat the little puppy before she snapped her ski poles open and slipped her feet into the snowshoes. Good idea. Bunny took the cup and saucer from me. I'll clean this while you go investigate. Investigate? I laughed and headed back to the kitchen, where I found over four different cheese balls tucked into the refrigerator. 
It wasn't the cheese balls that threw me, or that I could clearly see what Aunt Maxie intended to do with them. I knew her so well. No wonder she was so upbeat and happy. Her solution to her little dip problem with Loretta Beebe was to replace them with her own cheese balls and dips. Unfortunately, it was the hand-engraved Christmas platter that stopped me in my tracks. Chapter 5 The rest of the day went pretty smoothly. We'd seen a steady flow of customers in and out. The puppy had been picked up and held so many times that the little thing became worn out. I decided to put the puppy's bed behind the counter so she could get some peaceful sleep. When Loretta's granddaughter, Bertie, showed up to work, she nearly melted over the sweet little baby's cuteness. Are you sure you're going to be okay tonight, closing alone? I asked Bertie, though I knew she'd closed so many times before. Yeah, and with her. She pointed at the puppy, now rolled over on her back, her full belly spilling over and taut. Have a good time. Bertie had dug into a leftover morning quiche she'd gotten from the kitchen. She was a bright young woman with a blonde pixie cut, a rail thin body, and a habit of wearing her tops hacked off midway, showing off her belly. Even the work shirts I gave her she'd made into her own style by knotting it in the back and folding the edges over, giving a slight peek of skin. I will. How did your grandmama's appetizers turn out? Every time I referred to the woman as what Loretta wanted Bertie to call her, it cracked me up. Blah. She took another forkful of the quiche. Awful, she said with a full mouth. That's why I'm stuffing my face. She had me try one thing after the other, and she's just not good at making appetizers. The rest of her food is good. Loretta had made plenty of dishes for the church's repasts, as well as items for the Southern Women's Club, the handful of times they'd invited me to come to a meeting. But they were still on the fence about letting me join. Baked things can burn out the flavors, Bertie joked. Not appetizers like these cheese balls and dips she insists on making. Between me and you, I untied the apron from my waist and exchanged it for my coat, hat, and gloves, so I could head on down to the watershed where the cocktails were being served for the progressive dinner's first round. Aunt Maxie is planning on swapping out Loretta's cheese balls with her own. I sighed, then shrugged. I'm so glad Patrick took Pepper home this afternoon. Do you think you can take the puppy out a few times before we come back here for our after-dinner coffee? I asked. Of course, and you don't have to come here right after dinner is served to get the coffee ready. Bunny left a list of things she's already done, and I can get the coffee brewing. Bertie was one in a million. Bertie was sent to live with Loretta as some sort of punishment for acting up in her schoolwork and at home. She turned out to be a whiz in chemistry and science, which made her a great asset to the new roastery. I gave her free reign to combine and play with all the beans she wanted to and to find the right composition for the best roasted cup of coffee. She was always writing in her notepad about the beans' chemical makeup and how the combinations of beans felt in the mouth as she sipped the coffee and how they tasted going down. Not only was she great at coming up with new ideas, but she was also amazing at upselling the customer. I was horrible at that. I would give things away for free. Not Bertie. She was able to talk everyone into something else. Over the summer, she'd worked full-time, which gave Bunny some much-needed time to sleep in. And Bertie would beg me not to take orders because she said I was going to bankrupt the coffee house and she needed a job or Loretta would send her back home. When she first came to work, I was a bit hesitant because Loretta had freaked me out by saying Bertie was in trouble at home. But when Bertie came to the job interview, the shop had a long line of customers. She didn't hesitate. Though not hired, she jumped right on in and started taking orders. Little did I know she'd worked at a coffee shop before and really knew her way around without being told what to do. I hired her on the spot. Plus, she was good with the high school crowd that came in after school every day during the school year. 
Are you going home for Christmas? I asked Bertie, knowing her father, Elliot, really missed her. Nope, they're coming here. I told them I had to work. She glanced at me. Go on, I'm listening. She swiveled, turning her back to me. I, too, had a very volatile relationship with my mom. I tried to talk to Bertie as a friend and not so much as an authority figure. She'd already had enough adults in her life telling her what to do, and no way did I understand being a mother. However, I did know what it was like to have a mom who had expected more from me than I could give when I decided to move to Honey Springs. Life wasn't so rosy for me when I was your age. My dad had died, and my mom had pretty much kept Aunt Maxie and Honey Springs out of my life. It was hard to imagine now, since my mom had realized I was not going to move home after my divorce, and she ended up moving here. Your mom? Birdie turned back around with the latte stirrer in her hand. Yep, my mom. I pushed myself up to stand and looked over my shoulder when a customer came through the door. I guess what I'm saying is that everything will work out. You just have to be open and honest. Truthfully, it took a long time for me to learn to set boundaries. Tell them you don't want to come home and would rather they come here. But don't lie to them. Boundaries, she snorted. That's what my therapist keeps telling me. Listen to your therapist. I walked around the counter and waited for the customer to decide what they wanted from the bakery case. And if you want to work, you know I'll have the hours, especially if this snow keeps up. It went without saying that Bunny shouldn't be out in the snow, and Floyd definitely didn't need to be driving her to work. The winter months meant basically that I worked most of the hours, but I didn't mind. This was where I poured my heart and soul when I was healing from my past, and that did include my relationship with my mom. Speaking of moms, I touched Bertie's arm. Do you think you can help them when they decide what they want? I'm going to go call my mom. Of course. She put the latte stirrer in the sink and walked over to the customer's. I disappeared into the kitchen and took my phone out of my pocket. Hey, Mom. I opened the refrigerator door and took out the red velvet whoopie pies I'd made for my after-dinner coffee and the dessert part of the progressive dinner. What time are you headed over to the watershed? Honey, I'm running late. I had so many people looking at cabins to purchase. It's been crazy today. Mom's nomadic lifestyle settled in Honey Springs a couple of years ago. She wasn't a true nomad, but after my father died, she just picked up and started to travel around. It went without saying that it was her way of dealing with my dad's death and trying to maneuver through life without him. Or maybe it was even what her life without him had to be. When she decided to become a realtor, I was a bit shocked, but honestly, she was darn good at it. I just finished up writing a contract, so I'm going to be a little late. I'll probably just meet you at the, oh, what? She paused. I heard Babette broke her ankle. Where are the appetizers? That's a whole different story that I'll tell you over a cocktail. It was all I had to say to let her know we needed more than just a quick chat, and alcohol had to be involved. Maxine, she asked. Part of it. I laughed at the fact that Mom knew Aunt Maxie had to be involved. Loretta jumped in to take over for Babette, so apps are now being served at the Cocoon Inn. Roxanne, honey, let me call you back. I've got to take this call from the lender. Mom clicked over. She knew I would be fine with her jumping off, but I really wanted to talk to her about the land being sold. Not that it mattered, but I was always looking for a location to open another coffee house. I still had a lot of things to do before I could even reach the point of actually doing it. Things like market research, the demographics, and quite frankly, obtaining the money. How much would it cost to rent a space when the space I had here was from Aunt Maxie? The family discount had to be applied because she owned the Crooked Cat, the local bookstore also located on the boardwalk. Aunt Maxie didn't mind upping Leslie's rent, though Leslie complained about it. Aunt Maxie never once raised mine. Still, the thought tickled my mind and piqued my interest. 
Rocks? Patrick pushed through the kitchen door. Hey, you ready? Look at you, I gushed. You got all gussied up. I winked and walked over to kiss my handsome husband. He'd traded in his heavy brown construction coat, jeans, and dirty old work boots for a pair of khakis and a button-down long sleeve shirt topped by a v-neck sweater that looked like Christmas had thrown up on him. What on earth are you wearing? I took a step back to get a better look at the horrible sweater. What, you don't like it? He glanced down. Sassy loved it. She sat with me while I glued on all the things Franny had picked up at the store. Franny was Patrick's secretary. It's for the ugly sweater contest. They'll be judging all week for the festival, and I am going to win, he said with pride and certainty. I even tried my hand at sewing on the lights. They're battery operated. He turned around and lifted the back of the sweater. The wires from the twinkly lights he'd sewn on were hooked to a battery pack in his back pocket. The glitter was Fanny's idea. He turned back around and did a little shimmy shake. The gold and silver glitter glistened when the kitchen lights hit it just right. It's a fabulous Christmas tree. It really wasn't, but it was adorable he'd taken the time to make a sweater. I did tell you about it, but you've been so preoccupied with this event that I just dropped it after you just nodded and shook your head. Patrick offered a forgiving smile. I hope you're going to take some much-needed time during the week of Christmas. You know me. I reached out and touched the gold star atop the tree on his sweater. I say I am, but then something takes my attention. I thought that's why you had Bertie. He knew she'd asked if she could work more hours over the holiday, but that was before I'd realized she did it only to get out of going back home to visit her parents. We can talk about that later. I reached up and ran my hand along the fuzz on his face. The goatee he'd been wearing lately was nicely cut and had very defined lines. He had the cutest dimples just behind the corners of each side of his mouth that deepened when he grinned. Looks like you got a haircut. I ran my hand over the top of his salt and pepper hair, which was becoming saltier as the years went by. Chrissy? Yep. I took the ferry over to the spa and exchanged some HVA ductwork to heat the all-seasons room she insisted they were going to keep open. His eyes dipped. When I reminded Chrissy, she said Kirk insisted on it. That man... I groaned and walked over to the small office where I'd kept some extra clothes for the times when Patrick stopped by for a quick supper. I loved the smell of all the things in the coffee shop, but I didn't want to wear them like a perfume all day. He's just looking out for the business. He was talking about Be Happy Resort, which Chrissy Lane had opened on the island in the middle of Honey Springs Lake. It was really a fabulous idea. At first, on that small island in the middle of Lake Honey Springs, Andrew and Kayla Noro had a thriving honey business with their beehives. That island had a lot of property that was able to be developed, and Chrissy Lane had been doing all that metaphysical yoga stuff that I barely understood, but she'd really thrown herself into the practice. She went as far as California to take classes and learn the business side. She'd gotten a financial backer, who ended up being my ex-husband, Kirk, and, well, he'd been coming in and out of Honey Springs to check on his business. It had been a thing for me, a real yucky thing. Poor Patrick had to deal with him, since Kane Construction was the contractor on the project. Only bad thing was how Chrissy kept her financial backer a secret until the spa opened. Here we were today, with what felt like Kirk having a hand in Patrick's financial dealings. Don't you dare do anything for Kirk for free, not even a haircut. I left the office door just barely open while I changed my clothes in case Bertie came into the kitchen. Ah, it was really easy, and I don't mind helping Chrissy out. Patrick was being nice, though I knew it pained him to see Kirk. Kirk wasn't the stand-up guy Patrick was. Far from it. Kirk had really treated me badly. But one thing was for sure. 
Patrick didn't let Kirk bug him. He saw it as business, and I guess that was where I was different as a business owner. Many times, Patrick would tell me to think like a man when it came to decisions about the coffee house, and I couldn't do that when it came to the customers in mind. I knew if I wanted a cozy and comfy coffee house, so did the people I wanted to serve, and I let my intuition guide me. Did you know they were going to be developing some land around here soon? I asked Patrick and peeked my head out the crack of the office door. Yeah, we're putting in a bed. He sounded like his mouth was full of something. You better not be eating a red velvet whoopie pie, I trilled, sitting down in the office chair so I could get my boots on, because those are for tonight. I grabbed my phone and headed back into the kitchen. Nope. He was licking his lips before he realized I'd seen him. He brushed the sleeve of his sweater over his mouth. Nope. He shook his head. Maybe one. Patrick Kane, I moaned. What am I going to do with you? I only want you to love me. He placed his arm around my shoulder. Oh, I do. I wrapped an arm around his waist, and we headed out the swinging door. Chapter 6 The Watershed was a pretty fancy restaurant for Honey Springs. It was located on the opposite of the boardwalk of the Cocoon Hotel and on the water's edge. The owners of the watershed created the floating restaurant with special occasions in mind. White tablecloths and amazing views of the lake set the scene. The restaurant also did charter boat dinners, in which the staff took you out on a boat and served your supper while you cruised down the lake. Those were expensive, but worth the romance, in my opinion. Roxy! Patrick! Over here! Chrissy Lane's sun-washed blonde hair was back. She was a smidgen like Aunt Maxie when it came to hair. Chrissy was a beautician by trade, so when she went from her natural red to blonde to whatever was on sale down at the grocery store, it didn't shock me. I've got us a bar table. She scrunched up her nose, and the light dusting of red freckles sprinkled across her nose formed one big freckle. She hopped up and down and pointed at the bar table up next to the bar, making her sassy, uplifted set of breasts bounce in its sequined red V-neck sweater tight on her body. I gave her the I'll be right there finger gesture. Did you see Aunt Maxie? I asked Patrick and looked around, seeing a lot of folks I knew and a lot I didn't. Andrew and Kayla Noro were standing next to Chrissy. Then there was Louise Carlton with Leslie Rourke. I was delighted when I saw Big Bib, the burly yet very kind ferry boat driver and owner of the marina near the hotel. He rarely left the boat dock, much less changed out of his blue mechanic jumper to attend anything. He lifted a beer when Patrick noticed him. Do you mind if I go have a beer with Big Bib? Patrick asked me before I nodded. He kissed me. Do you want something? No, I shook my head. I'm going to go look for Aunt Maxie. I wanted to see her for two reasons. The first was to make sure that she didn't need me to do any last-minute preparations, and the second was to tell her that I didn't approve of her switching out any sort of cheese balls. She needed to just let the evening progress. I walked over to the end of the bar, where the waitstaff generally waited to pick up drink orders and take them to their customers, because it was the only space not taken. It was an unspoken reserved area. Hi, girl, Fiona Razone called from behind the bar. She had two bottles of good old-fashioned Kentucky bourbon in each hand, tipped over and pouring into two glasses. What can I get you? Nothing. I shook my head and couldn't help but notice the heavy hand pour trickling over the cubes of ice. I see Aunt Maxie got to you. Oh, yeah. Fiona set the bottles down, grabbed two mini brown straws, and tucked one in each drink. She put them on the bar in front of Dan Teagarden in exchange for the cash he'd laid down. He was Sans Beverly in their one sweater. Dan and I nodded at each other, since it was too loud to even try to say hello. Loretta didn't care about the crowd. She also found Dan at the bar. From afar, I watched the interaction between them. While I watched their exchange, the people next to me were talking about the old Seifert place. 
I heard someone was living there when the bank went in to assess the property, the one person said. The ghost of the ciphered who doesn't want their secrets to be uncovered, the other teased and laughed. Magically. Magically? I wondered what that meant for a moment, until I noticed Loretta's friendly walk up to Dan wasn't friendly at all. Loretta's head was bobbing back and forth, and her mouth moved as quickly as her finger pointing between him and Beverly, who did take notice of Loretta's behavior. The huge sweater hung down Beverly's entire body like a window drape. I leaned in so I could get a better look once Beverly joined them. Dan apparently left whatever Loretta said to him up to Beverly to finish it. Beverly's face tightened. Dan walked away. Loretta put her hands on her hips, then threw them up in the air, leaving Beverly standing with Lana, both of their mouths open. Lana said something to Beverly, who pointed a hard finger at Lana. Then Lana took off. Fiona walked over, tapped the cash register, and stuck the money in. Your Aunt Maxie, Fiona caused me to shift my focus. Oh, yeah, she gave me a little moolah to take care of the people tonight. She scanned the bar and let the other bartenders take the many orders flying in from customers. Something about Loretta Beebe's awful attempt at appetizers? She laughed. Fiona played it off, but she was good at listening. It was a bartending skill she'd really honed, and it made her super popular with the locals. Even though I rarely drank, sometimes I'd just walk down from the coffee house to get some fresh air and end up at a bar stool, sipping on a Diet Coke and telling Fiona about my life. It just kind of happened. Have you seen her? I asked Fiona about Aunt Maxie. No. One of the servers hollered for Fiona, and she jerked her head down to the opposite end of the bar. Let me know if you need something. She smiled and took off. I'd almost given up on finding Aunt Maxie as I continued to mosey around all the people. Then I ran into Alice D. Spicer. She owned the Honeycomb Salon and Spa. You better get on down to the Honeycomb before this winter freeze dries you out even more. Alice D. plunged her hands in my thick hair, fanning it out between her fingers. Unless you're going to use my competition. She tweaked a brow. I noticed Patrick has gone to the dark side. Dark side, I snorted. Nah, we love you. You do realize every time you go over there, you're giving your ex money. She made a good point. It's all good, I lied. Of course it wasn't all good, and I hated giving Kirk Swindle any part of my income. Call me tomorrow with your next open appointment, and I'll be there. Will do. Have you seen Aunt Maxie? I asked, scanning the tops of the customers' heads. It's so busy in here. When I got here, she was leaving with a box full of things. She said she'd be back. Alice took a sip of her cocktail. I think it's turning out great. Everyone's in high spirits. And did you see all the ugly sweaters for the ugly sweater contest? Yes, they are hilarious. So many great ideas were on display. I had no idea there was even a contest until Patrick picked me up. I love how the tea gardens are in one big sweater. Beverly and Dan were near the front, where the jazz band was playing Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. They swayed as one in the huge sweater. The scene was cute, and now that their daughters were grown, the tea gardens seemed to be enjoying the empty nester life. They're really lucky they got the old Seifert barn. That'll bring them some money they can spend on that old shop of theirs. I told them they needed to get that awning fixed before it fell down and smacked someone in the head. She reminded me to check to see if Patrick had put the screw in there, or at least looked at it like I had asked him to. If you'll excuse me. I wanted to continue to look around for Aunt Maxie. The crowd in the watershed had grown. This was a much bigger turnout than I'd anticipated, but when free food was around, people had a lot of interest. Everyone was happy with how the progressive dinner was turning out. It was hard not to notice the laughter, chatter, and smiling faces when I looked around to find Aunt Maxie. Locating her shouldn't be that hard. Her hair stood a mile high with that thick, strong 80s hairspray she used. Still, she was nowhere to be seen. I drummed my fingernails on the bar, wondering where on earth she'd gone. 
Then it dawned on me. She'd gone to get those darn cheese balls out of the refrigerator at the bean hive. I glanced back down the bar. Fiona was all the way down at the other end, gabbing it up with some locals. My eyes shifted to Patrick. He'd settled down on a stool at a bar table with the tea gardens and Chrissy Lane. Now would be a perfect time to make a fast getaway, check on Aunt Maxie, or really try to get her to leave Loretta's appetizers alone and head on back. Simple enough, right? I slipped out of the restaurant, pulled my phone out of my coat pocket, and texted Bertie, resisting the urge to call. This was one of those instances in which Bertie would respond quicker by text than bothering to answer the phone. From what I understood, it was a generational thing. But I like to get things done, and to me, a phone call was quicker. Apparently, I was wrong. Me. Hey, Bertie, how are things going? It was so Southern that I always started my text by asking the other person how they were, since I should just get to the point. Because wasn't that what texting was all about? Quicker and to the point. Some footsteps caught my ear. When I turned around, Dan and Beverly Teagarden were in a heated discussion with each other and too busy to even notice me. Whatever Loretta had gotten on them about tonight must have spilled over into their personal discussion. From what I could tell from their body language, they didn't agree with each other. Instead of paying too much attention to them, I went back to my phone and decided to hit the delete button and start my text to Bertie over. Of course everything was fine or she would have called me. Me. There are going to be a lot more people than I realized for the after-dinner coffee. The turnout at the watershed is huge. Please pull out more of the whoopie pies from the freezer. No need to do anything with them yet. I'll let you know. I watched as the three ellipses rolled. My stomach lurched when they ghosted away. No response? I held the phone to my chest, curling my hands together. The air whipping off Lake Honey Springs was frigid. I pulled my phone back again to see if a text had rung in and I'd not heard it. Maybe my eardrums are frozen. I hit the screen with the pad of my finger to make it come alive. Nothing. I swiped the phone screen to open it and hit the messages icon. What can I say, I wondered, and thought I wasn't clear enough to warrant a response. I did say I'd let her know. I pulled the phone back to my chest and walked a little ways down the boat slips of the watershed where the owners stored their dinner yachts for the season and glanced across the water to the island to the bee farm where Kayla and Andrew Noro had put up a big display of wood cutouts of bees wearing Santa hats. The display was all lit up so the people on the land side of the lake could see and enjoy it. The sight was so cute, but I quickly shifted my focus back to the boardwalk. More importantly, I focused on the storefront of the bean hive. Instead of waiting for Bertie to text, I went ahead with my plan to walk up and see for myself if Aunt Maxie had been there. If she'd already gotten her own appetizers, what was I going to do or say to keep her from following through with her plan? That would be the hard part, and probably why my stomach felt a little nauseous. How could I get Aunt Maxie to change her mind about the switcheroo scheme she swore was going to save the progressive dinner? The wind ripped around. The snow continued to fall harder and harder. As I walked around the watershed, I noticed the moon hanging low. The atmosphere felt more appropriate for a scary Halloween night than a joyful night of the Christmas season. The feeling crept into my skin, crawled its way to my heart. My ears and eyes became very alert for some reason. Nothing could be going wrong. I mean, it was Christmas, but the feeling, one I had come to know pretty well, still settled into my soul. After living in Honey Springs for a couple of years, I felt that way when a crime was about to take place. But who in the world would commit a crime on Christmas? Famous last words because it had happened before. But this year was different. Everyone was pulling together, except for Aunt Maxie, who seemed fairly upset and determined to change the whole appetizer portion of this progressive dinner. Bertie, Louise Carlton, and another lady were sitting at one of the four top cafe tables. 
the lady I didn't know was cuddling the puppy. An open folder sat on top of the table, showing all the puppy's information. The puppy was nestled in the lady's lap, asleep with a big red bow. I glanced at Bertie, and she looked up. Isn't this wonderful? This lady's going to take the puppy home for Christmas. She recently lost their dogs and said this would be perfect for them. Joy was written all over Bertie's face. Louise smiled, too. I knew it wasn't going to take that long, I said. Everyone loves a sweet little puppy. I walked back into the kitchen so they could finish up the paperwork, but not without asking the woman to say goodbye so I could get a few more puppy kisses. I had to be honest. I loved puppy breath, and I wanted a little sniff before she left. With my eyes set on the industrial refrigerator, fully expecting to see Aunt Maxie's cheese balls, I gripped the handle and tugged open the door. Where are they? I asked myself, bending down to look behind all the extra whoopie pies and various things that had moved to the front of the refrigerator throughout the day. Like Patrick did, I moved my head side to side instead of physically moving things out of the way to find something. I always teased Patrick by telling him the items weren't going to jump out at him and that he had to actually move things to see all the contents of the refrigerator. Taking my own advice, I pulled out the whoopie pies. They looked so delicious. I lifted the edge of the plastic wrap, took one out, and pushed the whole thing in my mouth. A good cup of coffee would be good right now, I mumbled and looked into the refrigerator. The idea of coffee quickly left my mind when I saw Aunt Maxie's cheese balls were absent. Hey, what are you doing? Bertie called. She peeked around the swinging door, her hand gripping the edge. I was looking for Aunt Maxie's cheese balls. I slid the whoopie pies back on the refrigerator shelf and shut the door. She came and got them a little bit ago. I'm surprised you didn't see her here on your way into the coffee house. She motioned for me to come. The puppy's leaving. She jutted her bottom lip out in a dramatic frowny face. My stomach dropped on my way out of the kitchen. Not about the puppy, but because Aunt Maxie was still carrying out her plan. Nothing good came out of Aunt Maxie's tricks. It took all of my willpower not to run back to the refrigerator and binge on whoopie pies to push down the uneasy feeling rising inside of me. Did she say where she was going? I tried to keep everything as vague as possible. It was best to keep Aunt Maxie's scheme between her and me. Oh yeah, she said she was going to go down to the hotel and set up the appetizers because everything seemed to be going really well at the watershed. She felt she didn't need to stay down there. Inwardly, I sighed. Everything is going really well at the watershed, which reminds me that I think we need to get some more out of the refrigerator, just in case. I told her and let the kitchen door swing closed behind me. The door rocked a little back and forth before it stopped. Yeah, I saw your text and just went ahead and did it. She let me know there was no reason to text me back since she took care of it. When Louise is finished with the puppy adoption, I'm going to go ahead and start setting up the banquet table. Beverly Tea Garden dropped off a really cool vintage tablecloth and a couple new milkers. She dropped off some milkers? I was excited to hear that. Yeah, on their way down to the watershed. Bertie and I stopped at the table where Louise was packing up the contents of the puppy's file, giving the new owner all the information about bringing the puppy to the pet palace to get follow-up vaccines from our local vet. Beverly said that she opened up some boxes or something and found them and also found the cool Christmas tablecloth. She thought you might like it. Bertie reached over and scratched the little puppy's head. The puppy jerked her head up and nipped at Bertie's finger. Bertie had become such a great employee. I couldn't help but look at the young lady standing in front of me. She had changed so quickly over the past few weeks. Bertie had blossomed into an amazing young woman with a great head on her shoulders. She was able to waltz in, look around, and just start doing. That was what I loved most about Bertie. Since I'd opened the coffee house, I wasn't able to keep too many teenagers for the afternoon shifts. The only other one was Emily Rich, who just so happened to be a natural baker and took her talents out of Honey Springs when she graduated high school. 
Since then, I'd not found anyone to replace her until Loretta made Bertie walk through the door. If you have any questions, feel free to call me. Louise handed the woman her pet palace business card. Oh, bye, little puppy. Bertie whined and gave the puppy one last smooch. It didn't take long for Bertie to go back to typing away on her phone. Thank you for an amazing coffee house. I love it. The woman made my night. Thank you for coming. Are you here long? I asked, since I didn't recognize her as a local. I'm here off and on. My husband does business here, and, well, this is the first time I've come with him, and I love it. She leaned in a little. The puppy was sucking on the edge of her long brown hair. I'm trying to get him to purchase one of those cute lake cabins for a second home, but he's not buying it yet. Just take him around to all the shops and get a feel for how much our community is one big giant hug. I did love Honey Springs, except for Aunt Maxie's shenanigans, but no one needed to know about that. I hope your family enjoys her, Louise called to the woman, who was holding the puppy in her arms, the dog carrier tucked inside her elbow with the packet inside of it. That's a little backwards, I said over Louise's shoulder. Shouldn't the puppy be in the carrier and the papers in her hand? I joked, as I watched the woman head off into the cold and dark night with the puppy squirming in her arms. I hope she's prepared for a new baby. Louise sucked in a breath and turned around. That was a quick one. I knew the puppy would go fast. I shook my head. Do you think you can take a senior? Louise asked with caution in her tone. I've got a senior cat who just needs to be loved in her final years. Of course. No way would I turn down any animal, young or old, from Louise. Great. I'll be by in the morning with her if that's okay. Louise had bundled back up in her winter gear, including a thick scarf. And I'll see you back at the watershed. I waved her off, knowing I was heading straight down the opposite end of the boardwalk to the Cocoon Hotel, where I would try, one last time, to talk Aunt Maxie out of switching those appetizers. Y'all good here? I asked Bertie before I took off as well. Yeah, yeah, I'll have everything out and decorated for the progressive supper attendees. Bertie put her phone in the front pocket of her apron and went back to doing the regular straightening and cleaning of the tables. The carriage lights, lit up with the twinkling Christmas lights wrapped around them, warmed me up inside. The seasonal flags whipped back and forth in the breeze blowing from the lake. Though I knew time was of the essence to get to Aunt Maxie before the cocktail hour ended, I did take a minute to look in the Wild and Whimsy's display window. Beverly had changed it since I'd seen it this morning. Inside were different antique Christmas trees with little candles clipped on the fake branches. The ornaments looked aged and chippy, a very popular style around here. The entire display screamed the old-fashioned Christmas you'd see in old movies. I had a hunch while she was going through the boxes Bertie had mentioned. Beverly had found a lot of the Christmas items featured in the window display. Beverly was quite smart to decide to change the display. The people attending the progressive supper would be walking past the wild and whimsy all night, and the display would surely capture their eyes, making them want to come to shop tomorrow. It was an amazing marketing strategy. The sound of tourists walking along the boardwalk drew me away from my thoughts and put me on track to get to the hotel. I dilly-dallied way too long, and it was time to set Aunt Maxie straight. In no way could I let her carry out her little scheme. Every black rocking chair on the Cocoon Hotel's long, southern-styled front porch was occupied. The outdoor heaters buzzed with life, and the chatter of guests filled the air. The live miniature Christmas trees dotted between the rocking chairs and the baskets filled with buffalo-checked blankets were just little touches Kami had added to the cozy atmosphere she was going for. The smell of pine needles tickled my nose when I walked into the lobby. Kami wasn't at the desk when I passed by to look into the hospitality suite, where I saw Aunt Maxie hovering over the food table. Her crossbody bag was sitting on top of the table, wide open. Aunt Maxie! I rushed over to her and whispered, What are you doing in here? 
What does it look like? I told you I wasn't gonna let Loretta get away with killing people with their awful cheese balls. Aunt Maxie wore a pair of white gloves. She carefully peeled off the plastic wrap from the Christmas platter I'd seen in my refrigerator. I think you need to stop this. Right now. I tried to demand, but she wasn't listening. She put Loretta's cheese balls in the plastic wrap before she shoved them down in her crossbody bag. I will not let her ruin my fundraiser. Aunt Maxie wasn't budging. She unwrapped another one of her cheese balls to replace one of Loretta's, but stopped, took a cracker from the stack, and plunged it down into Loretta's creation. Here, she stuck it in my face. You try it. If you think it's edible, then I'll leave them. Fair enough. I took the cracker and nibbled at the end. Not bad. I pushed the whole cracker in my mouth. It's good, I shrugged. Then she handed me a cracker with a sample of her chipped beef ball. Delicious. You'd say that just to get me to stop, she snarled, and used her hand to make me step back. She went down the line, replacing all of Loretta's appetizers with her own. Hopefully we will run out of this so fast we can just move on to the buzz in and out. I'd seen Aunt Maxie get all bundled up in a tizzy before, but never one of this magnitude. She'd taken it to a whole different level, making me question if it was really for the fundraiser or her ego. After she ran out of her own appetizers to put out, I asked her, Are you satisfied now? I think we're finished here. She plucked the gloves off her hands. Why the gloves? I was curious. Because when or if Loretta finds out I switched out her food, she will demand some sort of evidence. She's not beyond hiring out a private investigator, and I've seen it on television where those kinds never stop at nothing to get fingerprints. Aunt Maxie sure did have an active imagination. They go through people's trash and everything. She had it all figured out, and I let her think whatever she needed to think because she wouldn't budge, especially now that she'd already replaced all of Loretta's food. Let's get out of here before someone sees you. I tugged on her shirt. Fine. She strapped the crossbody bag over her shoulder on her way out of the hospitality room, but we were greeted with a host of town folks who'd come down from the watershed, including Loretta Beebe and Lana Woodward. To say the next few minutes made me sweat was an understatement. Aunt Maxie and I both had perspiration bubbled up on our upper lips. I have to admit I was a little worried about these. Chrissy Lane held the cracker filled with chipped beef up in the air and popped the entire thing in her mouth. Loretta. Chrissy stopped Loretta when she drifted past. Where did you get the chipped beef? It's so good. Chipped beef? Loretta asked, batting her long, fake eyelashes. I didn't have any chipped beef in my appetizers. I swear that's a chipped beef ball on the Christmas platter. Chrissy's big mouth was going to get us in trouble. What Christmas platter? I didn't bring a Christmas platter because I don't have the one that matches my set. A sudden chill pervaded the air. Loretta stormed off with Chrissy in tow. I'm going to check on Bertie so I don't have to watch you-know-what hit the fan, I told Aunt Maxie and pulled out my phone on my way out of the hotel to text Bertie. You're not leaving me here. Aunt Maxie grabbed our coats and her cross body bag off the back of the chair and headed outside with me. What's going on down there? Aunt Maxie brought my attention to some flashlights down on the beach of Lake Honey Springs. Both of us stood on the front porch, pulling our coats on. They're probably walking the beach or something. I dismissed it and texted Bertie. Me. I was thinking maybe you should get out another cookie sheet of whoopie pies from the freezer. I'd rather have too many than not enough. No one should ever walk down along the lake at night. That's dangerous and they could die. Aunt Maxie had always been a stickler when I was a teenager and wanted to go to the lake for a party that the host shouldn't have thrown, but I was always honest with her. Most times she never let me go, and most times I snuck out. She was right. 
A slip here or there could cost a life if they weren't familiar with the terrain. Lake Honey Springs was deep, and it was also freezing right now. I heard my phone chirp back with a message. Birdie, I don't think you're going to need any more. Sheriff Shepard has canceled the progressive dinner. Me, what? Why? Birdie, dead body found on the beach of Lake Honey Springs. The wind had stopped. My gaze lay flat over the now still water of Lake Honey Springs. My mind was blank. The chill had left my body. A gust of wind swept past me. My chin curled into my shoulder, a natural response to shield my face. What's wrong? Aunt Maxie asked. There's a body down there. The dinner is canceled. My words caused me to shiver. Chapter 7 People would tell me how they'd been thinking about my coffee as soon as they got out of bed. According to them, before they even noticed, they were standing there ordering without even remembering walking down the boardwalk to get there. Or they couldn't remember their drive to the boardwalk. You know, those instances where certain thoughts took over our minds, making us unavailable for the moment. I really tried not to live like that. When customers told me these scenarios, I never judged them. I just made it a point to stay ever-present. Until now. I could say that I'd had that moment as soon as I got Bertie's nonchalant text. Before I knew it, I was standing in the lobby of the Cocoon Hotel, looking into the hospitality suite where Aunt Maxie had been called to have a little chat with Sheriff Spencer Shepard, the local sheriff. After we'd found out Lana was the body someone found on the banks of Lake Honey Springs, Loretta Beebe had also shown up. Now Kami Montgomery was consoling her in Kami's office. I didn't kill no one, I heard Aunt Maxie say with conviction, the type of conviction that you could tell was the truth. Yes, I might have changed out Loretta's cheese balls, but have you tried them? Aunt Maxie looked up at Spencer. You ask your mama. Aunt Maxie shook a finger. She knows that Loretta can't mix a cheese ball. That's probably what killed that poor girl. Kami, I grabbed at Kami when she darted past me. I have to get Loretta water before she passes out. Kami brushed her bangs out of her eyes and tugged her thick scarlet hair over one shoulder. Fine, I'll follow you. I followed her to the Cocoon Hotel's bar. Did Loretta give you any details? I hadn't seen a body or Kevin Roberts, our county coroner. And why is Aunt Maxie talking to Shepard? I had so many questions and kept spitting them out at Kami as she walked around the bar to get a glass of water. After Bertie had told me about the body, Aunt Maxie ran down to the beach to see what was going on. I went the opposite way and went to the watershed to get Patrick but the crowd had already dispersed because of the body, and I couldn't find him. Fiona told me a lot of the progressive supper attendees had decided to go to the lake to see for themselves what was going on. You know Loretta was hosting the appetizer part of the progressive dinner. She grabbed the glass and held it under the faucet. I leaned on the counter. Maxine came in here and switched out the cheese balls. Loretta's employee... Kami snapped her fingers a few times, trying to remember the girl's name. Lana, I said. I'd not seen her in there, but that didn't mean anything. She could have come in when I was off doing something else. Still, it was good information to know. Yes, Lana came in to make sure everything was all good. She caught Maxie in there, switching out the cheese balls. When I tell you Maxine lost her marbles, I'm telling you she lost her marbles. In other words, Aunt Maxie was at the point that she had no idea what she was saying. That out-of-your-head anger. Oh, dear. I gnawed on my lip. Not oh, dear. Kami's eyes grew, and she shut off the water. Oh, dead is more like it. Immediately, I knew why Spencer had pulled Aunt Maxie into the hospitality room. He was trying to see what she knew. And, Kami gulped. She stared at me with big eyes. 
When Lana was coming out of the hospitality suite, she had a cracker filled with Maxine's chipped beef spread. She stuffed it in her mouth. I asked her if it was good, and she mm-hmmmed and mmmmed while chewing. Kami tucked in her lips and shook her head. I went into the hospitality room to say something to Maxine, but she wouldn't hear of it. She insisted Loretta wasn't going to ruin her, and neither was the little twit. She called Lana a twit? Aunt Maxie had lost her marbles for sure, I thought, but didn't say it out loud. This was one of those times that my lawyer, well, ex-lawyer instincts took over and remaining silent with a straight face was the only option. She did. Then she said Lana will get her due, too. Kami lifted a hand to stop me from asking more questions. Now, before you go all warrioring on me, I heard Maxine threaten the girl with my own ears. Now the girl ends up dead on the beach? Did you happen to go after Lana? I blinked a few times. I'd come down here to find Aunt Maxie, and you weren't at the desk. I did, but she didn't want to talk to me, so I walked around the porch to see if any of my guests needed anything. Her lips dipped. I really wish I would have insisted Lana talk to me instead of letting her run off. Thanks, I said. I headed out of the bar so I could go into the hospitality room where it was apparent Spencer knew about Aunt Maxie's switcheroo because a deputy was in there talking to her. Excuse me. I gave a light rap on the opening trim around the door before I entered the hospitality room. Do we need a lawyer here? No, Roxanne. I'm fine. Aunt Maxie didn't look fine. She looked worried. Her normal, upbeat personality had dulled. I'm having a chat with Spencer here about some hearsay he wanted to ask me about. I don't need a lawyer. I'm right out here if you need me. I gave her a hard look before I turned around and left the room. The only way to get to the bottom of this was to get my eyes on the crime scene. I slipped past the hospitality room and glanced in. I didn't see Spencer, Aunt Maxie, or Loretta. The portable floodlights leading down to the beach on Lake Honey Springs told me Spencer had brought those in from the sheriff's office. I walked down to the beach in the shadows of the large oaks on the grassy area between the hotel and the lake. The darkness that had fallen on Honey Springs enshrouded me as I observed what was going on around me. As a lawyer, I took pride in my uncanny ability to read people and their body language. In fact, I'd aced that class in school. By the way Spencer and Kevin were standing over the body, I could see they were questioning its position. I watched them from afar before I'd had enough. I wanted to talk to Spencer and get some answers to some questions that had popped into my head. How did Aunt Maxie kill her? Why would Aunt Maxie kill her? Did Aunt Maxie have any sort of mud or sediment on her shoes that would show she was at the beach? The beach sand had been brought in by the rock quarry, so there was a distinct difference. I was going to get to the bottom of it. Why am I not surprised you're here? Spencer asked me as his jaw set hard. His thick neck looked to have melted into his deep chest. The spotlights made his deep green eyes look almost black against his sandy blonde hair. This is no time to ask all sorts of questions. How did she die? I asked. It seemed like the most logical question. My eyes drifted around him to the sheet lying on the ground and covering the body. From the bubbles exiting the mouth, it appears it could be poison, but we won't know for sure until the initial autopsy comes back. He gave me a flat look. Is that Maxie your suspect? I asked. Should she be? He shot back. You know I'm telling you no. She had no reason to kill someone, even if it was over a cheese ball of sorts, I said, raising my voice as he tried to speak. Now you and I both know Aunt Maxie is a lot of things, but a killer she is not. If she is a suspect, you know I'm going to be her lawyer. Though I didn't practice law anymore, I did keep my license up to date, and a good thing I did, because at times like this, 
people needed some sound advice. I'm not taking her in, if that's what you're asking. There's not enough evidence. But I did tell her that I was going to need to question her some more. He sucked in a deep breath. I do want to know what you know about her and Loretta. Is Loretta a suspect? I just couldn't imagine that either. From what I understand, Loretta can be hard on her help, and that includes the victim, he said. I know Loretta comes into the coffee house, and I'm guessing Lana does too. No, I've not seen her in there much, and when I have, they seem to be fine. I cautiously answered Spencer, since he was a little more forthcoming than usual. I continued to watch Kevin perform his usual duties. He was crouching near the body, lifting the sheet, taking notes on his clipboard, and repeating those steps a couple of times before he put the clipboard down to retrieve his camera from his bag. The wind skimmed the top of the lake and skittered along my neck. I tucked my hands into my coat pocket and drew in my shoulders, snuggling my elbows into my sides. "'Cut to the chase, Spencer!' I said through my chattering teeth. I watched the corner of his lips spill into a smile. "'You and I both know you're being nice to me and even letting me stay down here. First off, I know you're going to nose into the situation.' So it's better to just let you be and disperse any rumors that'll be floating around in about eight hours, he said. He was right. The Beanhive Coffee House would already be busy with the festival and the vendors, and the parade was downtown tomorrow. When something significant occurred, even a natural death, the locals flocked to the coffee house to congregate with the other town folks and gossip about what had happened. Second... I brought my hands out of my pockets, brought them to my mouth, blew some warmth on them, and rubbed them together vigorously. "'Doesn't Loretta's granddaughter work for you?' he asked. "'Oh, I see.' My chin lifted in the air. The cold air curled around it like the grip of a cold hand. It caught my breath. "'You want me to ask her questions, things she might have seen.' I'll make a deal with you. I'll let my thoughts about Maxine being a killer linger for a few days while you see what you can come up with about Loretta. He shrugged. Maybe you won't come up with anything, but I'm willing to bet you'll do just about anything for Maxine. You're right, I would, but I don't condone murdering anyone. And if you think Aunt Maxie killed someone over a cheese ball then she's right. You should be ashamed of yourself and ask your mama about Loretta's dip. Besides, Aunt Maxie wouldn't put poison in a cheese ball for the whole town to die. It was ridiculous if you ask me, but then again, I was a little too close to the case. But I'll take your offer. I'll keep you posted. Sounds good. He slid his gaze back to Kevin, who appeared to have finished his initial assessment. Both of us watched as Kevin walked up again through the grass between the hotel and the parking lot of the boardwalk, where the hearse was backed up. I'll be in touch. Spencer strutted off. I snarled and headed the other way, which was back to the hotel. Are you okay? Kami asked me when I walked back in. The old hotel's radiator heat immediately warmed my cheeks. I'm fine. My body shivered. I took a few extra steps to look into the hospitality room. Where is Aunt Maxie? I asked, when I noticed she wasn't in there anymore. She said she was going to go to the coffee house to find you. I assumed that's where you went after you hurried out of here. I went down to the scene. I wanted to see where Spencer's head was, and it's all over the place. Say, I took her aside and out of the guest's earshot. I know you said you heard Aunt Maxie and Lana having some words, but did you overhear Loretta and Lana have any confrontation? They were never together. Loretta came down here and asked me if she could host it here, and as you know, I said yes. She had gotten a phone call from Lana because Lana was getting something at the Wild and Whimsy. 
Loretta murmured something under her breath about Beverly, but I don't want to repeat it. Kami was so nice. She never said a bad word about anyone. I understand you don't, but I'm going to do everything I can to make sure Aunt Maxie isn't a suspect. Please let me know if you remember anything. I offered a smile. I'll see you in the morning with coffee. There wasn't any sense hanging around here because Aunt Maxie had left. She was who I needed to get in touch with. My phone buzzed in my coat pocket as I was leaving. It was Patrick. Where are you? Patrick asked. His voice held a little panic. I heard there was a death or something by the lake. Meet me at the bean hive. Oh, I walked down the steps of the hotel and took the sidewalk leading back to the boardwalk. I didn't bother to tell him how I'd gone looking for him because none of that mattered. If you see Aunt Maxie, tell her to come there too. I've not seen her. It was like everyone scattered after one of the sheriff's deputies came into the watershed to let everyone know the appetizer portion of the progressive dinner was canceled. I guess everyone was hungry and went straight to the buzz in and out. You mean the bean hive is still expecting people for coffee afterwards? I was confused. I thought the supper was canceled. Yep, Spencer canceled it, but people are hungry. So we are going to the diner to eat, he said. Then meet me at the diner, I told him, since I knew I had to keep my ears open. A lot of people would be there gossiping about the murder. I didn't know who killed Lana. One thing I knew for sure was that gossip had a wee bit of truth in it somewhere. The hard part was stripping down those tales to get to the facts and then exploring those to find the real details. Can you do me a favor? I asked Patrick. Can you stop by the bean hive and tell Bertie she can go home? Yes, I'll see you in a few. Patrick hesitated as his last word lingered. Roxanne, are you going to be looking into this? I already have. I knew he wasn't huge on my naturally curious side about why people did what they did, but he'd come to embrace that I'd chosen practicing law for a career and it was that type of work that made me feel like I did some real good in the world. I hated to see anyone accused of a crime they didn't commit. The honeycomb salon stood between the wild and whimsy and the buzz in and out. It reminded me how I'd told Alice D. Spicer to give me a call for the first available appointment. Well, now I was looking forward to her call, since gossip would be ablaze on all the tongues of her customers. Just be careful. You know I love you and worry about you. Patrick's voice cracked. I could hear the fear in his tone. You know I will. You also have my word that anything I do find out will go directly to Spencer. It was a promise I had to give Patrick, because I had found myself at the short end of a killer's hand before, certain I was going to die. I gripped the diner's door handle. You don't have to worry. I'd learned my lesson about handing over information when it was just too much for me. I wasn't too prideful and just wanted to help. I know, he whispered. I love you and see you soon. I hoped my words assured him and hung up before I swung the door open into the busy diner. Chapter 8 Where have you been? Aunt Maxie snuggled up to me in the diner booth after I'd walked in and she'd gotten my attention. Loretta Beebe was sitting across from us on the other side of the table. I was a little shocked to see them together. After I saw you in the hospitality room, ouch, my brows furrowed and I reached down to rub my shin where Aunt Maxie stopped me from talking. Did you hear what happened? Loretta leaned over the table. Lana was killed. She fiddled with the various diamond rings on each finger. I was just telling Loretta how awful it is to hear this. Aunt Maxie was up to something. I'm sorry, I said. I can't believe it. She just started, so I didn't know her very well. But she was a sweet girl, very kind, and, well, she just didn't say much. I was telling Maxine how it's hard to find good help these days. 
I should have vetted her credentials better. Loretta's eyes darted about. I reckon it's what you get when you don't go through an agency. What do you mean? I questioned the part about better credentials. You know the old saying. She released a long sigh. Tell me who you run around with and I'll tell you who you are. Did she hang around with bad people? Like murdery people? Was murdery even a word? She was killed, wasn't she? I think someone didn't want her alive, which means she must have done something to somebody. Loretta's lips rolled in, making it appear that she was biting down on them to stop a cry from erupting. I should have mothered her more. Oh, Loretta, Aunt Maxie tisked. You can't save them all. You're already raising Bertie. I know, but this poor girl. I couldn't bear going home into my house, where she helped me get all my appetizers together. Loretta blinked rapidly. Aunt Maxie knocked me under the table with her foot. Ouch! I glared at her. Are you okay? Loretta asked. She's fine. Aunt Maxie pinched a smile, speaking for me. Ain't that right, Roxanne? Mm-hmm. I sucked in a breath and bent down to rub my shin. I wagged my finger between the two. What's going on here? I was so confused that the two of them seemed to be thick as thieves. Welcome to the Buzz in and out Diner. The waitress walked over with an order pad. For tonight's progressive dinner, we're serving James Farley truffle fries. So now that the event is over, we're still offering them. What can I get you to drink? Truffle fries. My mouth watered at the sound. Yes, we want some, Loretta told the young lady. I don't know what I'm going to do about an assistant now that... Loretta's voice cracked, her eyes filling with tears. Now, now, honey... You can't help what happened to Lana. Aunt Maxie reached across the table and patted Loretta's hand. Loretta. My mouth opened slightly when my chin turned to look at her. My eyes narrowed. It was the second time I'd ever, and I mean ever, heard Aunt Maxie say Loretta's name without exaggerating the low in low Loretta. The first was a few minutes ago. What? Aunt Maxie shrugged. We're a community that needs to come together in this hour. Can I get... The young waitress tried to say over Aunt Maxie and Loretta to no avail. I've got to get in touch with her family, Loretta said in her southern accent and sat back in the booth. She reached up and picked at the edges of her short black hair with her long red fingernails. Killed? Whoever heard such... Are you two in cahoots? I asked them and gave the waitress the one second finger. Roxy, me and Lo... <clears throat> she cleared her throat. Loretta have had our differences. But who doesn't? We don't wish death on no one. Aunt Maxie reached across the table to pat Loretta's hand. I'm sorry I switched the appetizers. Loretta continued to bobble her head up and down, agreeing with Aunt Maxie, something I'd never seen before. It's okay, Loretta batted her eyes. We've got to stand united, she added. If we don't do something about this wave of crime, our little town will be ruined. Wave of crime? I tried to digest what Loretta said. Alva, what are you doing? James Farley had hurried over to our table, all sweaty-browed, white buttoned down unbuttoned, and a dingy apron tied around his waist. We're a little busy. It's our fault. I made sure James didn't take it out on the waitress. We were talking between our order. I've been waiting to get their drink order. The young woman had graciously waited for us to stop talking before interrupting us. Just bring us some waters, I suggested. She nodded, took three straws out of the pocket of her apron, and tossed them on the table, and went to the next one. I'm sorry, ladies. James threw his hands in the air. It's hard to get good help these days. 
You're telling me I'm not sure what I'm going to do, Loretta cried out. Did you hear about my poor Lana? Yes, I'm sorry. She was in here the other day. Sweet gal, I'm sorry, Loretta. A huge crash came from the diner's kitchen. I've got to go. Can't anyone do anything around here other than me? Maybe we shouldn't have let James host the main portion. Aunt Maxie took the cup of water from the young waitress. I thought I'd bring y'all some water. She leaned over Aunt Maxie to hand me my plastic glass, which had a chipped edge. Sorry, it was the only cup we have left. It's okay. I rotated it around. I can drink from this side. Or you could use a straw, she suggested. She put the other plastic cup in front of Loretta. I'm sorry to hear about Lana. She was in here talking about the wild and whimsy. Something about the owners thinking she was trying to steal or something. I told her to brush it off. Rich people are funny sometimes. The young girl shrugged. She said she didn't have many friends around here since she was new. I was looking forward to having a friend around here. She gave me a slight grin before frowning again. I can't stay here. Loretta flagged the paper napkin in the air like she was given up. I'm going to have to go home and just crawl in bed. She wrapped the napkin around her finger and used her fingernail to dab the inside of her eye. She sniffled a couple of times before she grabbed her handbag and slid on out of the booth. I'll talk to you two tomorrow. Loretta gave a hard nod. Did I say something? The young waitress's brows dipped. No, I assured her. It's going to take some time, that's all. I'm sorry. She gave a slight shake of her head and hurried away. I waited a good ten seconds before I started in on Aunt Maxie. First off, who are the other two supposed to be meeting us? I asked about the number of people Loretta had told the waitress since she wanted five trays of truffle fries. Secondly, what was with all the Loretta stuff? Aunt Maxie had something up her sleeve. And do you know that Lana stuffed her face with your chipped beef ball before she... I didn't finish my sentence. I just slid my finger across my neck. Hush up or someone in here is going to hear you, she scolded me. I know all about that. Everyone apparently heard you giving Lana what for in the hotel before you know what. I hunkered down a little to look around the diner. I sighed and picked up the glass of water, making sure I didn't drink from the chipped rim. Aunt Maxie leaned in a little. I had to keep Loretta in my sight. Keep your enemies closer. She slowly lifted her chin and slid her gaze down her nose to stare at me. You know that saying. Are you saying that you think Loretta really did... I didn't have to finish the sentence for her to understand what I was asking. Aunt Maxie sat back in the booth, folding her arms over her chest, giving me the side eye, and letting me know she believed Loretta couldn't hurt Lana. Hey, it's crazy out there. Patrick slid in the booth where Loretta had been sitting. What? He looked between Aunt Maxie and me. You two are up to something. We're fine, just fine. Aunt Maxie gave the waitress a smile when the young woman set the small cardboard containers of truffle fries on the table. Thanks, Alva. Patrick took a few fries. You're welcome, Mr. Kane, Alva grinned. My eyes darted between the two. The young girl wore a goofy smile and her cheeks reddened. I see you met my wife, Roxy. He was oblivious to the smitten young girl. Did you ask her? I'm sorry, Alva turned to me. I didn't know this was your wife. Rox, Alva's looking for a part-time job, and I told her you might be in the market for a new part-time hire. He continued to stuff the fries in his mouth. Do you want a Coke, Mr. Kane, with a splash of vanilla? She even knew his favorite fountain soda by heart. You know it. He looked across the table at me. What do you say, Rox? You need some help? Sure. You're more than welcome to come fill out an application, I suggested. Then she walked off. My, oh my, that young lady is gushing all over you. Even Aunt Maxie noticed. 
She had your vanilla Coke all ready for you, Patrick Kane. Yeah, what was that about? I laughed. You two are awful. She's a little girl who waits on me and the guys most days when we come in here. He ignored us. What's on the progressive menu? Sorry, folks, James Farley yelled from the front of the diner. The food is gone. We appreciate you coming. Roxy, I know the supper is technically off, but do you have the whoopie pies to feed these good people? I sure do, I agreed. Come on down. The back of my hand lightly smacked Aunt Maxie on the leg. Get up. Gotta go. I waited for her to scoot out. Are you two coming? We're gonna finish our fries. Patrick and Aunt Maxie were digging into the other three trays of truffle fries. Fine, I don't need your help, I said sarcastically. I can help, Alva said. James doesn't have us clean up, so I can come lend a hand. I know you've not hired me, but I'd love to offer my services for free. Maybe it can be a working interview, Aunt Maxie chimed in, licking her fingers. Sure, why not? I shrugged and zipped my coat. If it's busier than this, we are in trouble. Chapter 9 Busy wasn't even skimming the top of what was going on at the Bean Hive Coffee House after James Farley had shut down the diner. If it weren't for Alva pitching in, I'm not sure Bertie and I would have made it. By the end of the night, all three of us were exhausted. That's a really cool ring. Bertie walked past Alva on her way to the door to flip the sign closed. The lingering town folk had left after they decided they'd waited long enough for any news on Lana's actual cause of death. Thanks, it's an antique. I love it. Alva brought the ring up to her face and used one of her other fingers to move the ring back and forth. Whether the ring had a silver or platinum setting, I couldn't tell, but the large milkstone jewel on top was pretty large. My mom gave it to me. She went back to wiping down all the cafe tables. Sassy and Pepper played with Alva's untied shoestrings trailing behind her. When I couldn't find Patrick after I'd found out about the murder, he'd gone home to check on the dogs. After he talked to me, he just brought them here, since he knew there was a great possibility we'd be here a while. It's a cool ring. I finished refilling all the condiments on the coffee bar, so everything would be ready to go in the morning. No doubt there was anticipation of a big crowd who'd be here to talk about the murder. I don't know, I guess. She shrugged and put a towel on a tray before she walked around to gather all the little cow pitchers, reminding me that Beverly hadn't told me if she was going to see if the barn boxes had any. Do you want me to hand wash these? No, you don't have to stay. Bertie and I've got it. I took the tray from her and gave it to Bertie when she walked back. It was fun working with you. Maybe we can hang out sometimes, Bertie said. She disappeared into the kitchen, where she'd started on the end of the day cleaning tasks. If you're sure. Alva squatted and tied her shoe. Sassy kept jumping up on her arm to chew on her long hair. You're such a cutie. I wish I could have a dog. Come on, Sassy. Patrick clipped Sassy's leash on her while I slipped Pepper's coat on him, since I could tell Patrick was about to go home. Your family doesn't like pets, I asked, and walked her to the door so I could lock the door behind her. My landlord doesn't allow pets, she smiled. I'm older than I look. I'm 25. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. Alva wasn't too much younger than me. That's a great thing. You'll always look young. That's what I hear. I used to come to Lake Honey Springs on vacation, and I decided to come spend the summer here, and now the winter. She stuck her hand out. It was so good to work here. Do you mind if I come back and fill out that application? Yes, and I'll have some money for you for your work tonight. Paying her was the right thing to do. She'd worked really hard, and she was a natural at it. Not too many people could just waltz in and pick up like they'd been here forever. Granted, I had only had her pouring coffee, retrieving items from the display case, and walking around with the tray of whoopie pies for the progressive dinner guests. No, I insisted on being here. It gets lonely at my apartment, and, well, I enjoyed getting to know Bertie. She seemed like a good kid. We shook hands. Thanks, Roxy. I'll be back. 
I'll walk out with you. Patrick and the dogs came over to the door. He kissed me. Don't be too long, and be careful driving home. It's slick out there. The wind whipped in some of the snow that was already built up against the door jam. It's cold out there, huh? I shivered, quickly shutting the door. On my way to the back of the coffee house, I straightened up the chairs and tables. Bertie, we can just leave all this till morning, I said and walked through the kitchen door. I have all the pans and coffee pots cleaned and put away. Bertie was standing over the checklist on the workstation, checking off items as she said them. Anything else? Nope. You doing okay? I asked. I mean, with what happened, I'm sure it's mentally hard. You mean Lana? Bertie walked over to my office, where she kept her purse and coat. I don't know. I feel bad for Grandmama, because I think she really thought this one was going to stick around. So Lana made the cheese balls, not Loretta? I asked to make sure I was getting my facts straight now that the progressive dinner was over and I could spend some brain cells on discerning fact from gossip. Yeah, she begged Grandmama to let her do it because they were discussing how upset Maxie was about it. Grandmama's feelings were hurt, and it was interesting how Lana turned it around and said that she could make the appetizers. She said if they tasted bad, Grandmama could blame it on her, and if they were great, then Grandmama could take credit. Bertie snickered. Grandmama was all over that. Were you there after they finished making them? I asked and ignored the puppy crying from the other side of the swinging door. Yeah, it was during supper last night. Bertie sighed and buttoned her coat, pulled her knit cap down over her ears, and slipped her hands in her mittens. Then what did they do? I asked. That's when Lana left for the night with the appetizers. She was going to take them to the hotel on her way home so Grandmama could go to the antique shop and get that platter. Bertie was all bundled up and ready to tackle the cold on the way to her car. That was interesting. Loretta had had no time to slip in any sort of poison or whatever killed Lana because, according to Bertie, Lana was there and she took the food to the hotel. She wouldn't kill herself. I'm leaving. I'll see you tomorrow afternoon. I'll walk you out. I followed her out of the kitchen. Bertie was talking, but my mind was full of questions about how I could find out who had access to the food at the hotel. I knew Kami didn't have security cameras, and her staff had been there for a long time. Unless she had someone new working there? You know? asked Bertie. Obviously, she'd asked me a question that I didn't even hear around my talk in mind. Yeah, I nodded and smiled, waving her off. Toot and let me know you're in your car. I watched Bertie walk down the boardwalk toward the parking lot on the side of the watershed. For some reason, I didn't feel like the killer was going to strike again. It seemed like Lana was the target, and I was going to focus on that. Lana and her history. It was going to be a good starting point. Did she stop before she went to the hotel? Did she get any phone calls? Was she on social media? Chapter 10 Good morning, Bunny called out. The ding over the coffee house door told me someone was there, though it had taken a few seconds to register. Last night felt like a blur. Add to that a sleepless night because I was up thinking about who on earth had a motive to kill poor Lana. I had been around her for only a little while, but I was having a hard time trying to imagine what she could possibly do to make someone so mad that they murdered her. All of that was on my mind, and based on the history of what happened around here when someone died, the coffee house was going to be busy. It was going to be a long day. I peeked out the swinging door and saw Bunny and Maybelle. You back here, Roxy? Bunny and Maybelle Donovan were walking through the bean hive. Maybelle, here. She put her hand out. Give me your coat. Maybelle and Bunny were my first real customers at the bean hive when I opened. They were considered regulars. They came in at the same time every day, sat at the same table, and ordered the same thing. And... They looked alike, they dressed alike, 
and they like to eat the same things. One day I was so busy, Bunny got tired of waiting for me to top off her coffee, so she got up, topped off hers, and everyone else's. That was when she hired herself. Mm-hmm, she hired herself, and I just went with it. I'm here. I walked out of the kitchen and watched the two fumble with their buttons, hats, and pocketbooks before they got all situated. You're here really early. I was just coming in to help, honey. I figured we're going to have a big crowd today, seeing what happened and all. Bunny pointed at a table off to the side for Maybell to sit in. Then Bunny sat down with her. I kind of snickered because I knew she was here to listen to all the hearsay. Maybell, on the other hand, was in charge of the prayer chain, which was what we called gossip around here. Unfortunately, they believed that when you gossiped on the prayer chain, it counted as praying for the people you were gossiping about. Now, if they were talking about it while not discussing it on the prayer chain call, it was considered gossip. See the difference? You're right. We're going to be busy, and I didn't get a wink of sleep. So you two are in for a very special treat this morning. The coffee pots had all brewed, so I knew the special Christmas blend I'd roasted and ground this morning would be a tasty treat. Do you got some of that good breakfast casserole? Maybelle asked. That's not my treat, but I bet I can get you a slice. The walk-in freezer contained so many different casseroles I could easily pop into the oven for special occasions or even when I ran out of something else. During the winter months, when the bean hive was closed on Sundays, I made as many things as possible that could be frozen for a long time without compromising the taste, smell, and look. Where's the puppy? Bunny shifted in her chair when I brought over the coffee pot and two mugs. You didn't notice she was gone last night when we came back from the diner? I poured the fresh brew in their cups. Maybelle picked up the cup, curled both hands around it, and took a nice, long smell. It's the Christmas blend. My favorite. Gingerly, she took a sip, as if trying not to burn her mouth. I'll take four bags. She put in her order, which wouldn't be hard to fill, since I'd roasted a large batch. I'll make sure Bertie holds you back a few bags, I smiled. The puppy was adopted last minute before all of the hullabaloo. Can I also get me a little quiche? Maybelle sure was hungry this morning. I'll get that for you. The casserole might be a minute. The fire needed to be stoked a little before I went into the kitchen. There, I found a casserole in the freezer, slipped it into the oven, and set the timer. Timers were so important at the bean hive. Many times, I'd gotten caught up in conversation with a customer and completely forgotten I'd put something in the oven, but the timer always saved me. Did I hear the door ding? I carried out the tray of quiche I'd already plated and walked backwards out of the kitchen door. Spencer! I was taken back when Sheriff Spencer Shepard stood inside the coffee house. Morning, ladies. Spencer took off his cowboy hat and stuck it up under the arm of his heavy brown sheriff's coat. He had a deputy with him. Can I get you two some amazing coffee and interest you in a Danish? I pointed at the display case where I'd already stocked the pastry side. Fresh apricot Danish this morning. I got the jam from Jean Hill's farm. Everyone in Honey Springs knew Jean Hill made the best jam. My nerves had jittered through my body at the mere sight of him being here this early. I just started babbling off all those questions. I'll take a coffee. He looked at the deputy. The deputy nodded. Spencer held up two fingers. I really came in here to see if Maxine Bloom was here. No, I gulped and turned around to make his coffee. Why? Then I spun around with their two cups of coffee, to go, with a fake smile on my face. I'm assuming she's at home in bed. I set the cups on the counter so my shaking hands didn't show. No, I went to her house and she didn't answer. He picked up his coffee and the deputy picked up the other. I was hoping you'd know. I've not seen her since last night. My eyes popped open. As a matter of fact, 
I hurried around the counter and grabbed my coat. I didn't even call her last night to see if she made it home safely. The pounding thundered in my chest as I thought of her car lying in a ditch between here and downtown because of the slick roads last night. I've got to go look for her car. I shoved my arms in my coat. Her car was home. Spencer did make the urgency subside. A little. She didn't answer? I asked. He shook his head. Maybe she was still asleep. Nope. We walked around the house and looked into the windows, thinking she was hiding, and I didn't see anyone there. Bed was made, too. You obviously really want to talk to her, or you wouldn't have snooped in her windows. I tried to ignore Bunny and Maybelle, who had both moved to a closer table. This is very important. I mean, I know I asked you yesterday to keep your eyes and your ears open, but... This is sheriff's business. He took a sip of the coffee and did that whole waiting me out thing he liked to do. Waiting someone out was a classic move that was actually taught in law school. This technique was part of the art of reading body language. And right now, Spencer was trying to give me some open space to just start blabbing, since the silence was uncomfortable. No way was I going to give in to that tactic, I'd bite my tongue off first. I understand that, Spencer, but does this have anything to do with Lana's murder? He sighed, took a drink, and continued staring over the rim of the cup, the steam curling around his nose and up in the air. I'm gonna shoot straight with you, Roxanne. He lifted a brow. Roxanne? My head jerked back. That's awfully formal. This doesn't look good for Maxie. I have eyewitnesses that say Maxine was in the hospitality room right before Lana came in. I have witnesses who say that she and Lana had a discussion, a heated discussion, at the Wild and Whimsy Antique. The way he told all the witness accounts, the situation got worse and worse. So much so, I closed my eyes just to hear the rest. I hate to tell you this, but I also have eyewitnesses who said your Aunt Maxie and Loretta had words at the Buzz in and out Diner after Maxine found out Loretta was going to host the appetizer portion of the progressive dinner. This was news to me. I wondered when that was and how their confrontation fit in with the timeline of the murder. Aunt Maxie and Loretta have words practically every day, Just because they had a frank discussion doesn't mean Aunt Maxie killed Lana. Besides, we don't even know how she was killed. I tisked in hopes of covering up the negative thoughts in my head so they didn't show on my face. Come, Spencer, we all know that. He put his hand up, then pulled out his phone. Spencer tapped the phone a few times, then turned the screen for me to see. Do you recognize this? It was that platter that Aunt Maxie was so proud of. The fancy one with the Christmas trees and the scalloped edges on it. Yes, I recognize it. Can you tell me who that belongs to? He asked with full knowledge of its owner. Well, I think you and I both know that it belongs to Aunt Maxie. This little cat and mouse game was very interesting to Bunny and Maybell. So much so... They'd gotten up out of their seats, took the reading glasses dangling from around their necks, and glanced over Spencer's shoulders to get a gander at the photos. Spencer looked over his shoulders, giving them the stink eye. They shuffled away to their table. We took all the platters from the Cocoon Hotel with the cheese balls on them. We ran preliminary tests to determine if they were tampered with. He continued to swipe the screen quickly, showing photo after photo of what I recognized as Aunt Maxie's cheese balls. Tampered with? I snorted. Poison. He held his other hand out to the deputy. There was some poison found on the rim of the platter you identified as Maxine's. Poison? I questioned. Methanol, to be exact. The deputy handed him some papers. Here is Kevin's autopsy report 
where he got a methanol reading as soon as he swiped the inside of her mouth. Today will determine the state of Lana's kidneys, eyes. I interrupted him when I noticed Bunny and Maybelle's expressions. Yeah, I know what methanol does to the body. I thought those words, but didn't say them out loud. There was no need to let Bunny and Maybelle know methanol was highly poisonous and literally turned into formaldehyde, ruining the liver, eyesight, kidneys, heart, and other parts of the body, causing death. I'm going to have to bring in Maxine to question her about it, and we will be getting a warrant to search her properties. Properties? I asked for clarification. All of the shops she owns, all the rentals, her home, everything and anywhere she could be hiding something. By the way Spencer was talking, he had Aunt Maxie as good as locked up. I started laughing in place of crying and rolled my eyes. You and I both know she doesn't have a malicious bone in her body. The deputy walked away when his phone buzzed. Spencer pulled out his handy-dandy notebook from the pocket of his jacket. Witness statement number one, and I quote them, overhearing Maxine say to Loretta, You ain't gonna ruin me. I'll ruin you first. He didn't even bother glancing up to see my reaction as he read the next one. Next witness statement, and I quote, Maxine saying to Loretta, Just because you think you can throw your weight around the beautification committee doesn't mean you can throw your weight around my event. You better step out of my way or else you'll pay. He flipped the page. For a split second, I wanted to reach out, rip the notebook out of his hands, and run over to the fireplace so I could throw it in. Next witness account, he continued. Okay, I butted in. I get it. So she was angry, I said, and turned around so he couldn't see my face while I pretended to prepare some things for the overly busy coffee house in my hands. I didn't want him to see them shaking. You honestly think that Aunt Maxie put a smidgen of poison in the cheese ball in hopes that Lana would take a bite of that one, I asked, or kill anyone? I don't know if she was trying to kill Lana or Loretta. I could feel a butt coming on. But Lana died. So whether or not she meant to kill someone or just make someone sick doesn't matter at this point. We have a murder on our hands and I'm following all leads and evidence. I could count the few times I'd been without words. On one hand, in fact... This was one of those times. I've been privy to information that Maxine had come up here and stored her food in your refrigerator. I'm guessing she couldn't figure out a way to get Loretta out of making the appetizers, so she came up with this crazy plan to switch them. Good guess, I muttered, pulling my lips in to stop talking. His brows rose. I've also got a witness who saw her leave the watershed come here, and leave here with the platter and a bag in her hands. He flipped a page from his notepad, where she walked into the Cocoon Hotel, and they also reported seeing you there, too. I gulped and was about to break under pressure to tell him the truth. Sheriff, the deputy called while walking back over with the phone in his hand. It's the warrant from the judge. Spencer took the phone from his deputy His finger slowly swiped up the phone screen. His eyes darted back and forth as he read the text. Roxanne Bloom, we are going to search the Beanhive Coffee House now. He flipped the phone screen around. I'm going to need a copy of that before you do. Just then, my phone dinged. One step ahead of you. He smiled, knowing the text just hit my phone. I raised a finger and dragged my phone out of my pocket, checking the file he'd sent. It was a warrant for the beehive. Fine, look around. You aren't going to find anything. I shrugged. Spencer didn't bother acknowledging me. He and the deputy headed straight to the kitchen. This is good. Bunny's voice cracked, her usual born-to-worry look on her face. 
It's fine, I assured her before Spencer came back out. See? Nothing. Not nothing. He shook his head. There's just too many little spaces for us to look through, and from what I recall, you open at 6 a.m. He pulled his sleeve up and looked at his watch. I'm not going to let you open this morning until the search is complete. Ooh, I couldn't find the words. I blurted, You're kidding me, right? You want me to close down my coffee house so you can search to see if I have poison here? I knew good and well there was no way on earth my coffee house had methanol in it. Plus, it is the busiest time for the winter season. My mind was going faster than my mouth. You and I both know that search warrant is going to take hours. So you're shutting me down when you know that our community depends solely on our small businesses and any sales during the winter are so crucial to what is going to carry us through these brutal months. I'm sorry, Roxy. I know you need every possible sale you can get, but I'm shutting you down until we are finished searching the premises. I shook my head and stormed out of the way near the fireplace where Pepper was still sleeping on his bed. He'd not been bothered one bit. Roxy, this is not personal. Spencer was busy opening the coffee bar's cabinet drawer, shuffling through various things I needed to refill the area. There is a young lady that's dead. Do you understand? Oh, I understand that you are wasting your time and mine while there's a killer on the loose. I gestured to the outside. Out there, right here at Christmas, and you're going to look like you don't know what you're talking about. I just couldn't stop my mouth. The more I paced back and forth between the front window and the fireplace, the angrier I got, especially when I continued to hear customers tug on the door and couldn't get in because Spencer locked it. And if I'm correct, isn't an election year coming up, so you better watch it? Aunt Maxie has been a huge supporter of yours, and trust me, when all of this is solved and you're standing there with a different killer in cuffs, you're going to wish this day never happened. The sound of clapping from my backup, Maybell, came from the opposite side of the coffee house. Thank you, Maybell. She gave me some encouragement. I tugged down the edges of the apron before shoving my hand in its pockets. Sheriff, there was a... The deputy poked his head out of the kitchen door. He had on a pair of gloves and held something up in the air. I think we found the poison. It was a bottle of liquid with a label that read methanol in red. It was beginning to look a lot like a nightmare, not Christmas. Chapter 11 What do you mean you're at the sheriff's department? Patrick asked. Listen, Patrick. Frustration built up inside of me. I get one phone call. One phone call. You are my one phone call. I need you to come down here and throw some weight around to get me out. I had no time to explain what had happened. I need you to come down here. It was still really early, and I knew he had to be in bed. Patrick, get out of bed and come down here. Spencer sat across the table from me with a stern look. I hung up the phone and gave it back to him. So, you want to tell me how the poison got into the shop? Spencer asked me like it was just everyday conversation. I have no idea. I shrugged, shook my head, and threw my hands in the air. Then let's start with why you left the watershed. He pulled out his notebook. Again. I glared. He clicked at the end of the pen, put it to the paper, and looked back up at me. I need to go to the bathroom, I said in a flat voice. His face softened. What? I own a coffee house. I've been drinking coffee since four this morning. Small bladder. Go. He sighed, not bothering to tell me where to go, since I knew my way around the department from previous visits. To say that I took my sweet time and actually did sing the alphabet song while I washed my hands 
was an understatement. I even remembered the words to the song from high school Spanish class, so I also sang it in two languages. Roxy, come on out. You've had plenty of time in there, Spencer said to me from the other side of the door. I glanced at my reflection in the mirror and thought that this was turning out to be a nightmare I'd never imagined when I woke up this morning. Aunt Maxie, where are you? I whispered to myself before I pulled the door open. All done. Stop right there, a familiar voice boomed out. Roxanne, do not say another word. Kirk appeared, swiftly crossing the department with his business card in between his middle and forefinger. I'm Roxanne's lawyer, Kirk. Yeah, I know who you are. Spencer took the card. The ambulance chaser. The what? My jaw dropped and my head twisted, chin down to look at Kirk. Semantics. Kirk brushed it off. Is Roxanne under arrest? No, Spencer said. Get your things. Let's go, Kirk instructed me. She needs to answer some questions, or I'll hold her as long as the law will let me. Spencer, Kirk, and I all knew he could keep me here for at least 24 hours. What types of questions? Kirk put his hand up to my face when I was about to say that I would answer questions if it meant that I could leave. Spencer wanted to know my whereabouts and why I left the watershed. I don't know where Aunt Maxie is and what you want from me, Spencer. I honestly didn't know for sure where she was, but I had an idea. I want the truth, Roxy. The truth will set you free. Really? You couldn't come up with anything better than that? Kirk snorted. I rolled my eyes. I looked at him with a straight face and sat there fiddling my tongue along the edges of my teeth. Fine, I'll tell you what I did. I looked at Kirk. He knew that look, the one indicating he knew I was serious and needed to tell Spencer. Kirk would intervene if needed. Yes, Aunt Maxie was upset. She didn't ask Loretta to be part of the progressive dinner, because Loretta doesn't care two hoots and a holler about Pet Palace. Without having to say it out loud, Spencer knew the proceeds of the progressive dinner tickets went to the Pet Palace. The only thing that Loretta wanted was to have her name somewhere on it, so after Babette Cliff broke her ankle, Loretta seized the opportunity to take Babette's place. As soon as I got out of here, I would put a call in to Babette Cliff, or better yet, go see her. Go on, I'm listening. Spencer tapped his pen on the pad of paper. Aunt Maxie came up with this grand scheme that she would just switch them. She wasn't even going to let anybody know. I was a little nervous about it. The more I thought about it, the more I wanted to tell her not to do it. I left the watershed and found her at the Cocoon Hotel. My eyes popped open. As a matter of fact, I had a taste of Aunt Maxie's chipped beef ball on that exact platter. She gave me a sample, and I'm alive. I'd completely forgotten about that. See, she didn't poison anything. I sat up on the edge of my seat and smiled. Then I wondered who on earth had told Spencer all of mine and Aunt Maxie's whereabouts. I saw Bertie and the lady who adopted the puppy. Then there was Louise Carlton. Surely Louise and Bertie didn't talk to Spencer. Did Bertie go home and tell Loretta everything that happened that night, after which Loretta called Spencer? Roxy. Kirk touched my back. As a natural reaction, I jerked. Where did you just float off to? He laughed nervously. I was saying I went to the hotel in hopes that Aunt Maxie didn't switch the cheese balls. But by the time I got down there, it was too late. She had. Do you know what she did with them? He asked. She threw them in her bag. The words caught them off guard. Yeah, she did. She took her cheese balls out of the plastic wrap, set them on the platters, and wrapped Loretta's up in the wrap before putting them in her bag. What did she do with them once she left the hotel? I have no idea. Did you see Lana? He asked. Yeah, she and Loretta were standing right there, talking about what was why this, that, and the other, 
and someone mentioned to Loretta that the chipped beef ball was delicious. Loretta looked like she had sucked the pickle and said, Where is it? Because she knew that she had not made a chipped beef cheese ball. I was beginning to realize there was no way I could get Aunt Maxie out of this mess without her here. I didn't see Lana there. I looked at Kirk. Lana wasn't at the Cocoon Hotel with Loretta. Where was she? Spencer asked. I guess she was at the beach, meeting someone down there. I knew it wasn't what he wanted to hear. I was with Aunt Maxie from the time I left the watershed until we found out Lana was dead. I saw Lana and Loretta leave the watershed before I did. Even though I knew I didn't have Aunt Maxie's or Lana's timeline down, or the grounds to dismiss Loretta's whereabouts, I knew I gave Spencer more and more doubt about his number one suspect, Aunt Maxie. Clearly, you can see my client has been cooperating, and now we are leaving. Kirk touched my arm. Let's go, Roxanne. I got up. Roxanne, isn't that a little formal for you two? Spencer asked with a smirk. She only lets her friends call her Roxy. Kirk used my own line on me. Kirk held the back of my chair and helped me get up. Neither of us said goodbye to Spencer or dilly-dallied on our way out of the department. "'What on earth are you doing here?' I asked through gritted teeth once we were outside and walking to the car. "'Somebody had to come get you out of here. Your husband is smart enough to know I was in town and you needed help.' I wanted to smack that smile right off his face. "'Roxy, come on.' Kirk opened the car door for me. Bygones be bygones. What is it going to take for you to forget the past and move on? Leave town. My town. The town I could never get you to come visit when we were... I couldn't even bring myself to say it. I reached for the door handle and slammed the door shut. He walked around the front of the car, shaking his head the entire way. I'm not going to be able to do that quite yet. He put his keys in the ignition and turned the engine over. I got a little business to take care of. Besides my wife. That lingered. Your what? I gripped the handle of the door. My wife. She got a new dog, and she loves it here. So now she wants us to buy a cabin. He focused on the road back toward the bean hive. Does your mom have anything for sale? I glared at him. You're married? I blinked with disbelief. I had no idea. Yeah, Roxy, if you would pay attention. He held his hand up, showing the rubber-looking black ring on his ring finger. When I come into the coffee shop, I have my ring on. The jab to me was that I could never get him to wear a ring when we were married. That didn't matter now. I was thankful we were separated because I wouldn't have moved back to Honey Springs and found Patrick. Let's go back to your wife. Your wife got a puppy. It had to be the woman who'd come into the coffee house last night. She got the puppy from the adoption program at the Bean Hive. Was she the witness Spencer was talking about who saw me at the coffee house? She's sorry. He said it like I was supposed to forget all about it. This day could not get any worse, I yelled out loud. Well, it could if Spencer booked you for helping your aunt kill that poor girl. Honestly, Kirk, do you think Aunt Maxie would kill anyone? I knew the question was loaded for him, but I had to bide time somehow until he got me back to the parking lot where I needed to get my car. Did you forget how she left me out in snow this deep? He made a gesture with his hands. When I came here with you and told me I could freeze to death? Kirk had obviously kept a running list. And she wouldn't care if the next time she saw me was at my funeral, he recalled. Don't forget the toast she gave at our wedding. Okay, I don't need to rehash all of that. He'd made his point. Patrick seems to think I can help you. You might want to listen to him. This was the one thing that made me listen. Fine, I will listen to Patrick, I said, my little dig getting a look from Kirk. The rest of the ride was silent. 
my mind stewed on so many things that I knew I had to find Aunt Maxie first, even though I really wanted to call Babette Cliff. Don't go back in the coffee house. The sheriff still has it closed, and I'll let you know when he releases it. Kirk pulled up next to my car. What about Pepper? I asked. Patrick came down and got him from Bunny. Kirk shifted the car in park. And Roxy, if you find Maxine, please have her call me. Or at least call a lawyer. Oh, I will, I thought. I'm a lawyer. Or did you forget? Chapter 12 My phone had several texts and missed calls from Patrick. Instead of calling him back as soon as I got the notices, I knew I would need some time to process what was going on with Aunt Maxie, Lana's murder, and Patrick calling Kirk. To say I was surprised he wasn't home when I got there was an understatement. In fact, I expected him to be there waiting for me to get home from the clink. The two rocking chairs my grandfather had made were a perfect addition to the cabin, and I loved decorating the porch for each season. Before I opened the cabin door, I rearranged the cute snowflake pillows in the rocker's seats. I also refolded the buffalo-checked blankets over the top rung of the deep brown ladder-back-style rockers. The babies were scratching at the door. "'You're always here for Mommy,' I said in baby dog talk to Sassy and Pepper. Both danced eagerly on the other side to greet me. "'Let's go potty!' They darted off the front porch, and I headed inside, where the warm glow of the fire illuminated the small window of the wood-burning stove. The Christmas tree lights were on, and the radio was tuned to the local station that had played around-the-clock Christmas music since the week of Thanksgiving. Some people minded it, but I didn't. I loved anything that made my feelings of joy and happiness bubble up over the feelings that didn't serve me. I started walking to the kitchen to retrieve a kettle of water, which I wanted to put on the wood burner so I could make some strong cowboy coffee. On my way, I glanced out the window to make sure Sassy and Pepper were doing okay. They were sniffing the snow and didn't seem to want to come inside. I grabbed the kettle, filled it, and brought it over to the stove, where I set the kettle on top to boil. While I waited for the water to finish boiling and the dogs to come inside, I got a notepad and pen and a cup of coffee ready. The kettle screamed just as I was getting the dogs inside. That way, I could get the coffee and a blanket and snuggle up on the couch while I drank the coffee so I could get all my thoughts on paper. At least, it sounded like a great plan. Patrick waltzed through the door. There you are. He hurried over and kneeled in front of me. I went to the department and they said you'd already left. Kirk came to my rescue, I said in a flat voice, and took a drink from my mug. You're mad. I can see you're mad. Patrick eased up and sat on the edge of the couch next to me and in front of Pepper. I did what you asked me to do. No, no, you didn't. I asked you to come get me, not to send my ex-husband. It was clearly not the right decision, but what was done was done, and I knew I couldn't change it. Maybe I didn't make myself clear when I said you. Roxy, what was I going to do? Have a fist fight with Spencer and throw you over my shoulder and take you out of there? No, I needed a lawyer, and trust me when I say Kirk was the last one on my list. Patrick made me smile. I'm sorry. I should have known you tried everyone. But do you know how humiliating it is for me to let him help me? I asked and looked away. You care about what others think? Patrick looked surprised. I don't. I wanted you out of there so you could get to Maxine and figure out what happened and open the coffee house. I don't know where she is. I sighed and patted Pepper as he got up to move, since Patrick had inched back a little. I'm sorry I got upset about Kirk. He was just a topper to a bad day so far. Patrick put his arm around and snuggled me tight. I told him what had happened as I sipped on my coffee. She's in a cabin, he told me about Aunt Maxie, with Penny. Wait, 
I pushed out of his embrace and curled a leg up under me, sitting a little taller, with my hand wrapped around my mug. How do you know where she is? Penny called me. She said Maxie left her phone at Maxie's house because she didn't want the sheriff to track her. He reached out and put his hands on my legs. Get your coat. I'll take you there. You two stay here, I told the pups, dancing at the door to go with us. We'll be back soon. They don't care. Patrick flipped them a treat from his coat pocket. We kept treats all over us, our cars, the house, everywhere we could. You okay? Patrick asked when he noticed I'd stopped chatting. Yeah, my stomach has been funny. I didn't tell him that I'd eaten one of Loretta's crackers, because Aunt Maxie had shoved it in my mouth before she had me taste hers. Now that I knew Lana was poisoned, I felt a wee bit of fear that maybe my little cracker had a little residue of poison on it, which was what made me queasy. Let's put on some Christmas music. Patrick flipped on the radio when we pulled out of the driveway, going toward downtown. Under normal circumstances, I'd really be enjoying this snow squall and music. I sighed and watched the snow not only start again, but fall all around in huge, heavy flakes. The roads were getting slick again, so I'm going to drive pretty slow. Patrick had both hands on the wheel. I hummed along to the radio and let him concentrate. Though my mouth beat to the music, my mind was focused on what I was going to say to Aunt Maxie when I saw her. We made our way into downtown Honey Springs, which was only a five-minute drive on a non-snowy day and a ten-minute drive today. Downtown was a gorgeous small town. Central Park was smack dab in the middle of it. Around it was a sidewalk, and different sidewalks led to the middle of the park, where a big white gazebo stood. Most of Honey Springs' small town festivals were held in the park, and I couldn't wait for spring to come back because I missed going to the farmer's market. Today, Central Park was lined with Christmas trees. Each one had a different colored strand of lights, and the line to visit Santa Claus, who was sitting in the gazebo, was all the way out of the park and around the sidewalk. The smiles and cheer on the people's faces made me realize not everyone was aware of or as engrossed in Lana's murder as I was. You okay? Patrick broke the silence. Yes. I stared at the dim carriage lights dotting all the downtown sidewalks. They glowed through the snowfall and made a gorgeous picture. It was almost as pretty as the vivid memory of the colorful flowers and daffodils that I knew were hiding underneath the snow and would pop up soon to let us know spring was coming. The courthouse was in the middle of Main Street with a beautiful view of the park. There was a medical building where the dentist, optometrist, podiatrist, and good old-fashioned medical doctors were located. And the theater was near the library, which was across from the bank where Emily's dad was president. Even the old theater looked great. It was a typical small-town theater with exposed light bulbs going all the way around the marquee, which was lit up atop the building. The place had double doors and a small glass cashier window where a member of the theater committee would sit and sell tickets for the show. The theater company did four shows a year, and those coincided with the seasons. Since we were still in the winter season, the winter show was called The Night Before Presents, a funnier skit on the real Christmas story. I wanted to go see that with Mom and Aunt Maxie, I said as we passed. And you will. Let's just get through one day at a time. He was trying to be uplifting, but one day at a time would lead us right up to Christmas, which was only a few days away. Do you think she did it? He asked. My face said it all. I was just asking. Of course I don't. There's a but coming. He knew me all too well. There's a lot of eyewitnesses that saw and heard Aunt Maxie arguing with Lana and Loretta, which, as you know, makes it seem like she's guilty. A lot of angry chatter. I didn't need to tell him what was being said because I knew he could imagine. Then there's the whole finding the methanol bottle at the coffee house. Do you have any idea how it got there? 
he asked. Good question. No. The only people with keys to the coffee house are me, Aunt Maxie, Bunny, you, and Birdie. All the people I loved and trusted. Only one of them is being accused of murder and had access to hide the bottle there. Which brings me back to this. Do you think Aunt Maxie did it? Why would you ask me again? I was a little fit to be tied with his questioning. All the evidence points to it. He shrugged and turned left on Crescent Peck Road. Isn't this the same street the old Seifert barn is on? I asked. Yeah. Why? He pointed out the windshield. It's right over the ridge. You'll see that old barn coming up. I was hoping to ask the tea gardens if I could purchase the old barn wood. You wouldn't believe how many people ask me to use reclaimed barn wood as an accent wall. Can we pull in here? I asked, watching the side of the road as we drove over the ridge where the old barn came into focus. I guess we can. What's with the old barn? he asked. I don't know. I just know Aunt Maxie had gotten the platter the sheriff is holding for evidence from the tea gardens, who bought the contents of the barn from the bank. I held on when he turned down the gravel road. The gravel was a little icier than the road. I'm not following. He geared the truck down so it had gripped the gravel better. It could be a long shot, but when I was looking around for Aunt Maxie at the watershed, I overheard a couple of people saying they'd heard someone was living in the old barn. If that's the case, maybe someone was upset with Aunt Maxie or Loretta for taking the china, or even the tea gardens for buying the contents of the barn. The idea sounded silly now that I said it out loud. Then there's the whole ghost thing. Like the ghost of Christmas past? He snorted, and when I didn't reciprocate, he glanced at me. You're kidding, right? I don't kid about murder, especially when someone I love is the number one suspect. When he put the truck in park, I flung the door open. There was a no trespassing sign on the barn, which had seen much better days. Patrick led the way and slipped between two broken planks with his handy flashlight clicked on. It looks pretty stable in here. He shot the flashlight around and shined it on the ceiling beams. It doesn't look like anything is left. The light darted around. A twinkle of something shiny cut the darkness. Patrick pointed the light toward it. Oh, man. He found delight in what was sparkling. I'd love to have that. We walked over, and he used the flashlight to expose a creepy-looking clown sign that read, Let the magic begin. No, we do not want that. I stated and wagged my finger at it. That's weird. No, it's great. You know the old theater downtown? Well, when I was a kid, the Seiferts did their magic show there. I loved them. Magical, I whispered. That's what those two people were joking about when they mentioned a ghost and something being magical. Probably. He ran his hand along the sign, getting the loose dirt off. It's a bit creepy now that I look at it, but it was so much a part of our lives here before the boardwalk became a big deal. Didn't you ever go to one of their shows when you visited with your dad? No, I don't think so, or not that I remember. I shook my head. Even at those fancy Christmas parties, Mr. Seifert would do a Christmas magic show from what I'd heard. He turned the light around and fluttered it all over the barn's interior. It doesn't look to me like anyone living here. Probably not now. So I guess my theory about someone mad at Aunt Maxie and Loretta for the china was way off. I knew I was reaching for any reason why someone would kill Lana and, in my opinion, blackmail either Loretta or Aunt Maxie. Chapter 13 Not only did Mom have Aunt Maxie in the secluded cabin but Loretta Beebe, of all people, was also with them. What do you mean Kirk got you out of prison? Aunt Maxie's disapproval showed in the full range of emotion scrolling over her face. First it was shock, then it was anger, then it went back to surprise. What was I supposed to do? Patrick asked. He walked over to the kitchen counter, 
where the cabin's coffee pot dinged finished. He took a few mugs off of the hooks that hung on the wall. Patrick ran each one under the water faucet before he started to pour each of us a cup and put it on the table. She needed a lawyer other than herself, and he just popped into my head. He got me sprung. I shrugged, knowing time spent on Kirk wasn't going to get us anywhere. After what all he did to you, he better help you out. Mom was the one person in my life who was close to Kirk when we'd gotten married. And when I announced we were getting a divorce, she wanted me to forgive and forget. Oh, I've forgiven him now, but the forgetting was a little hard to do. Forget about him. I waved off the conversation. I'm here because you really do need to turn yourself in to the department for questioning. I will do no such thing. Aunt Maxie's reaction made the already tense situation rise an octave. You running off and hiding like this doesn't look good. I reached over and held her hand in mine. Do you think I'm going to let him keep you? I think he'd try. She drew her hand out from underneath mine and laid them in her lap. I think we can make a plan. Here is what I know. I fiddled with the handle of the mug. Lana was poisoned with methanol. Mom, Loretta, and Aunt Maxie gasped. Oh, dear me! Loretta cried out and put her face in her hands. Who would do such a thing? Her fingers parted, her eyeball between them as she looked at Aunt Maxie. You better cover up that eyeball before I poke it, Aunt Maxie snarled. I didn't do anything to her. Where on earth would I find methanol? When Spencer searched the beanhive, I could tell by their reactions they didn't know that bit of information either. Yes, they served me a search warrant and ended up finding a bottle of methanol in the kitchen. That means whoever killed Lana was planting evidence. Mom was always pretty good at solving the murders I had to try while I was in college as an assistant. She lived for when I came home to visit and could get me to talk about the cases. Right, and I have a solid alibi, but Aunt Maxie's story has some holes that Spencer would like filled in, because apparently Aunt Maxie and Lana, I moved my head to face Loretta, and Loretta had some words between them. They were just words, not poison. Loretta gave Aunt Maxie a solid Baptist nod, the kind that told us she had Aunt Maxie's back. I see you two are still sticking with the truce you made last night. That's good. They both agreed. So if I can get some good information to look into, I think we can go see Spencer and you can give your statement. He won't be able to keep you on circumstantial evidence. Technically, all of that wasn't true. But things would be a lot worse for her if I let her stay hidden. And now my mom was involved. Loretta could get in trouble too, just for being here. Aunt Maxie, we're going to need to establish your timeline. I took out the pad of paper mom had given me and a pen so I could keep notes. Thank you. I smiled because it felt like old times when I lived at home during college. What do you need to know? She was agreeable. I did make the cheese balls because Loretta, and don't take this the wrong way, she warned Loretta, but you don't make the best appetizers. That's why I had Lana do it. I couldn't believe my ears or that Loretta actually told the truth about it, even if there was a pending murder charge. You did? Aunt Maxie's mouth flew open. Yes. Lana said she'd keep it a secret. Loretta sighed. Her brows pinched as though she were regretting her decision to come clean. I didn't dare tell Loretta that Bertie had already told me about Lana making the appetizers. It was something that I didn't need to be mentioned. We all know that she didn't poison herself, so it all comes down to what Lana did that day and what she ate. I clicked the top of the pen to make the point appear. Loretta, 
Can you tell me what happened that day? Beverly Teagarden had called me the night before to let me know she'd picked up some of the boxes from the old Seifert place. She already agreed to sell me the Christmas set. That's when I showed up at the Beanhive the next morning. Beverly hadn't gotten to the wild and whimsy like she said she would. I wrote down her words exactly, though I already knew about it since I'd talked to her and Lana that morning. After we left you, we went back down to the wild and whimsy, and Beverly still wasn't there. That's not like her, Aunt Maxie noted with furrowed brows. I know it's not. So, instead of leaving, I figured she'd gotten stuck in the snow or something. There was no sense in driving home just to come right back out. So Lena and I went to the Buzz In and Out Diner for some breakfast. Loretta didn't do anything so unusual. From there, we went to Wild and Whimsy, where I picked up the china minus the platter. She shot Aunt Maxie a look. What is up with this platter? I just had to know why Aunt Maxie wanted it so badly. Both of us used to attend the Seifert's Christmas parties, Loretta said. Maxine knew I loved those dishes. I did, but I also knew Beverly and Dan bought the old Seifert barn with all their belongings in there. So when I heard about it, I thought to myself, I could buy the platter and put one of my cheese balls on there and I figured that Loretta wouldn't notice the cheese ball if it was on the platter. Aunt Maxie was so sneaky to even think of such a thing. I was going to let her have it after the progressive supper. That's mighty nice of you, Maxine. Loretta's jaw clenched. She was trying her best not to say something snide about why Aunt Maxie did it, so I just dropped the platter situation. Now that we have that established, after you got the dishes from the Wild and Whimsy, what did y'all do? I needed all the details. We went back to my house and cleaned the dishes up really good before we started to plate the appetizers we'd made the day before. Her head shook back and forth, her lips turned down. After that, we took the appetizers to the Cocoon Hotel. While I arranged the furniture in the hospitality suite, I asked Lana to run back up to the Wild and Whimsy to grab me some antique doilies to go under the plates and really spruce things up, even though Kami already had that gorgeous Christmas tree in the corner. Did you see that fireplace mantle? Aunt Maxie gushed. Mm-hmm. She sure can decorate, Loretta agreed. Okay, ladies, can we please get back to the questions? I asked. They both readjusted themselves in the seats. I continued. Did Lana meet with anyone else? I don't know. Not that she mentioned. She came back with the items. While she was gone, I made placeholders with all the names of the cheese balls on them, so when Kami went to put them out, she knew where to go. Loretta did like things just so. She did this at every event she hosted. Lana and I went to the watershed, and I saw you there. That's when I went down to the Cocoon Hotel. I did see you in the tea gardens having what looked like a heated discussion. I recalled how Loretta's head was bobbling back and forth. I wouldn't call it heated. I was telling them how I really needed the platter, and they didn't tell me they'd sold it to Maxine. They just told me they sold it. You can imagine my surprise when I heard someone say they loved the chipped beef ball at the hotel. I knew I didn't make nothing with chipped beef in it. That's when I saw the platter. 
There was a shift in her voice and the color of her face as she tried to keep her composure. I know you said you were going to give me the platter, but according to Roxy, that platter is as good as gone now that it's evidence. If I'd known Lana was doing the cooking, then I wouldn't have done it. Aunt Maxie's words were heated. We don't need to get into an argument. I put my hands out between the two women. Where was Lana during this time? I told her she didn't have to stay if she didn't want, so she opted to leave. Only, we know she didn't get too far, Loretta said in a shaky voice. How did you find Lana to hire? I asked, moving on from the events of the day. Since nothing was out of sorts with Loretta, making me wonder if she'd met someone after she left the hotel, and that was when the poisoning occurred. Babette Cliff. She had done some hiring over the summer, since summer weddings in Honey Springs are becoming a destination, she said. Babette and I were talking. I told her I needed some help around the house now that Bertie was living with me, and I knew Bertie couldn't do it because she is working for you and loving it. Babette gave you Lana's recommendation? I asked. Babette gave me the top five applicants she didn't hire. She gave me their applications, and I called them. But Lana met with me, and I instantly liked her. Loretta looked off. She sniffled. What about the other applicants? Did anyone seem upset you didn't hire them? I wondered if one of the other candidates didn't get the job and plotted out a way to get rid of Lana. It was a stretch, but people killed for far less substantial reasons than that. I didn't call them back and never heard from them again. Loretta shrugged it off like it was no big deal. Do you still have those applications? It wouldn't hurt to look at them. I gave them back to Babette in case she wanted them. Loretta just confirmed what I'd thought earlier. I needed to go see Babette. Now I turned my attention to Aunt Maxie. After you left the beanhive, I didn't need to remind her of how she'd acted that morning after finding out Loretta was taking Babette's job for the progressive supper. That morning, what did you do? I went down to the hotel and saw Loretta in the buzz in and out. That was when an eyewitness had told Spencer about Aunt Maxie confronting Loretta. Spencer wouldn't tell me who the eyewitness was, and now that I knew it was at the diner, it could have been anyone. I made sure I went to the cocoon and waited her out, but I also made sure I made an appearance at the watershed so she'd see me and not think I'd switch the appetizers. Aunt Maxie's brows knitted. What did you do when they were putting out the appetizers before the progressive supper participants got there? I needed every single little detail. I went into the hotel bar and had me a sweet iced tea. You know they have the best in town. Aunt Maxie licked her lips. It's just a little bit of honey that boil in the water, Loretta chimed in. Did anyone see you there besides the bartender? I knew we needed witnesses to everything. Yes! Aunt Maxie smacked her hands together. Newton Oakley! Newton Oakley? I asked to make sure. He was the eyes and ears of the Cocoon Hotel, as well as the maintenance man. Yep. Aunt Maxie's lips twitched. I might have told him what I was doing, and he might have been the lookout for me when I did the switch. I thought he was hitting on me, Loretta glared. He was trying to sweet talk me, and this whole time he was helping you? Aunt Maxie nodded. I'm sorry, I didn't tell him to sweet talk you, but I had to save the dinner from, well, you. Aunt Maxie should have just stopped talking because she was throwing one jab after the other, 
and the truce the two had agreed to didn't seem to hold water. Stop this. I stood up and looked at them. You two need to stop this right now, or we will never find the real killer, because let me tell you, I pointed directly at Loretta, you might not be a suspect, but you know they are looking for Aunt Maxie, and here you sit, no different than me, him, and her. I dragged my finger to point at myself, Mom, and Patrick. This is just awful. Loretta's nostrils flared before her eyes teared up. We got to find that killer. The best thing we can do is get Aunt Maxie to the station so Spencer can question her. I'll go see if I can get those applications from Babette and try to find out what I can from Kevin. I had to get more details on Lana's life, too, but I had yet to figure that part out. Maybe Kevin had contacted her family, and I'd get some information from him about that. I also have to take Sassy and Pepper down to the Paw Raid, Patrick reminded me. I forgot about that, I nodded. Okay, changing plans. Mom, can you take Aunt Maxie to the department? I'll call Kirk to meet you there. Kirk? Aunt Maxie crossed her arms. I'd rather go to prison for killing someone I didn't murder. I'm going to need you to trust him. Do not call him names or treat him like he did... My voice trailed off when I noticed Patrick staring at me. What? It's okay. You can treat him awful after all this mess is cleared up. He bent down and kissed Aunt Maxie on the cheek. I don't know what you said about him or what he said about you. But I love you, and I know Roxy loves you. She'd never do anything to steer you wrong. I'll go, but only because I love you. She pinched Patrick's cheek and got up to go. Chapter 14 On our way back home to pick up the dogs for the parade, Patrick and I went over the notes I'd taken. We'd agreed Lana had to have met with someone to have been poisoned. But who? The fur kiddos were looking out the family room window when we got there. As soon as they noticed us pull up in the truck, they ran to the door and I could hear them barking. You stay here and I'll get them, I told Patrick. There was no sense in him getting out of the truck since we were just going to get back in. We were already going to be late, and although it hardly mattered... I didn't anticipate us winning, since I'd gotten them some store-bought sweaters from A Walk in the Bark Animal Boutique, another cute shop on the boardwalk. Sassy was wearing one that looked like an elf, while Pepper was wearing a sweater that made him look like Santa Claus. Of course, his schnauzer beard was perfect. Do you two want to go bye-bye? I asked the babies as they darted out of the cabin without bothering to greet me after they heard the magic words, bye-bye. I did a quick check of the cabin to make sure everything inside was okay. Since I'd had the house fire a couple of years ago, I was still leery of the wood-burning stove, even though the fire was set deliberately. Everything all good? Patrick had already gotten the dogs in the car and cleaned off their paws from the snow. They sat anxiously in between Patrick and me. Pepper climbed into my lap once I had my seatbelt on and was ready to go. Everything looked good, I said. Pepper shivered. You're going to get all warm and fuzzy now. I put his little coat on him and decided to wait to put Sassy's coat costume on until we got the truck stopped at Central Park. She was just too big for me to put it on her in such a confined space. What are you thinking about with Maxie? Patrick asked. I'm hoping Mom did take her. While we were at the secret hiding space cabin, we agreed that Mom would take Aunt Maxie to the department. I hate to do it, but I think Kirk needs to be her lawyer. Do you think she's going to let him? Patrick was so good about Kirk being here. I wasn't so sure I'd be so nice if it were the other way around. You know what? I reached across Sassy and squeezed Patrick's arm. You amaze me. I love you so much. I love you so much more. Patrick glanced quickly 
taking his eyes briefly off the road to look at me. He smiled. His eyes held a softness only I knew when he looked at me. I just want everyone at our table for Christmas. My stomach did a topsy-turvy dive, almost making me nauseated at the thought of anyone not being there. I pictured Aunt Maxie's seat being empty, but quickly put that in the back of my mind. What? You went silent. Patrick was so hyper-aware of my actions, it was almost scary. The thought of Spencer even putting Aunt Maxie in jail really bothers me. But how did the methanol get into the coffee house? I racked my brain for any and all reasons. I know you're not going to like this, but who has a key to the coffee house? Patrick asked me a strange question. Me, you, Aunt Maxie, Bunny, and Bertie, I said out loud, counting them off on my fingers. Who out of those would have any reason to harm Lana, or possibly Loretta? He confused me. Obviously not me or you. Bunny and Maxine have their beef with Loretta, but if you break it down, they do like her. Then there's Bertie. My jaw clenched at his words. I know, I know you adore her. You can't forget the fact that she's been accused of poisoning her teachers before she came here. She's got a temper from her past. And didn't you tell me something about Loretta saying she needed to go home for Christmas? I started opening my mouth to protest. Hear me out. He turned down Main Street. The sidewalks were filled with tourists, locals, and dogs, all walking toward the park where the festival was always held. What if she thought it would only make Loretta a little ill? Sick to her stomach, Patrick asked. I gulped, wondering if that was what was going on with my stomach, since it had been a little off. Did I accidentally eat something with methanol? Not to kill her, but she didn't get the dosage right, and Lana accidentally ate it. Patrick had put a little scare in me. Patrick! Do you really think? I held Pepper close to me so my nerves would settle down from his warmth. I'm not saying anything for sure. I just know that she's gifted when it comes to chemistry. She's had a little bit of a past that could bring things into question. She has access to Loretta and Lana, plus the keys to the beanhive, where she could potentially hide things. He parked the truck in a spot along the far side of the park, my molars gnawed on the inside of my cheek as the possibility began to take form in my head. I don't know. She did say she didn't want to go home for Christmas. I hated to even begin to let this idea grow, but he was right on all accounts. And if Loretta got the tiniest bit sick, you know her parents wouldn't make Bertie leave Loretta here. They just might come here like Bertie wants. Patrick took Sassy's coat costume from the seat and put it on her. Just talk to her and feel her out. That's all I'm saying. I agreed and we got out of the truck, filing in line with all the others on the sidewalk. The gazebo was all festively lit up with colored lights. I was sad we'd missed the Christmas tree lighting ceremony this year, but from the looks of it, the tree was larger than ever before. No doubt that was Loretta's doing, since she was the president of the beautification committee. Speaking of Loretta, I saw her and Bertie near the front of the Santa line, where they were handing out candy canes. I would be sure to stop by, not only to make sure everything was good between her and Aunt Maxie, after I'd left them at the cabin, but also to gauge Bertie's attitude toward her. Darn Patrick had now given me the awful idea that Bertie could have accidentally killed Lana. I'll go get the kids signed up. Patrick referred to the pups. He kissed me before he and Sassy went to the registration table. Pepper sniffed at everyone and everything as we made our way from vendor tent to vendor tent. Mom, I gasped when I noticed her and Aunt Maxie at the tent I'd rented for the beanhive. There were two display cases filled with treats from the coffee house. Four industrial coffee pots with the Christmas special blend 
and three little cafe tables for patron to sit, chat, enjoy coffee and a treat, as well as heat up next to the small bonfire. What on earth? With everything going on, I'd not mentioned the space I'd rented for the festival and figured it was out of the question for this year. It was all Patrick's doing, Mom smiled. The reason he was not available to come get you at the jail was because he was here, working on this before I threw a wrench in everything. Aunt Maxie referred to her hiding out in the cabin. He knew you were busy at the coffee house, and Bertie had been making extra food at the coffee house at night, so it could be a big surprise for you. Surprise! A pair of arms hugged me from behind, but I recognized Bertie's voice. Patrick and I wanted to do something nice for you, since you've always been there for me. I'd do anything for you and anything to be here for this. Anything? I turned around, my eyes wide and a smile on my face, wondering if I was staring into the eyes of a young killer. Thank you. I hugged her back. And what about you? I asked. I called Spencer and acted like he was crazy for not finding me. I told him I'd been running around all day getting things ready for this. Aunt Maxie leaned on the glass case. He said he'd be down here to talk to me. I'm waiting on him, she shrugged. If he wants to take me in, he can. But I called Kirk, she snarled. Only because you suggested it. She threw her chin up in a gesture, indicating that I should look behind me. Kirk and Jessica were walking up to the tent. The little puppy she'd adopted was on a leash and wore a doggy outfit with a huge lion's mane around her head. I have to tell you that I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself, and I admit I came to the coffee house to check you out. Jessica seemed to be nice. I was all prepared to... And then I saw the puppy and my heart melted. Then you came in and I just couldn't bring myself to introduce myself. Now you two have met. Kirk wrapped his arms around her. I was really hoping it was going to be different, but this is how it happened. It was interesting seeing Kirk with another woman who was his wife. They had an apparent love between them that Kirk and I had never shared. Something neither of us could give to the other and why our marriage didn't work out. My reaction had surprised even me. Normally, my heart was cold to him. Now I watched how nice it was to see he'd finally gotten his happily ever after with Jessica. I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself when you were asking about my visit here. Jessica really did seem to be a nice person. It's fine. I returned the smile. Now, what about a name? I asked about the puppy. Biscuit. She reached down and picked her up. Kirk hates the name, but I love it, and he responded to it. She snuggled him tight. I could just eat him up like a warm biscuit. The puppy wiggled and wormed in her arms, giving her big kisses on the nose. Kirk had excused himself when Spencer got Aunt Maxie off to the side. Instead of going over there and trying to listen in, I did let Kirk handle it, because I'd been down this road once before with Aunt Maxie, and it truly was a conflict of interest. Not to mention, it was hard for me not to be biased. I had to notice Bertie standing near Aunt Maxie and trying to stay in a conversation with Alva, the waitress from the diner. Alva and Bertie were looking at Alva's phone. They were discussing something intently. Aunt Maxie's eyes were also fixed on the screen. It's time for the parade, Biscuit! Jessica's glee showed all over her face. She darted off with Biscuit snuggled up to her neck. Are you ready? Patrick asked me. Do you mind getting started without me? I tried to avoid his stare when I handed him Pepper's leash, but I could feel the tension. I'll meet you on the front side of the park. Yeah, sure. He sighed before giving in to a kiss. Thank you. I whispered into his ear. Let's go, kids. He wrangled the leashes, leaving me with Aunt Maxie, Alva, and Bertie. Mom was with a customer, and Loretta was doing what she did best, retelling the story of Lana. 
The crowd was dispersing to the far side of the park as they all went either to watch the parade or to participate. I was so glad I wasn't judging the competition because all the animals were adorable. Excuse me, Loretta said, asking me to move. I've got to get to the judge's table. She patted my arm. Fake marble fur outlined her coat's collar and the cuffs of its sleeves. The jeweled buttons glistened as the snow hit them perfectly. She also wore a hat that was the same color as the coat on top and had the same fur trim along the bottom, making a furry crown around her head. Perfect for the parade judge, I thought, as a smile curled up on my lips, though I would never tell her she kind of looked like my sassy. Are you okay? I asked, just in case she'd heard something and I wanted to know before she darted off. I called Elliot and told him it was probably best for Bertie to go home for Christmas. She reached into her coat pocket and took out her lipstick. I told him it had to be presented that it was his idea. He, too, thought it would be best, since I'm a little stressed about Lana. She slid the top off the lipstick and twisted it up, applying a thick layer to her upper and lower lip. She has been a pill ever since. Not listening to a word I'm saying, and I can't get her off that darn phone. I looked back over at Aunt Maxie, Alva, and Bertie, all still looking at Alva's phone screen. I can't worry about that right now. I've got to go judge the parade. She closed her lipstick and shuffled away. Be sure to come back after the parade to warm up, I told the customers as they left the Bean Hive Coffee House vendor tent. Can you believe Patrick did all of this? I turned to ask Aunt Maxie. Mm-hmm, but you've got to see this. She pointed at Alva's phone. People will put and say anything on social media, she tisked. Mom shrugged, her lips turned down. She opened a couple of the coolers filled with pastries, cookies, and treats. She went down the glass display case and refilled all the empty spaces so we would be ready when the parade was over. I think Patrick is a keeper. Mom decided to answer me since Aunt Maxie brushed me off. I'm so floored. He's been so amazing. And you too. Thank you. It felt so good to finally have a relationship with my mom after all those years of not seeing eye to eye. Maybe I'd grown up, or maybe she was just better at adult children. Either way, my heart was filled with gratitude. Roxanne! Aunt Maxine called me over, gesturing wildly. Get over here while everyone is gone. What's going on? I didn't have time for social media, and Aunt Maxie certainly didn't need to entertain the idea of being on social media. I poured myself a cup of Christmas blend coffee and walked over. Bertie is so smart. Aunt Maxie's bracelets jingled and jangled as she pointed and shook a finger at Bertie. I know that. I gulped and wondered about the whole idea Patrick had brought up, which I would look into later. Do you like the blend? Bertie asked. I made the special roast last night so it would be fresh. It was a chore trying to keep all of it a secret from you, but Patrick insisted. I looked down into the cup. I couldn't stop seeing the skull and crossbones in my head floating in the mug. Delicious! I set it down and looked at the phone Aunt Maxie was referring to. What did Bertie find? I found Lana's social media profile. Bertie took Alva's phone and showed me. This is the guy she was dating. Apparently, she broke up with him and they had a fight. Really? My eyes grew at the prospect of another suspect to investigate. I'm listening. I've not fully gone back and clicked all the images, but there's definitely some issues, and it makes me wonder if she went down to the beach to meet him. 
Alva poked the screen and showed me a photo of Lana and this guy on the beach with the cocoon hotel behind them. And it looks like the place where she died, right? Alva asked. Why, it sure is. That boy killed her, and he ain't even on Spencer Shepard's radar. Aunt Maxie's lips contorted and snarled. We've got to find him. We? I shook my head. You aren't doing anything. If anything needs to be done, then I can look into it, or Kirk can. Kirk smirk, Aunt Maxie frowned. I don't trust him. You don't have to. I do. I held my hand out for the phone. Do we have a name? It gets better than that, Alva smiled, her brows rising. I saw him and Lana in the diner a few weeks back. I didn't pay much attention to them, but when James told them to take their fight outside, it got some unwanted attention by customers. Wait, James? James Farley. I wanted to make sure we were on the same page. She nodded and her eyes grew. Lana and this guy had an argument, and James made them leave the diner? He told me to do it, but I do believe this is the guy. She touched her phone screen with the phone still in my hands. I need this guy's info. I gnawed on my bottom lip. My eyes drew up under my eyebrows, and I looked at Bertie. You have social media, right? I handed Alva's phone back to her. Yep. Bertie grinned. I can get all the info for you. She took her phone out of her coat pocket. She and Alva exchanged information back and forth about the guy so Bertie could find him. Now what? Aunt Maxie asked. Now we get on social media and look this guy up. We also go see James Farley to see what he remembers about the argument between Lana and this guy so we can take that information to Spencer. I sucked in a deep breath and noticed the paw raid had started. They were halfway down the sidewalk opposite from where we were, near the place I'd told Patrick I'd meet him. This is good, Aunt Maxie agreed. Being a jilted lover is a big motive to have killed someone. My brow shot up, my head tilted, and my lips pinched. Chapter 15 Sometime during the night, my phone had chirped with a text. Normally, those little beeps and bings didn't wake me up. Now that Aunt Maxie was in a bit of a pickle, every little noise had woken me up. Is everything okay? The phone came to life when I picked it up off the bedside table. Patrick turned over in bed to check on me. Yeah, better than okay. It's Spencer. He said the bean hive is clear and I can open in the morning. That's great, honey. Patrick wrapped an arm around Sassy, barely making it over to me, snuggling his girls for a minute before he and she went back to their snoring. The disturbance had woken Pepper, who'd been sleeping at the foot of the bed. He made his way up alongside the bed. When giving him a couple of chest scratches didn't make him lie down next to me, I knew he needed to go potty. Okay, it was all I had to say for him to jump off the bed and scuttle out of the room. I didn't have to worry about being so quiet. Sassy and Patrick slept so hard that I could have turned on the lights while singing a chipper Christmas tune at the top of my lungs, and they'd never wake up. Still, to be respectful, I peeled back the cover and slipped my feet into my fuzzy slippers. I grabbed my long robe from the chair next to the bedroom door and headed down the steps to let Pepper go outside. Then I put my phone in the robe pocket. After his sweater was nice and snug around his little furry body, I told him, I'll keep the door cracked. While Pepper went potty, I walked over to the wood burner to check the fire. The embers were red and orange. A couple of pieces of wood sat next to the stove. I opened the little cast iron door and threw them in. Patrick had stocked plenty of wood on the porch between a couple of the rockers. I had nothing better to do, so I went out there, filled my arms with wood, and made a couple of trips to refill the bin inside. Pepper joined me on the last load. 
He shook the snow off his coat and sat in front of the fire to warm his sweet little body. I guess I'm wide awake. I pulled the phone out of my robe pocket and noticed it was 3 a.m. Why is Spencer texting me now? I wondered. The kettle was in the kitchen, and a good cup of cowboy coffee would wake me up, since I had no reason to hang around here for another hour. I was definitely going to go open the coffee house. I peeked out the kitchen window while the water from the faucet filled the kettle. There was even more snow than when we'd gone to bed. After the kettle filled, I walked over and put it on top of the stove. You look comfy, I told Pepper. He had curled up tight in the dog bed next to the fire. I went back to the kitchen to put some coffee grounds in a cup. It didn't take long before the water was boiling, and I poured in my cup. The steam rolled out of the spout and continued to boil when I put the kettle back on. I set the cup on the coffee table and retrieved one of the afghan blankets from the basket next to the couch. Then I eased down on the sofa, settling in with my cup in one hand and my phone in the other. I hated to do it, but I knew I had to. I hit the app store on my phone and downloaded the social media app on which Bertie and Alva had found this guy who'd been involved with Lana. I guess I've got to do this. I groaned, making my stomach hurt, since I'd been so against this whole social media thing. It's for the good of Aunt Maxie and Lana. It made me feel better to put it that way. With all my information typed in and confirmation from an email they'd sent me, I was well on my way to getting into Cam Beard's social media profile. I guess we have to be friends for me to see your stuff? I hit the request button, and nothing happened. Hmm. I tried to figure out why I couldn't see his stuff, but quickly realized he had to accept me as his friend. Oh, no. He's going to see that I asked to be a friend. I gulped and quickly regretted the whole social media thing. I put the phone down. Some tension built inside of me. This whole thing was new, and I didn't care for it. I let go of a long, disappointed sigh and sipped on my coffee. A notification lit up my phone. Cam Beard accepted your friend request, I read, and hit the notification, which took me straight to his social media account. Literally, I had to force myself to put the phone down and get ready for work. Not that it was hard to go into the laundry room, put on my uniform, and drive Pepper and myself to the boardwalk, but this social media had a hold that seemed to mesmerize me. It was like Cam's relationship was a documentary, right there on his profile, and his was linked to Lana's. I didn't bother asking to be her friend because she was dead. I continued to flip through the photos of them on his account, using my fingers a few times to blow up the images. I needed to look at her face, read her body language. Nothing told me she was scared or worried for her life around him. They were sweet photos. We've got to get to work. I finally forced myself to come out from underneath the warm blanket and put the phone down so I could get ready. Pepper knew the drill, and he was waiting by the door for me when he saw me pulling my snow boots on my feet. I'd given Pepper a little kibble in his bowl to occupy him while I went out to start the car, warm it up, and get the piles of snow off it. While the car warmed and Pepper snacked, I got right back on social media and flipped through Cam's photos. I wanted to see if there were any work photos or anything else that would tell me where to find him. Only I didn't have enough time to get through them all, since Pepper barked at the door, letting me know it was time for us to go. I flipped on the radio and heard the weather report. The tree limbs along the edge of the road were filled with piles of snow. Sometimes when that happened to the trees, the snow would also be thick on the power lines, which could make the power and the internet go out. That wouldn't be good for getting the coffee house open. By the time I'd made it to the boardwalk, parked, and gathered pepper, the radio hadn't broadcast an updated weather report, 
so I just took the chance that all was good at the coffee house. Since Pepper had already done his morning business, I carried him to the bean hive and quickly got us inside. I flipped on the lights and even turned up the furnace, which I knew I would have to do before I even got the fire going. It was one of those chill-to-the-bone mornings, and it was going to take a while before my joints got moving. Here you go. I put some kibble in Pepper's bowl to finish off his morning breakfast. While he ate, I went into the kitchen and noticed a few things out of place, which had to be from Spencer's search. Nothing too bad. While I waited for the ovens to heat, I put everything back in place and made my way to the freezer to take out today's breakfast choice and the usuals. Pepper was sitting at the front door of the coffee house, looking out at the door like he was surveying the large snowflakes. One by one, I flipped on the industrial coffee pots that had been set a few days before and yet brewed, even though Spencer had shut me down. They gurgled to life. Good morning. Bertie popped through the door. Bertie, what are you doing here? I asked, since I'd yet to call her or Bunny about Spencer letting me open the bean hive. I couldn't sleep, so I decided to come hang out here. But it looks like you're opening. Did Grandmama tell you not to call me? She looked like she was about to cry. I've not heard from Loretta. I hurried over to her and helped her out of her wet coat. Spencer texted me and let me know I could open, so I thought I'd get here early and see what they'd rummaged through before I called you or Bunny. We walked over to the fireplace and worked together to get the fire started. What's going on? I didn't want to let her know Loretta had told me she'd called Elliot, Bertie's dad, to come get her for Christmas. This was their family business, not mine. They think I need to leave Honey Springs until this murder gets solved. But I told them I didn't need Grandmama to keep me company. This is the last thing I'd planned to happen. She batted her eyes and sniffed. Last thing? I asked, wondering if she'd just implicated herself in a plot to make Loretta a teeny tiny bit sick with something like methanol so she didn't have to go back home. Yeah, I hoped my family would come here, not me leave. She eased down on the couch, vigorously rubbing her cold hands together. I feel like Honey Springs is my home. Who wants to be away from home for Christmas? I could relate so much to her feelings. At her age, I would come visit, then have to leave when it was time for school to start. Things have a way of working themselves out. I was leery of giving her any advice. That's what you have to say? She looked at me funny. You're always giving me good advice, and this time you're telling me to just let it work out? It's Christmas. Maybe your parents want you to come home to their home because they don't know how you feel about Honey Springs feeling like home. I walked over to the coffee pots and switched them out so I could start the ones for the Cocoon Hotel's hospitality room. Take this time to tell them how you feel about it here. I guess I could do that. Bertie shrugged, making me think she wasn't really going to listen to me. They never take my feelings into consideration. I would have to do something to get their attention first. I'm sure your parents miss you, and right now I think they will listen. You've grown up so much over the past few months, and they will be able to see that. She started to fidget while I tried to encourage her to talk to her parents, before she did anything rash. Or had she already done something that was just too unthinkable to consider? No, I shoved aside the thought that she'd actually tried to make Loretta sick and accidentally killed Lana in the process. Why don't you take today to walk around the coffee house to make sure customers are happy? I suggested. I didn't want her around food. You know, just in case. I want you to have a good day. I lied right to her face, her eyes wide open, like she was trying to figure out what I was doing. Which brings me to that. I pointed at the door when I saw Louise coming in with the old lady. 
Louise said our furry friend needs some loving. There's no one who can give more snuggles, hugs, pats, and treats than you. Bertie hurried over to the cage and took it from Louise. I'm so glad you got here when you did, I told Louise. I think Bertie needs some good cat therapy today. Charlotte is the best at giving all the therapy one needs. Louise referred to the older cat as Charlotte. She's got a little arthritis and is a little older, but other than that, she's perfect. Louise cracked a joke, making Bertie and me laugh. She's precious. I couldn't help myself. I went to go rub down the torty feline. You and Charlotte will greet the customers today. That's positively perfect. Bertie snickered and took Charlotte over to the couch, where Pepper waited to check her out. Everything okay? Louise took me by the elbow as we walked back to the counter. Bertie seems a little off. Yeah, I think with the murder, her parents want her to come home for Christmas, and she really doesn't want to. I poured Louise a cup of coffee. Enjoy, Christmas blend. I glanced over Louise's shoulder and felt ashamed of myself for even thinking young Bertie could harm anyone, given the way she was taking care of Charlotte. What if I ask her to come to Pet Palace to volunteer a few days? Do you think that'd help her get out of here? Louise caught me off guard. I'm sorry, I asked and moved the brewed coffee for the hotel from the maker so I could start preparing the coffee for the coffee bar. Sometimes you can hear people in here talking about what's happening, and in this instance, it's the murder, which is really not for young ears. Louise looked over at Bertie. Not that she's so young, but her parents could be worried she's hearing too much. I admit there's a lot of chatter in here. My gut gnawed. I guess you could see if she wants to help you out. The bell over the door dinged, announcing the first customer of the day. Just think about it and let me know. Louise tapped the counter with her hand. Have a great day with Charlotte, she called out to Bertie on her way out. Bertie barely lifted her head to acknowledge Louise's comment, though she did have a faint smile on her face. The customers were filing in one by one, as the sunrise peeked its head over Lake Honey Springs, which was almost frozen over. This was just in time for the upcoming opening of the winter ice skating rink, which had a long tradition even when I was a kid. The place wasn't an actual skating rink, but the locals made sure it was good and iced over before anyone decided to go out there on ice skates and roll around. It was a lot of fun to sit at the long window table in the front of the coffee house to watch a pickup game of hockey. Have a good day, I called to a couple of customers on their way out. I sent Kami a text to let her know I was alone this morning. Though Bertie was physically here, she'd yet to move from the couch, which was what I wanted her to do. Kami texted back that it was no problem and added that she'd send Walker up to grab the coffee and pastries. I got their hospitality items gathered and took them up by the window bar, where I sucked in a few deep breaths. The window bar was actually my favorite spot in the bean hive, and today would show a gorgeous view of the lake with all the fresh snow lying on top. Good morning. I greeted another customer, and left the Cocoon Hotel items on the window bar so Walker could grab them and go. What can I get started for you? I asked the customer and waited for them to look down the display case. With more and more customers filtering in and out, Bertie recognized the crowd and got up, leaving Charlotte on the cat tree up in the corner next to the Christmas tree. Louise mentioned something about you possibly going to volunteer at Pet Palace, since you're great with the animals. I had all the orders lined up along the counter. One after the other, we made them. Bertie was so good at being a barista, I wasn't sure how I would handle her leaving me for Pet Palace. Nah, I'm good here. 
Bertie glanced at me and smiled. Bertie and I tackled the morning rush. There were a few inquiries about Charlotte, but it was going to be hard to place her, since most people were looking for puppies and kittens for Christmas presents. This weather is cramping my style. Bunny Bowowski shuffled through the door. She shrugged off her coat and shook the snow off it, pulled out one of the cafe table chairs closest to the door, and sat down to exchange her snow boots for her comfy tennis shoes. I love snow, but this is getting ridiculous. I love it, Bertie said. Meet Charlotte. She looks as old as me, Bunny snarled. She's spunky like you, too. Bertie made Bunny jerk up a little taller. We old gals have to stick together. Bunny got up and headed over to the cat tree. Ain't that right, Charlotte? It was sweet that Bunny loved on the torty feline before she walked back to get the down low on the events of today and the recent past. Get to the good stuff. She wanted to know what was going on with the murder after I filled her in on Charlotte and how the morning had gone. I don't know a whole lot. I ran my fingers through my hair. I do have a hair appointment at the Honeycomb Salon, so I'm hoping there's a bit of gossip there. Then I'm going to run down to see Kevin. The morgue? Bunny wondered. Why on earth would you go there? I want to see what Kevin has to say about the poison. My eyes shifted to look at Bertie, but my face stayed still. What? Bertie? Bunny leaned in. My subtle movement hadn't gone unnoticed. Roxanne! She gasped in a whisper. What? My chin jutted forward. Is it that impossible? I'd be ashamed. She reached around me and got a ceramic mug to pour herself a cup of coffee. After everything that poor girl has done for you, you can't possibly hold it against her that she's related to Low Rita. Of course not, but I can't help but wonder if she used her chemistry skills to make Loretta a tad bit ill so her parents wouldn't make her come home for Christmas. My jaw tensed and my eyes grew big as I tried to silently tell Bunny to hush because Bertie was walking over. How's the coffee? Bertie asked Bunny. I roasted it perfect, didn't I? Coffee shot out of Bunny's mouth. Are you okay? Bertie asked. I don't think I'm in the mood for coffee this afternoon. Bunny slowly poured the hot cup of coffee down the sink behind the counter. Chapter 16 Down at the Honeycomb Salon, more than hair always got twisted, if you know what I mean. If you didn't hear gossip over coffee chat, you sure could sit underneath the hairdryer and listen in. That was exactly what I'd planned to do before I got on the social media. What is it you're doing? Alice D. asked as she dug her nails deep down into my hair and pulled it out to see exactly where she needed to put in some dye. Are you on that Instagram? She looked over my shoulder. I could hear her chomping away on her gum. Hey there, Roxy. Hey there, Roxy. Jessica greeted me when she walked in. The puppy's head hung over the top of Jessica's purse. Is that a dog in your pocketbook? Alice asked. Jessica snorted and laughed. No, it's a dog carrier, but I would use it as a purse. She rubbed her hand along the front of it. Biscuit loves it. Good golly, I've seen it all. Alice waved a comb in the air. Honey, where are you from? This is Jessica, and she's local now, I spoke up. Jessica smiled at me. She's Kirk's wife. Biscuit is from the Pet Palace. I didn't continue to scroll through my phone. I felt the heat of stares. I love it here, Jessica whispered in an unsure tone. I noticed you take walk-in nail clients. She pointed at the door, Biscuit's head bobbling as her forearm moved. I'm in desperate need of a manicure. Sure, honey, you go on over there and pick out a color. We'll be right with you. 
Alice D. Spencer gave me the side eye. She's nice. It's fine. I assured Alice D. that I was appreciative of her loyalty, but it wasn't necessary. Then I took the stack of squared pieces of tinfoil from her. Anyways, I heard about that poison-killing Loretta's hired hand. Alice D. did exactly what I wanted, started right on in about the murder. And it was from the platter. You mean from the Seifert's platter? One of the ladies in another salon chair asked. Yep. Alice D. took the sharp end of her comb, making strands with my hair, before slapping some color paste on it. She poked at my shoulder. I handed her a square of tinfoil. I told Beverly Tea Garden she shouldn't try to sell that china, especially the platter. And there you go. She sold it and someone turned up dead, an employee of the honeycomb said. She meandered over to look at Jessica's nails. You want a gel nail or something else? Gel. Jessica nodded and handed the color to the manicurist. You want this color, but it's for acrylic, so pick you out a gel color over there. She directed Jessica to another part of the bookcase, lined with polishes used for the style of nail she wanted. I'll be right back. She left Jessica and Biscuit to go check on someone under another dryer. My mama told me all about that platter, and when I heard the bank had released the stuff in the barn, I thought about that dish. She made Alice stop slapping the dye on my hair. I know, I couldn't believe it. Alice D. shook her head and held her hand out for me to give her another piece of foil. What are you talking about? I asked. That platter is death. That's why they stopped having those fancy Christmas parties. Alice began to tell a fascinating story. Christmas death. Twice. Twice? I wanted to make sure I heard her correctly, over the hairdryers and the chit-chat between the other clients and hairdressers. Mm-hmm, the manicurist hummed from behind my chair on her way back to see what gel color Jessica had picked out. You go sit right there, honey. Jessica went over to the table and sat down in the chair. She put Biscuit's carrier on the floor, took him out, and set him in her lap. He ain't gonna jump down, is he? "'Because we can't have any of that,' Alice D. said. "'He's really good. He'll stay right here.' Jessica put her hands on the towel-covered wrist pillow when the manicurist tapped her fingers on it. "'What about two deaths? I wanted to get right back to the topic. "'It was Mrs. Seifert's mother, then sister.' Alice stared at my reflection in the mirror. "'I'm guessing you've not heard about this?' "'No.' I didn't dare move my head in fear her dye paintbrush would slip and give me a skunk look. Honey, hush, she drew back. Let me tell you, it was a big thing around here then. Now we seem to get a lot of <clears throat> crime. But back then, when someone died for no apparent reason, it was unheard of. Gosh, I can't imagine losing my mom or a sister in one holiday. I didn't have any siblings, but losing someone during the holidays had to be tough. It was a year apart, not in the same year, Alice clarified. The first time the Christmas party turkey was served, Miss Seifert's mom cut it. She took the first bite out of it and keeled over. I wasn't sure where she was going with this tale. Back then, when someone keeled over, it was just assumed it was a heart attack. Her voice grew mysterious. Then, the next year, Mrs. Seifert's sister, who lived with them, well, both the mom and the sister lived at the Seifert mansion. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. She stuck her hand out, and I gave her a piece of tinfoil. Then the next year, the sister cut it, she started over, took a bite, keeled over right there. Was she older? I asked. In her forties? That ain't a bit old, even for back then. Alice took the stack of tinfoil out of my hands. You go on over to that dryer next to your friend Jessica. 
I caught a wry smile on her face before she looked away. Did they figure out what happened to the sister? I asked on my way over to the chair. Mr. Seifert was a magician, and he said he'd gotten the Christmas china somewhere out west, and it was rumored to be haunted. So he continued until his death to say it was the platter, since it was the only time Mrs. Seifert had ever used it. Alice pulled the helmet-style hairdryer over my hair and twisted the dial. He had a creepy smile. Remember how thin and tall he was? Then he wore all that jewelry, ring on all his fingers. The ticking noise from the hair dryer timer, counting down, sounded loud to me. And nothing ever came of it? I asked. Not a thing. They stopped doing the parties. Mrs. Seifert was rumored to go into a deep seclusion. Alice frowned. Now you sit under there for twenty minutes. I'll get you a water and some magazines. She took off before I finished with my questions. So no one ever used the dishes again? Or looked into the deaths? I had to be clear on this strange and intriguing story. That's why Loretta is so crazy about those dishes. She was at both of the parties with the deaths. Jessica put in her two cents, which she'd obviously heard from Kirk. When she heard about your Aunt Maxie had gotten it from the tea gardens, well, let's just say she told Kirk some colorful words. And now we have three deaths because of that platter, the manicurist said and filed away on Jessica's nails. Maybe I can get Kevin to test the platter, I said, and took the ten-year-old magazines and glass of water from Alice D. The idea was a long shot, but it was definitely something to explore. Talk about Christmas past. You can't get any more past to the future than that. The manicurist tried to give a parallel to a Christmas carol. Someone sure is playing Scrooge. Alice D. gathered up all the items she used on my hair and disappeared into the back of the salon with them. Chapter 17 The snow was really coming down when I left the honeycomb. The fluffy stuff had completely covered the boardwalk and the top of the lake, and the sky was gray. This told me the snow wasn't letting up any time soon. There was no reason to keep the coffee house open, so I made a beeline to the bean hive. It's coming down! Bunny and Birdie were sitting at the window bar. Not a single customer was inside. Birdie's been fussing with her parents, who are insisting she come home tonight, now that there's a huge nor'easter coming through. I haven't heard the weather. I shifted my focus to Birdie. I'm sorry. It seems like there's not much you can do but go home for Christmas. This is my home. She jumped off the stool and headed to the back of the shop. She's been a pill since you left. Bunny sighed and rolled her eyes. She's saying all sorts of crazy things like she's going to run away. I've tried to talk to her. She won't run away. I put an arm on Bunny. Thank you for listening to her. Why don't you go grab your coat and I'll take you home? We walked to the back where Bertie was on the phone, arguing with someone I assumed to be her dad. Bunny opened the glass display case doors and boxed up the leftover food. I poured out the coffee carafes. This is my home, she screamed as she took the phone from her ear. I just hung up on him. I'm closing the coffee house for the day, so why don't you go home and give Loretta one more good try? She met my suggestion with a wiggle of her head. I can stay and clean up. Bertie would do anything to stay and not leave. Nah, it's getting pretty slick out there, and the rest of this stuff can wait. Bertie's face reddened with anger, but she didn't say anything else. She put her coat on and scratched Charlotte on her way out. Is that Alva's ring? I noticed it on Bertie's pointer finger. Yeah, we did a little Christmas exchange, and I gave her a beanhive gift card, and she gave me the ring. She said she didn't have any money to buy a gift. Bertie looked at it. I told her I'd just wear it for a few days, then give it back. It's present enough, she shrugged. 
I'm glad you found a friend. Now, I'm going to take Charlotte home with me. We gals have to stick together. Bunny was a soft yet heart. This wouldn't be the first pet palace adoptee she took home. We might even have an early Christmas snack, because this snow makes me feel like it's Christmas. I'll get my stuff and be right back. I went to the back to make sure all the ovens and roasters were turned off. Bunny was waiting by the door, all bundled up in her snow boots and coat, with Charlotte tucked in her arms. She'd already gotten Pepper's coat on him and the leash attached to his collar. We old gals are ready to go. There was a twinkle in Bunny's eyes. All righty, I took the leash. Once we were all outside, I flipped off the lights and locked the door behind us. What did Kevin say? Bunny asked on our way to the car. I had tucked my arm in hers just in case she fell, but she was doing better than me. Pepper was darting around, sticking his nose deep in the snow. He loved the white stuff. I didn't go see him yet. The snow was kind of put a damper on things. I was going to see what the roads were like and possibly stop by if they weren't as bad as I thought they were. I can go with you. Bunny leaned a little more on me when we walked down the steps, since Charlotte prevented her from holding on to the railing. Me and Charlotte are curious. Two old biddies. I laughed and thought it wasn't a bad idea in case I needed to snoop. You could keep Kevin busy while I look around. I smiled at her. I even brought some of your Christmas cookies with me, and I could give him some. She stood next to the door of my car, and I opened it and helped her in. You're so good. I loved how Pepper knew the drill. When someone was in the passenger seat, Pepper was more than happy to share and sit in the back. Everyone ready? I asked, looking over at Bunny to make sure she got her seatbelt on. Then I looked in the rearview mirror at Pepper, in the back seat with his doggy seatbelt on. Bunny made some more chit-chat to keep silence at bay the entire way to the morgue. I didn't hear a word of it, since my head was filled with things I wanted to learn from my little field trip there. I've never seen a body in the morgue. Bunny took off her scarf and made a little bed for Charlotte. You don't need to go in. Why don't you stay with the kids? I wanted to give her an out, since her paling face had gotten visibly whiter on our way over. Are you sure? she asked, and took a box of my Christmas cookies out of her bag. Here. I will tell him they are from you. I gave another glance over my shoulder at Pepper. You stay and be a good boy. We'll be just fine, Bunny told me and rubbed down Charlotte. I got out of the car and headed into the building where Kevin had moved the morgue from the funeral home over the past year. I'd not been inside before, and I certainly didn't expect to see three stainless steel tables with three sheet-covered bodies on them once I found Kevin in the building. My stomach got a little queasy at the sight. It gets everyone their first time. Kevin snickered when he saw I was about to give him a preview of what I'd eaten today. Grab a pair of gloves and hold your hand over your nose. To the right of the door ran a counter with some paper gowns in their own packaging, along with three boxes of gloves in size small, medium, and large. I turned away, ripped open the package, and pulled the gown over my coat. I couldn't get the gloves on and plunge my nose deep into my hands fast enough. I got a pair of medium gloves, noticing they were too big. No need to replace them, since I didn't plan on being here any longer than needed, or on feeling anything while I was here. What is that smell? I asked, happy to see he'd covered the body he was working on. It could be a range of a lot of things, but since you aren't used to any of the amazing scents, he teased, I'm guessing your reaction is going to be the same every time you stop in to visit. Which is what this is, right? A little visit? I brought you some cookies. I found my coat pocket underneath the gown and pulled them out. You mean to tell me you made these just for me and brought them here? He was waiting for me to tell him the truth about why I was here. You know why I'm here. I felt so sick watching him eat a cookie. How can you eat in here? It's no different than your job. You talk to people all day long, and I talk to people all day long. 
Only your people talk back, and my people don't, he said through a mouthful of cookie. Well, their bodies talk to me, and right now I bet you want to know about Lana. He used his finger to brush off the crumbs on his bottom lip. Is there anything you can tell me? I asked. Legally, no. He put the rest of the cookies on the metal tray table next to his scalpel. I shivered. As your friend, I can tell you there was a poison found in her stomach on a part of the chipped beef. I'm not saying Maxine did anything, and I'm not saying she didn't. I am saying someone did. He sighed and frowned. Poor girl, I really hate it when I get younger and younger people. He pointed at the two other bodies, which told me the body we were currently standing near was Lana. Those two were old, which is a standard autopsy for their family. I get those, but young people is really hard. A call rang from his office and his head jerked up. I've got to get that. Hold on. He started to walk off, but then he said, Now, friends, don't try to talk to Roxy. He snickered, leaving me alone with them when he walked through the office door. Did you happen to test the platter all over? I asked in a loud voice. Or is it possible there's still something in it from the past murders of the Seiferts? You believe that old wives' tale? He laughed so hard from his office. No way! I took a couple of steps back, and when my shoes hit the cabinets in the back of the room, I knew I couldn't get any further away from them unless I climbed on top of the counters. I patted my hand around to see if anything was on them, thinking climbing was an option. But when I felt some clothes, I turned around and noticed it was the same shirt and pants Lana had had on when I'd seen her that day. Oh, I pulled my hands away, feeling icky. The pant leg fell off the counter edge and dangled. I don't want to touch this. With my thumb and finger, I reached out really far and picked up the edge of the pants to put back, but it felt heavy. I shook it and realized something was in her pants pocket. Kevin was so loud, I knew he was still on his phone call, so I started to shuffle through Lana's pants pockets to see why they felt heavy. Her phone! To say I was shocked at my find was an understatement and a big break. I needed to see who she talked to and at what time, Plus, I wanted to see if I could score Cam's number because his social media profile made it difficult to find out where this kid worked. So many things were running through my head, things that I had to see on her phone to gain insight into what she'd been doing before she died. The gloves I'd picked were too big, the fingertips hung down too long, and they didn't help me as I fumbled with the phone. Fingerprint The steam ran out of me when I noticed that Lana had used the fingerprint locked screen option to open the phone. Fingerprint, I said to myself, and slid my gaze over to the table. Seriously, Roxanne, I talked to myself. Then I answered, you can do this. I didn't let myself think too hard on my walk over to the table. I just needed a fingerprint. Lana's fingerprint and the only way I knew I could get it, well, was to peel back the sheet over the top of her body, take her finger, and lay it on the button of the phone. Ew! All the icky factors that you'd think would happen. The, oh my gosh, I'm touching a dead girl's hand, and the idea of messing with a corpse really did start to gnaw at me when I barely lifted the edge of the sheet and looked at her hand. What are you doing? Bunny said, scaring the Christmas spirit right out of me. What are you doing? I asked her. I've got to pee, she waddled up behind me. Is that her? Yes, and this is her phone. I need her fingerprint to open it. I showed Bunny the phone. Heck far! She tugged the sheet up on the side and pulled out Lana's hand. Here you go! You are crazy! I nervously took the phone in my shaking hand, put it up underneath the finger, and let Bunny press her finger down. Got it! I gasped when the phone sprang to life. Bunny? Roxy? 
Kevin had come back into the room. Bunny and I had been so focused on Lana's finger and phone, we didn't hear him. Oh, Lord, Bunny groaned, starting to pat Lana's hand. We ask you to please bless this child and give her family peace. I fell to my knees and put my hands in prayer position, with my head slightly tucked, so I could not only hide the phone, but also thumb through her text messages and last phone calls. Bunny was carrying on with the prayer. Shush, she told Kevin. We are here for a prayer over this poor girl, and we are going to do it. Do you understand me, Kevin? Yes, ma'am, Kevin agreed. Though I couldn't see his face, I knew he was giving Bunny respect. Close your eyes, she instructed him. When he had them closed, she looked down at me. Okay, she mouthed, then continued to carry on. I slid my phone out from underneath the gown and started to type in the phone's notes section the number of the last text, which matched the number of the last phone call. The text message mentioned a date and time, but not a place. It was very cryptic, and I didn't have time to read all the messages, but I had the number, and it was a start. Slowly, I stood up and tiptoed backward over to the counter where I had found Lana's clothes and put the phone in between the pants and shirt, not bothering to put it back in the pocket where I'd found it. All righty, we are done, Bunny lifted her chin. Kevin looked back at me. Why are you all the way over there? It's all part of it, Kevin, Bunny shook her head. Do we need anything else? Yes, what time do you put Lana's time of death? I slipped it in, not knowing if he would answer or not. That's not public knowledge. Kevin shifted on his feet and clasped his hands in front of him. Now, Kevin, Bunny said in her soft tone, we have to know when so we can pray at that moment tonight. Fine, Kevin shuffled back to his office. I can't remember it off the top of my head. You are a genius, I told her through my gritted teeth and pumped my fist in the air. But don't you think the whole church thing might be a little too much? I mean, what if we get struck dead right here? Why? I can certainly pray for her. It's not a lie. Bunny made it all work out. Thanks to her, I had a number. No name, a number. Chapter 18 Bunny's adrenaline must have made her bladder forget she had to go to the bathroom because the two of us just jingled our way right out of there as quick as we could. We laughed the entire way to her house at how ridiculous it was for us to do what we just did. We're going to get put in jail. She snuggled Charlotte with one arm and retrieved her house keys with her other hand. Nah, if I find anything out with this number, I'll give it to Spencer. I really just want to find this cam guy. I was sure the number was his. Okay, well, I'll let you know about work tomorrow. As of right now, Pepper and I will go in if we can, and maybe you can come in later, but don't come out until I call. In my mind, I was thinking it would just be a day for me. I wasn't sure where Bertie was going to be, in town or home. Thinking of the devil, I joked when I saw Loretta's name pop up on my phone. It's Loretta. I'll talk to you later. Bunny got out of the car with Charlotte, and I waited to make sure she got into her house before I gave my attention to the phone. I was just thinking about you and Bertie, I said, answering the phone. Is she with you? Loretta sounded desperate and scared. No, what's going on? I held the phone steady up to my ear. She said she was going to run off, and hasn't come home. I was thinking she might have gone to the coffee house. Heavy breathing and a few sniffs came through the phone. Why don't I run by there, and I'll give you a call either way. I felt awful. I should have called Loretta when Bertie had mentioned doing something, but I figured it was teen girl talk. Either way, Loretta reiterated, before she hung up the phone. Pepper? It looks like we are going back to the beanhive. I turned around in Bunny's driveway and headed back toward town, then straight to the boardwalk. It was on the way home and not out of our way. 
Do you think she waited for us to leave before she went back? I glanced in the rearview mirror at Pepper. He was fidgeting in his seat belt, trying to get to the front seat. Maybe she went back to blow off some steam and clean up. That had to be it. She'd wanted to clean up, and she was good at it. Cleaning always helped me keep my mind occupied when I was upset and frustrated. I pulled into the parking spot. Why don't you wait here, I told Pepper, and left my car running. I won't be but a minute. My plan was to see if Bertie was there, call Loretta, and take Bertie home, or at least follow her home. Before I got out of the car, I looked at my phone's notes and decided to give the number from Lana's call log, the last one she made, a -a ring-a-ling. The phone rang a few times before heading to voicemail. You knew the sound when someone sent you to voicemail. That was what it was. I called again. Hi. I knew it was a long shot for a killer to call me back, but I gave it a good try. My name is Roxanne Bloom Kane. I was still trying to get used to the new last name, though it was so new. I am calling because you're the last person Lana called, and, well, I have some news for you. Please call me back. If Cam got a nice message, and it didn't seem like I was calling to see if he killed her, but to inform him that she'd passed, then maybe he'd call me back. Just call me at this number. Thanks so much. I hung up the phone and put it in my coat pocket as I got out of the car. The air was so cold. My fingers were numb before I'd even made it to the steps of the boardwalk. I tried to look around the parking lot to see if Bertie's car was there. When I didn't see it, I considered the great possibility she'd parked in the parking lot on the other side of the boardwalk. I picked up my gate and thought about the clues to keep me from thinking about the freezing temperatures. I was at a loss for words about who really killed Lana and just how the poison got into Aunt Maxie's appetizer. I hated to admit it, but I was going to have to rely on anything Kirk came up with. He'd had skin in the lawyer game and still kept all the contacts we used— when we were chasing leads for our old practices clients, so it was only good practice to use his resources. I needed to tell him to break the platter and test it for possible poison. You never knew how things were made back then. Maybe no one poisoned Lana deliberately, and the problem was the old platter, just as it was when Mrs. Seifert's mom and sister died. Time was running out, and Spencer was on pins and needles watching the days and hours click by, just so he could make an arrest. I looked down the boardwalk and noticed the stretch of it in front of the beanhive had a glow, just like it did when the lights were on in there. I zipped up my jacket and decided to head down that way to make sure Birdie had turned the lights off. When I saw she hadn't, I took out my keys and unlocked the door. At least she locked the door behind her. I had felt bad for not trying to help her process the plan her parents wanted for her. Going home for Christmas was weighing on her mind even more than I realized. I looked in the window to see if she was in there, but I didn't see her, which really meant nothing. She could be in the back, roasting beans or doing something with some crazy chemicals. Stop thinking that way, I told myself, because it was ridiculous to think Bunny could hurt anyone. I let myself in. Birdie, I called, and decided to head into the kitchen when I noticed her backpack was on the coffee bar. On my way to the kitchen, I glanced behind the counter. A suitcase was sitting on the floor. Birdie, I pushed through the door and didn't see anyone in there. My eyes darted around the kitchen, where I noticed the mixer hadn't been washed, the ovens were still on, and a chill was coming from the freezer. What on earth? I turned off the ovens on my way to check the freezer door. If the seal was broken, I would have to call Patrick to come fix it for the night until I could get someone from the company I'd bought it from to repair it. It would be a catastrophe if I lost all the food in there. No wonder it's cold in here. My frustration nipped at me when I noticed the door was slightly ajar. When I went to shut it, something shuffled inside. I pulled it open. Birdie? For a second, I stopped to process what I was seeing. What on earth? I hurried in and ran to Bertie's side to pull down a handkerchief in her mouth. Alva! 
Alva! She huffed for air and shifted around to let me untie her. She's the killer. Alva from the diner? I was having a hard time deciphering what was going on. Get out of here! She jumped to her feet and scrambled to the freezer door. I don't know about this. Alva stood at the freezer door with a metal mixing spoon in her hand. I'm thinking I'm in a little situation. I mean, I thought I had it figured out when I planted the methanol in hopes the dimwit sheriff would find it. He'd seen me at the barn so many times. She rolled her eyes. It was one of those things where he'd run me off for trespassing after the tea gardens told him someone looked like they were living there. Were you? I asked. No, not really. I had the dishes laid out and would recall the stories my mom would tell about her time there as a child. She stared off for a brief second. So your mom was at the parties? I offered a smile so she would think I understood why she would kill Lana, though we'd not even gotten that information yet. Her parents worked the parties when she was a child. They lived with the Seiferts, and it was the stories I lived for. All the lavish food and the magic tricks. She shot Bertie a look. That ring. This ring? Bertie tugged it off her finger and flung it at Alva. I don't want it. The ring hit the floor, making a secret lid pop open. The magician's ring, I sighed. I should have known. That's how you poisoned Lana. Yep, she came into the diner, and I knew Maxine was going to switch the cheese balls because, well, let's face it. She strolled back and forth like the story she was telling was no big deal. She continued to smack the back end of the hard metal spoon in the palm of her other hand. When you fill up people's cups at a diner, they forget you're there and just talk openly to whoever they're with. And you overheard the conversations about the progressive dinner, as well as Loretta's cooking. But why Lana? What did she do? I had so many unanswered questions, and as they formed in my head, I started to recall Alva being everywhere over the past couple of days. The job she took was supposed to be my ticket to stealing the china back. You see, over the summer... Rumors swirled among the diner customers about how the bank was going to put the Seifert barn up for auction. The tea gardens had made this elaborate plan over dessert one night at one of my booths. They had the money, and they knew they'd make a mint off Loretta by selling her the dishes. My dishes! Alva had no legal rights to the Christmas china, other than memories she held dear. It was also around the time she needed help, and I overheard her and Babette talking about hiring someone. I approached Loretta about the job, and she'd already filled it. So I waited and waited, listening and listening, working as many shifts as I could so I could hear when the Seifert barn was up for auction before I made my move. She stopped, twirled around on her toes, and slid her gaze to me. It gave me many months to plan and calculate just how I was going to do it, until Maxine threw her weight around and got the platter. She held the spoon in one hand and looked at the platter Spencer had dropped off, since he didn't need it for the case anymore. She ran her finger along the edge of the rim of the platter. The platter was my mom's favorite piece. It's the only piece I really wanted, she sighed. She told me how it was thought to have been the magical piece in the collection, like Mr. Seifert had told them. He gave her the ring, and it was the only thing I had left from her, so I wanted the platter. I did approach the tea gardens about it a long time ago, and they gave me a price that was ridiculous. I understand you wanted the platter, but why did you kill Lana? Why did you blame it on Aunt Maxie? It was easy to become friends with Lana and Bertie. You see, girls like us, the outsiders, we will become friends with anyone who will talk to us and overlook anything that might seem odd or out of place. She shot Bertie a look. Sorry, kid. I wasn't planning on tying you up tonight or whatever else happens. I knew she was referring to killing us. But I saw the sheriff bring that platter in earlier tonight when I came in and I knew I had to get my hands on it. 
You see, I'd already gotten rid of the murder weapon. She pointed the end of the spoon at the ring. She walked over, picked it up, and slipped it on her finger. She gently closed the secret lid. You see, she dragged one of the donuts sitting on the workstation. Bertie must have been in the process of putting away the pastries when Alva showed up. Loretta ordered a hamburger for her and Lana to split. She grinned and looked down at the donut. She slid one of my knives from the butcher block and sliced the donut in half, flipping the secret compartment of the ring open, demonstrating just how easy it was to slip the poison on the donut if the ring had methanol inside. A shadow from the kitchen swinging door window caught my eye. Someone was looking into the kitchen, and I knew from the big melon head who it was. Just like that, Lana ate the burger and off they went. Just because you wanted the platter bad enough to have killed Lana? I said loudly, so Kirk, who I knew was on the other side of the door, heard me. Yes, don't you get it? You don't. You have everything you've ever wanted. A family, a coffee house, a life with your mom, a husband. She took a step back, just enough for Kirk to forcefully push the door open, hitting Alva on the back, flinging her forward. When she went to catch herself, she dropped the heavy metal spoon. And don't forget she's got an ex-husband, Kirk yelled, grabbing Alva by the arm. The spoon skidded across the floor, and I stopped it with my shoe. I'd never thought I'd say I'm so happy to see you. My shoulders hunched as relief blanketed me. Chapter 19 Christmas Day Supper at the Bean Hive Coffee House a few days later Here, Maxine, you be the first one to try my famous cheese ball you've been warning everyone about. Loretta cackled and held up a cracker overflowing with a mashed-up yellow and white gooey mound. I had you in my head the entire time I made it. You're crazy, Loretta. Aunt Maxie shoved Loretta's hand away from her face. The Christmas table was filled with all of Patrick's friends and mine, and our enemies. I glanced over and made eye contact with Kirk. He offered a smile and some sort of peace offering before he turned to Jessica. If it weren't for Kirk, Bertie and I just might not be sitting here. She looked at him with loving eyes, something I never recalled doing. For Kirk and me, we bonded over law and all things legal and illegal. If I was really honest, we loved getting into arguments over cases and who was right versus who was wrong. Though I'd never condone what he did to end our marriage, and the morality of it, I did accept that he was seeking a level of comfort and love that I wasn't able to give him. If I was totally honest with myself, there was always a piece of my heart that belonged to Patrick since the day I left Honey Springs and him behind when I went off to college. Still, I'd never left Kirk. Even if our marriage wasn't based on the sort of true love that it appeared we both had now. No matter what was behind us, Saving Bertie and me from the freezer a few days ago had made up for what he'd done in the past. It turned out Alva had already committed a few crimes around Kentucky. Apparently, she'd come to Honey Springs to connect with her family's past and realized the past was long buried with the Seifert family. She just wanted so badly a piece of the tales her mother had told her that she was willing to do anything, even kill Lana to get a job with Loretta so she could steal the platter, and Alva didn't care about the consequences if she got caught. It's not just any platter, it's the platter. I heard Loretta's voice coming from inside at the table when I heard her explaining to Spencer after he'd given Aunt Maxie the platter back with a bow on top. Good golly, Loretta, Aunt Maxie said, her voice dripping. See, this is why I didn't ask you to host any part of the progressive supper. Can't you just let everyone have a good time without telling some big tale? Aunt Maxie lifted the platter over the big turkey that sat in the middle of the banquet table and handed it to Loretta. It's no tale, Maxine. Everyone here has heard about the platter. 
Loretta smiled, admiring the ornate dish she'd so longed to have. It looks like everyone got everything they wanted this year. Patrick leaned over and whispered in my ear, This platter has seen a lot. Loretta rubbed her hands over it and referred to the tale of Christmas past with the Seiferts and why they decided to stop their holiday party. Spencer, did you ever talk to Cam? Kirk asked. How did you know about Cam? I asked. Maxine told me about how Birdie and Alva found his profile on Facebook, and I reported it to the sheriff like we should. Kirk made a point to let me know he disapproved of my keeping the phone number I'd found on Lana's phone to myself. And I followed up on it, and he was pretty devastated about Lana's death. But he's in college and wasn't even in town when it happened. Spencer picked up the spoon in the broccoli casserole dish and put it on his plate. I asked Alva about it during her interrogation, and she said she knew about him because Lana had confessed to her about her ex-boyfriend. It was so sad that Lana had thought Alva was her friend when Alva clearly used her to pinpoint a murder. Ended up showing it to Bertie and Maxine so it would take the heat off her and she'd get out of town before the truth came out about him. Spencer took a big bite out of the turkey leg. If you'll excuse me, I gulped when I felt like I was going to be sick. Are you okay? Mom jumped up, and so did Aunt Maxie following me to the bathroom. I was hoping my queasiness was over now that the killer has been caught. I hurried over to the toilet, where I bent down in case I lost my slice of pie. My mom pulled my hair back while Aunt Maxie wet a paper towel to stick on the back of my neck. I hate that you're sick on Christmas. This is awful. My mom rubbed my back with her free hand. Terrible. Nothing worse than being sick on Christmas, Aunt Maxie sighed. My mom laughed. What's so funny? I asked, my voice echoing from the inside of the toilet bowl. I've been in this exact situation before, only I was pregnant. Remember, Maxie? Mom's laughter stopped. Now what? I asked, trying not to lose that delicious piece of apple pie. I remember holding your hair back after you ate my delicious piece of apple pie. And on Christmas, Aunt Maxie gasped. Roxanne! Oh, Roxy baby! My mom cried. What? I twisted my head. Mom dropped her hand from my hair and covered her mouth. Dang, Mom! I lifted my head so my hair wouldn't hit the water. Roxy, I bet you're pregnant. Mom's words made me lose that pie. The End Recipes from the Bean Hive Kentucky Cowboy Casserole Maple Cinnamon Latte Red Velvet Whoopie Pies Kentucky Cowboy Casserole Ingredients 1 pound breakfast sausage 1 third pound chopped fresh mushrooms 1 medium onion chopped 10 eggs 4 tablespoons sour cream 8 tablespoons salsa 2 cups grated cheddar cheese 2 cups Monterey Jack cheese, 2 cups shredded Mexican Velveeta cheese. Directions 1. Saute sausage, mushrooms, and onions in a large skillet until done. Drain and set aside. 2. Combine eggs and sour cream and season with salt and pepper. 3. Whip egg mixture 1 minute in blender and pour into a 9 by 13 inch baking dish. 4. Bake in a preheated 400 degree oven until softly set, 6 to 8 minutes. 5. Spoon salsa evenly over top of eggs. Spread sausage mixture over top. 6. Sprinkle with combined cheeses and refrigerate until 30 minutes before serving time. 7. Then bake in a 325-degree oven for 30 minutes. Maple Cinnamon Latte 
a cozy fall drink made for lazy Sunday mornings. Ingredients Three quarter cup milk Half cup coffee, brewed as strong as you like One to one and a half tablespoons maple syrup One quarter teaspoon cinnamon, plus more for garnish Cinnamon stick, for garnish, optional Directions 1. Pour milk into a medium-sized mason jar and screw on the lid. 2. Shake for 10 to 15 seconds until foam starts to form at the top. 3. Remove lid and microwave jar for about 45 seconds or until milk is hot to the touch and foamy. 4. Keep an eye on the milk as you microwave to keep it from bubbling. 5. Pour hot coffee into a mug and stir in the maple syrup and cinnamon. 6. Top with milk, spooning the foam onto the top. 7. Sprinkle with cinnamon and serve it with a cinnamon stick if desired. Red Velvet Whoopie Pies Ingredients 3 quarter cup butter, softened 1 cup sugar 2 large eggs, room temperature half cup sour cream 1 tablespoon red food coloring 1 and a half teaspoons white vinegar 1 teaspoon clear vanilla extract 2 and 1 quarter cups all-purpose flour quarter cup baking cocoa 2 teaspoons baking powder half teaspoon salt, quarter teaspoon baking soda, two ounces semi-sweet chocolate, melted and cooled. Ingredients for filling. One package, eight ounces, cream cheese, softened. Half cup butter, softened. Two and a half cups confectioner's sugar. Two teaspoons clear vanilla extract. Toppings. White baking chips melted. Finely chopped pecans. Directions. 1. Preheat oven to 375 degrees. In a large bowl, cream butter and sugar until light and fluffy. 2. Beat in eggs, sour cream, food coloring, vinegar, and vanilla. In another bowl, whisk flour, cocoa, baking powder, salt, and baking soda, gradually beat into creamed mixture. 3. Stir in cooled chocolate. 4. Drop dough by tablespoonfuls, 2 inches apart, onto parchment-lined baking sheets. 5. Bake 8 to 10 minutes or until edges are set. 6. Cool on pans 2 minutes. Remove to wire racks to cool completely. 7. For filling, in a large bowl, beat cream cheese and butter until fluffy. 8. Beat in confectioner's sugar and vanilla until smooth. 9. Spread filling on bottom half of the cookies and cover with remaining cookies. 10. Drizzle with melted baking chips. Sprinkle with pecans. 11. Refrigerate until serving. Also by Tanya Kappas, A Camper and Criminal's Cozy Mystery, Beaches, Bungalows, and Burglaries, Deserts, Drivers, and Derelicts, Forests, Fishing, and Forgery, Christmas, Criminals, and Campers, Motorhomes, Maps, and Murder, Canyons, Caravans, and Cadavers, Hitches, Hideouts, and Homicide, Assailants, Asphalt, and Alibis, Valleys, Vehicles, and Victims. Sunsets, Sabbatical, and Scandal. Tents, Trails, and Turmoil. Kickbacks, Kayaks, and Kidnapping. Gear, Grills, and Guns. Eggnog, Extortion, and Evergreens. Ropes, Riddles, and Robberies. Paddlers, Promises, and Poison. Insects, ivy, and investigations. Outdoors, oars, and oaths. Wildlife, warrants, and weapons. 
blossoms, barbecue, and blackmail. Lanterns, lakes, and larceny. Jackets, jack-o'-lantern, and justice. Santa, sunrises, and suspicions. Vistas, vices, and valentines. Adventure, abduction, and arrest. Rangers, RVs, and revenge. Campfires, courage, and convicts. Trapping, turkeys, and thanksgiving. Gifts, glamping, and glocks. Also by Tanya Kappas. Kenny Lowry Mystery Series. Fixin' to Die. Southern Fried. Axe to Grind. Six Feet Under. Dead as a Doornail. Tangled Up in Tinsel. Digging Up Dirt. Blowing Up a Murder. Killer Coffee Mystery Series. Scene of the Grind. Mocha and Murder. Freshly Ground Murder. Cold Blooded Brew. Decaffeinated Scandal. A Killer Latte. Holiday Roast Mortem. Dead to the Last Drop. A Charming Blend Novella. Crossover with Magical Cures Mystery. Frothy Foul Play. Spoonful of Murder. Barista Bump Off. Holiday Cozy Mystery. Four Leaf Felony. Mother's Day Murder. A Halloween Homicide. Chocolate Bunny Betrayal. April Fool's Alibi. Father's Day Murder. Thanksgiving Treachery. Santa Claus Surprise. New Year Nuisance. Mail Carrier Cozy Mystery. Stamped Out. Address for Murder. All She Wrote. Return to Sender. First Class Killer. Post Mortem. Deadly Delivery. Red Letter Slay. Magical Cures Mystery Series. A Charming Crime. A Charming Cure. A Charming Potion Novella. A Charming Wish. A Charming Spell. A Charming Magic. A Charming Secret. A Charming Christmas Novella. A Charming Fatality. A Charming Death Novella. A Charming Ghost. A Charming Hex. A Charming Voodoo. A Charming Corpse. A Charming Misfortune. A Charming Blend. Crossover with a Killer Coffee Cozy Mystery. A Charming Deception. A Southern Magical Bakery Cozy Mystery Serial. A Southern Magical Bakery. A Ghostly Southern Mystery Series. A Ghostly Undertaking. A Ghostly Grave. A Ghostly Demise. A Ghostly Murder. A Ghostly Reunion. A Ghostly Mortality. A Ghostly Secret. A Ghostly Suspect. A Southern Cake Baker Series, written under Mae Bell. Cake and Punishment, Batter Off Dead. Spies and Spells Mystery Series, Spies and Spells, Betting Off Dead. Get Witch or Die Tryin'. A Laurel London Mystery Series, Checkered Crime, Checkered Past, Checkered Thief. A Divorce Diva Beating Mystery Series, a Bead of Doubt short story. Strung Out to Die. Crimped to Death. Olivia Davis Paranormal Mystery Series. Splitsville.com. Color Me Love Novella. Color Me a Crime. About Tanya. Tanya has written over 100 novels, all of which have graced numerous bestseller lists, including the USA Today, Best known for stories charged with emotion and humor and filled with flawed characters, her novels have garnered reader praise and glowing critical reviews. She lives with her husband and a very spoiled rescue cat named Roe. Tanya grew up in the small southern Kentucky town of Nicholasville. Now that her four boys are grown men, Tanya writes full-time in her camper she calls her Shamper, she-camper. To learn more about her, be sure to check out her website, tanyacappas.com. Find her on Facebook, Twitter, BookBub, and Instagram. Sign up to receive her newsletter, where you'll get free books, exclusive bonus content, and news of her releases and sales. If you liked this book, 
please take a few minutes to leave a review now. Authors, Tanya included, really appreciate this, and it helps draw more readers to books they might like. Thanks. Cover artist, Mariah Sinclair, The Cover Vault. This has been A Spoonful of Murder, A Killer Coffee Mystery, Book 10. Written by Tanya Kappas. Narrated by Christina Sagnameni. Copyright 2021 by Tanya Kappas. Production copyright by Tanya Kappas.